Okay, we're good to go. Okay, good morning. Welcome to our 11 a.m. session of the April 13th, 2021 meeting of the City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our next, to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on an item today, call in at the beginning of the item. If you're wanting to comment on using, excuse me, if you wish to comment on the item, agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note, there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on the phone on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Watkins? Here. Helen Tori Johnson? Here. Brown? Here. Cummings? Here. Golder? Here. Vice Mayor Brunner? Present. And Mayor Myers? Present. We'll move right into item number five on our agenda, which is the city manager recruitment update. Our presenters today will be Lisa Murphy of the Human Resources. Uh, is, Lisa is our Human Resources Director, so I'll turn it over to her and uh, we'll go, go from there. Hey, good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. Thank you. I'm Lisa Murphy, your Human Resources Director. I want to thank you for the opportunity for us to be able to provide you with this update today on a very important process. It's our city manager recruitment process. It's my pleasure to introduce to you to continue the presentation, Terry Black. She is our executive recruitment recruiter uh, whose services we have obtained and she's highly um, qualified and, and trusted in this uh, regard. Uh, she will take some time to review the process including the community outreach efforts, our employee outreach efforts, our timeline, and ultimately the target date for the council to approve a selection and appoint uh, later in the summer. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Ms. Terry Black from Terry Black and Company to go over the process. Welcome, Terry. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, members of the council, very much appreciate your time this morning. I know this is a very ambitious agenda day, so I will do my best to be concise. Um, Bonnie and Laura, I'm gonna try to share my screen and hopefully the slides will come up. All right. Great. So as Lisa mentioned, um, we are an experienced firm and this is not our first engagement with Santa Cruz. Mayor, Mayor yeah. sorry to interrupt, but Terry, this is on um, presenter view. I don't know if you want to yeah. change it to. Well, I'm not sure how to do that. Should I stop sharing? I think if you click on the uh, display settings, at the top there, Terry, you may be able to switch screens or using two screens. I am. Try the display settings at the top. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Got it. Swap presenter and slide view. Yep. Did it go? Not yet. For mm -hmm. me. Yeah. It looks like it would it's be better stalled. if you want to stop your screen share and restart it and just select the screen that you want to present. Okay. And slide show. Okay, let's try this again. I'm so sorry. I'm so ready.
Is that any difference? Can you see? That's it, right there, yep. Oh, she's good now, Terry. Okay, so it is not our first, uh, First engagement with Santa Cruz, we've done a few department heads and deputy director recruitments over the years. So very privileged to, to be back. And Santa Cruz hasn't gone through a city manager recruitment, at least uh, to the outside, in a long, long time. And the market has changed dramatically, even in just the last few years, with um, a number of the baby boomers retiring. They haven't all retired. In fact, I was reading a study yesterday that indicated we haven't even felt the worst of the, the silver tsunami. Um, and I think it's important that the, the public and the council have an appreciation for where the marketplace stands today, because it's, it's much different than it was, again, just just a few years ago. We're also starting to see the, the older Gen Xers uh, begin to retire. And it no longer is a, a natural career ambition to be ascending to the top. People are taking a lot of time and, and consideration to think about their careers and wanting more balance and easier integration between work life and home life. This sentiment was going on uh, well before the pandemic. We were starting to see trends to that to that end. And certainly with the pandemic and working from home, uh, many people, many would have would have been yesterday's potential candidates for a city manager spot uh, are really take, recalibrating, taking, uh, giving themselves the luxury and permission to reconsider work-life balance and um, what they really want to do uh, for the next few years. So this reassessment of life uh, the demographics overall are really impacting our, our candidate pool. Even before the pandemic, there was a study done in 2019 that said for public sector executives, the candidate pool over the previous five years in 2019 had been reduced by 30%. So it's even a little more difficult today. So this is a, a slide that kind of connotates uh, feel our pain as, as recruiters. Um, but we. Not undaunted, um, there hasn't been a recruitment we haven't been successful in even through the pandemic. So, and there are many wonderful things to, to sell about um, Santa Cruz that we were, were hoping will attract a lot of exceptionally qualified candidates to, um, to the recruitment. So we are right now in what we call launch prep mode. Um, for the month of April, we'll be having a lot of uh, conversations with internal and external stakeholders and launching a couple of surveys. So with respect to our in external stakeholders, um, within the next couple of days, maybe even today, we'll be launching, the city will be launching um, its community survey efforts. And there will be a web page on the city's website, a page uh, dedicated exclusively to the city manager recruitment that'll be updated on a regular basis. One of the first items the public will see there is a community link to a community survey. Three or four questions that ask um, essentially two big questions. Uh, we we're getting feedback on what people would like to see in the next city manager, the qualities, the leadership attributes that describe that perfect candidate, as well as uh, the priorities. The, the, those items, those issues, those matters that um, the survey taker would want the city manager to focus on during his or her first year on the job, first few months on the job. Those things that really need a lot of energy and attention or else the person isn't gonna be successful. In addition, uh, a number of focus groups will be held. These are focus groups um, of, uh, that will have participants uh, representing uh, interests that are important to Santa Cruz, the environment, the business community, um, DEI efforts, service organizations, youth, wide range of focus groups. Those will be happening over the next couple of weeks. In addition, there will be a lot of internal uh, focus on, of course, we'll be meeting one-on-one -on -one with council members, getting their feedback on those two items 
getting uh, soliciting department heads. I think that has already happened. Um, and just as we're implementing a survey for the community, there will be an employee survey to get in that internal input. And the input is used in a variety of ways. First and foremost, it will help us create all the marketing and advertising materials that we've used to attract candidates. Uh, secondly, and maybe most importantly, it will help us, us meeting the recruiters, to have really informed, educated, rich conversations with potential candidates. Uh, candidates are, are, especially the better candidates, are more thoughtful about the jobs they apply for. They're very curious. They have a lot of questions. They can only do so much research online, uh, but they really, we really spend a lot of time with a number of people as we try to uh, gain interest and attract them into the pool. In addition, the input that is, that is uh, received early on in the process is used to inform all the interview questions as we use throughout the process, many layers of interviews, as well as it will help inform uh, background and reference check. So variety of ways in which we use this, this information. We hope to open the recruitment um, by the end of this month, maybe beginning of May. It'll be open through the month of May. We need at least four really good solid weeks of active, aggressive recruiting where we're out there pounding the pavement, trying to drum up interest. Um, from there, at once the recruitment closes, the recruiters do a paper screening of all the submission materials. We're re reviewing the, the resumes as they come in, but we do a deep dive and a thorough scrubbing of all the applicants once the recruitment closes. Then we're conducting screening interviews, and eventually uh, that would be, you know, early mid-June, uh, bringing back a presentation and a detailed report to the city council on the results of the re recruitment and the result, uh, the result in our assessment of the screening interviews and putting the, the council in a position to select their finalist um, by the middle, middle of June. Uh, latter part of June, uh, the council is conducting final interviews and uh, hopefully by the end of the month before they go on summer recess, they'll be in a position to make their selection and we'll help the city with compensation negotiations. And while the council is on recess, we'll um, be doing the background and reference checking on the top candidate. And right when the council comes back from their, their break, uh, hopefully they're making the appointment and an official announcement about the new city manager. Um, the council will hear me throughout the process stress the importance of confidentiality. It's our goal that, uh, our primary goal that we're bringing the the council as many fantastic, awesome candidates as possible, so they have a rich array of choices before them, and their decision is, is really difficult because there's so many great candidates. The only way we can do that is to preserve the, the confidentiality of, of the candidates as we as we move through the process. So they'll hear they will hear me talk about that uh, a lot as we go because we're really trying to get and keep the very best candidates in the, in the process. Eyes on the prize at the end of the day. Uh, so just a recap, sort of a bird's eye view uh, of the recruitment. Right now in April, we're in launch prep stage, getting a lot of feedback on what people would like to see in the next city manager, as well as feedback on priorities. Uh, May, aggressive recruiting stage. June is a screening and final interviews and uh, initial vetting of all the, the top candidates. And um, again, while the, the council is on break, we're doing further vetting, background reference checking, and hopefully putting the council in a position to uh, appoint their new city manager uh, in early August. So with that, uh, that concludes uh, the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Terry, and thank you for your uh, your thorough but um, yeah on time uh, presentation today. Um, uh, I just for the public's knowledge, this is being brought again as a presentation regarding our city manager um, uh, recruitment process. Um, we have a few minutes for council members. I think if we could take, if people have one or two questions, um, we gain time back, and I'm have, happy to have any questions if uh, council has. Uh, questions for either Terry or Lisa at this time. Um, but I will uh, stop any council questions at 1140 just to uh, 
fit in our two proclamations on time. Any questions from council members at this point? And for the public in the, pro in the uh, audience, we do not actually take public comment on presentations, just for clarification. Uh, I see that council member Brown has a question. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm looking forward to talking with you uh, one on one or in uh, individual conversations. Um, I am just wondering, I, you mentioned the focus groups and I'm really glad that we've um, kind of talked about incorporating that and that there will be community involvement and input into the process. Um, and I, we just so the public knows, for those listening, uh, council members have been asked to, you know, submit names and ideas for, you know, participants, stakeholders to be involved in those focus groups. So there, that will be happening. And I am wondering if those, will we get a list of who you're talking with in those focus groups? Will the council, I mean, we may not have a big presentation about it, but can we get the information about who's doing that and what the, you know, I'm sure with the results, maybe we could have a conversation then. Great, yeah. great, thank you. We will send out the list and I will be sending out notifications and invites to individuals. Uh, and we have already set dates for those uh, virtual um, focus group meetings. Great, thank you. Yeah. Great. Other questions by council members? I'm shocked. You we were a, a, a question rich group here. Okay. Um, well, Terry, thank you again. Um, and my understanding is that we will have all, we will have a website sort of stood up. Lisa, can you remind us just publicly one more time when sort of the website goes live? Actually, I think it's going to go live sometime this afternoon. We wanted to wait to have this presentation and we'll have the community surveys up and ready to go. We'll have a press release to go out as well. Uh, and then any updates that we have, timelines, documentation, we'll, we'll put those there and then we'll continue to push out. I'll use Elizabeth heavily to help uh, continue to steer people towards the website. And Lisa, will there be a direct link to where people can find that easily on our website? I know sometimes it comes in the news scroll and I'm just wondering if there's an obvious link that could be built right from the first page or how, how they find it. Do they go into city manager's office or kind of where does that land on our page if you tried to look for it in two weeks from now, for example? <laughs> I, would steer, I, I would steer people, I believe Elizabeth is planning to do it through the human resources department, okay. uh, but I will confirm that just because it seems sort of uh, typical to, to steer any type of recruitment information towards human resources. Uh, but uh, I can take a check with Elizabeth and see what she thinks. She, she's the expert. Right, right. So that would be great. Yeah, if there's just in any press or anything that goes out, if, if we can have a link, yeah, just making sure people can find it, because I know sometimes I've gone in and tried to find something and it can be a little bit hard once in a while. With, with the new scroll is, is kind of moved past a few weeks, then sometimes you can lose track of it. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, so thank you again, Terry. We, the city looks forward to working with you, and um, we're really excited that you've done successful recruitments for the city before. So thank you for joining us and we're thrilled to have you on, on board. Thrilled to be here, thank you so much. Have a great meeting. Okay, thanks, every, thanks everybody. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, now we're ahead of schedule. I'm not quite sure what to do with all this extra time. Um, so next up, we will have a proclamation, a mayoral proclamation declaring April 13th, 2021 as retired war supervisor John Bombacci Day. And um, Laura, I mean, excuse me, um, uh, Bonnie, I just want to see if John is available in the audience. Yes. There he is. Yep. John, I don't know if you want your camera on or off, but I have the feeling there'll be several comments to you this afternoon too. So um, I would like and very, very um, honored to present this mayor's proclamation. <clears throat> and I will read it now. Whereas on October 4th, 1982, John Bombacci began his career with the city of Santa Cruz Parks and Recreation Department as a wharf construction worker and was promoted to wharf supervisor on May 7, 2005. And whereas a member of the wharf construction crew, John Bombacci assisted with the wharf pedestrian improvements project, which included the north and south commons 
agora buildings and public spaces and expansion of the center walkway the construction of public landings one and two and the east walkway expansion project and whereas for more than a decade john bombacci was co-chair of the city safe safety committee and co-authored the safety and health appreciation program for employees which was instrumental in reducing the city's workers' compensation liability over the course of his chairmanship. And whereas while working, John Bombacci earned a bachelor's degree in environmental studies from the University of California at Santa Cruz, where his thesis work provided the data and rationale for updating the resource recovery department's commercial and residential collection rates and earned him honors in the major and an award of excellence. And whereas John Bombacci's environmental focus carried forward to his collaborative work on the award-winning Green Wharf project, which brought the first LED streetlight retrofit to the city and renewable energy to the wharf. And whereas on November 7th, excuse me, November 27th, 2010, John Bombacci was promoted to wharf supervisor. And in 2014, the wharf centennial year, he was a central hub for planning and execution of a season of celebrations that launched the Wharf Master Plan and was the principal collaborator on the engineering report that accompanied it. And whereas during his tenure, John Bombacci saw the Wharf grow and change and he helped it remain vital and resilient. And whereas John Bombacci is an astute observer of nature and steward important collaborations with the University of California at Santa Cruz and the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary to connect the wharf to marine biology on the wharf, excuse me, to connect the public to marine biology on the wharf. And whereas each Halloween, John Bombacci sat enthusiastically in front of wharf headquarters dressed in costume and passed out candy to trick-or-treaters. And whereas John Bombacci has served as the go-to crooner in the Parks and Recreation Department, always called upon to sing holiday tunes or dedicate a special song at a retirement celebration. And whereas Wharf Supervisor John Bombacci's last day of work was April 8th, 2021, concluding nearly four decades of service to the city of Santa Cruz, and he will be sorely missed. And whereas John Bombacci's imitable spirit and passion for all things Wharf will leave a lasting positive impact uh, on Santa Cruz. Now, therefore, I, Donna Myers, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim April 13th, 2021 as John Bombacci Day in the City of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens and his coworkers to join me in expressing heartfelt appreciation for his years of dedicated and exemplary service and numerous contributions and wishing him well in his retirement. Congratulations, John, and um, I hope you might say a few words if you feel the need, and um, I'm sure some council members will also want to thank you for everything you've done. Well, what, what I'd like to say mostly is I feel like an incredibly lucky man who was in the right place at the right time. Um, it, it almost seemed like um, I was destined to be where I was. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed where I was. I never wanted to go anywhere else. Uh, it's maybe hard to fathom for some people how you could confine your career to uh, to a half mile area, um, but they just don't understand the wharf the way that I do. That it's a living, breathing thing. It's it's more than a structure. Um, I think of it as Santa Cruz's um, major league team in, in, in the way that uh, another community uh, might have a, a, an NBA team or a major league baseball team or, or an NFL team. This is the way that, that our beachfront draws. Um, and in that regard, it, it, it's, it and, the, and the boardwalk, our beachfront is, is the show in town and and it is magnificent um i i tried to do what i could to uh educate the the citizenry of santa cruz 
uh, as to what a special resource the wharf was really on a world stage. There's less than a handful of wharfs, uh, wooden wharfs that around the world that compared to our wharf, it, is, uh, it was built by a world-class architect, Henry Brunier, um, who also built, uh, has five of the, the, uh, the skyscrapers on the San Francisco skyline and the Bay Bridge and Seal Stadium and the Davidson Cross and the shipyards in Panama to his credit. So it's, it's part of the reason why it has lasted as long as it did. Henry did it right. And I, I would just invite anybody to, to look into the history of the wharf. It's a great history. It's an, a little bit of an unusual history in that it always seemed to be kind of a, 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 a in a different direction, maybe a little different direction than people thought it might be. Um, when it was designed, it was designed to be California's finest wharf, which by God it is. Uh, but it was meant to be really Santa Cruz's portal to the world via ocean shipping. And it was for a very short period of time, but now I think that the opportunity there is uh, to communicate that in, in a different way by being a, a leader in, in marine biology research and, and standing as a beacon of ecotourism. Thank you so much, John. And I'll, I think I'll make my comments real quick and then I'll turn it over to council members, other council members. Um, you're exactly right when you say the wharf is a living, breathing thing. When I worked for the um, National Marine Sanctuary Program, my office was on the wharf. And uh, that is exactly what it feels like when a 20 foot swell hits the wharf. Um, <laughs> it literally, um, you feel like you're on a boat and the barometric pressure almost feels like you can't breathe. It was, um, it was one of the most exciting places to sit and uh, spend my work day. But, uh, and then just, uh, as you said, it's, it is that place that people um, of all ages and everyone comes to, to see the wharf and your stewardship of that uh, historic structure in our, in our community is so appreciated. And I also just wanna recognize you too for your work with the Cal's Working Group um, to try to get the, to get Cal's Beach off the Beach Bummers list. So John, we will miss you and um, hopefully you'll come out and do some seining on the steelhead in the in the uh, lagoon too. Keep that up too. So I know that's another thing you've done, which isn't part of the whereas is, but congratulations and uh, just so happy for you. Um, Thank you. Uh, word word has it that I that I uh, I do a pretty mean barbecue too. There we go. Okay, <laughs> you're hired. Um, I'll turn it over to um, Council Member Watkins and then Council Member Brown, Cummings, and Colin Tari Johnson. Well, good to know that you do a mean barbecue there, John. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, no, I just I want to echo the comments that the mayor made in regards to just appreciation of your years of service, and I. I guess I would just say, I, I, if we could all be so lucky that we feel destined at the end of our career, that that's where we should be. So I just want to congratulate you on your um, your experience professionally. I also want to share that I was talking to a colleague of mine yesterday um, about some work we're doing on cigarette uh, cigarette uh, butt waste, and she brought up how she just learned that you were retiring and um, wanted to acknowledge your work and, and it's Rachel Kippen from the O'Neill Sea Odyssey and she sent me some comments that I just want to share. Um, she okay. said, John was always super friendly, collaborative, approachable, and always made time for me and anyone in the community to talk about the various wharf issues. He understood, uh, he was understanding of the diverse users of the wharf, the importance of making the wharf a welcoming place to all and also preserving the environment. But what I loved about working with John is that he always wanted to work towards solutions. And I feel like that just really um, captures those that have worked with you in our community, in our city. We're really lucky to have had you for as many years as we've had you. And we just wish you the absolute best in your retirement. So thank you so much. I, I, I think that's maybe what happens when you feel lucky to be in the right place. Yeah, I agree. Wonderful, beautiful. Thanks, John. Council 
Member Brown. Yeah, um, John, you you preempted my uh, recommendation that we include in the uh, the resolution. Um, and where has <laughs> John Pombachi's barbecue is um, renowned throughout our community and probably beyond? Um, I uh, you know I just wanted to say that. Um, I echo all of the comments that have been made. Um, you know, your your love of the wharf and your commitment to making it accessible and, you know, keeping it going and improving it. Um, you know, sometimes it just has felt like the wharf is standing as it is due to your sheer will. <laughs> and so I, I just wanted to say, you know, I, I can't, no words really can, uh, uh, describe the you know appreciation that um, that we have that I have for all of the work you've done. Um, I have friends who've worked uh, side by side with you and um, you know in work construction and and for you and just have always had such wonderful things to say about um, your camaraderie and teamwork out there. And um, so I hope you um, decide that, to, you know, I hope you go have some fun in your retirement. And um, I was personally would love to see uh, you write a book about uh, adventures on the wharf and, and your experience. I'd love to see that and read that one day. So, thank you so much. I've, I've had that request a few times. I'm, 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 I'm mulling that one over. I, I, I'm thinking about how to do that and 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 uh, not wind up like John Steinbeck. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Cummings, please. I'll keep it short, but John, I just want to thank you as well for all your years of work and service on the wharf. Um, so many people who come to our community love and appreciate you know going out on the wharf and i think that it's you know one of the treasures of our community that makes it so special and you know we wouldn't have it if it weren't for you and and all the people who you know take so much pride in trying to maintain the wharf and you know really helping to keep that going for future generations to appreciate so i just want to express how much um you know, we appreciate all of your years of service, and I look forward to, you know, seeing you around and running into you out there and hearing some stories about the wharf along the way. I'll, I'll, I'll just say another thing about the wharf is it's the only part of Santa Cruz that you can recognize from space. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So it, 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 and it is the face that the rest of the world recognizes us by, the boardwalk and the wharf. Great. And Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. John, I haven't had the pleasure to work with you directly, but I've heard so much about you over the years, and I just wanted to express my gratitude for all the work that you've done. Um, the work means a lot to our family. It's a rite of passage for my boys to have jumped off during junior guards, and it's brought, it's brought so much joy to so many kids and families and individuals. So I just wanted to thank you for all your work, and I hope we cross paths. Uh, I would just like to say back to you all how, how much I've enjoyed the work of this council and, uh, and uh, when uh, Council Member Cummings, when you were mayor, I, I, I particularly appreciated your work there. Uh, mayor Myers, um, I think both of you are just doing outstanding work and um, I haven't always been able to say that about every city council, but I see this as really a remarkably functional city council that's just getting down to getting getting the work done. Um, bravo, well done. Thank you for, I know what a tough job it is to be a city council person in this city and it, and it particularly through the years of COVID, um, I think you all owe yourselves a huge uh, uh, congratulations. Um, I'm just really pleased to be associated uh, with Santa Cruz in, in this era. Thank you so much, John. And um, I'll miss seeing you out there in the occasional morning when, you know, wandering by in the morning. So I really, I think for everyone at the city, everyone at Parks and Rec, everyone, um, we're gonna miss you. So you have big shoes to fill and uh, please don't be a stranger. Come and fire up that barbecue anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, John. 
Congrats. Thank you. Enjoy your garden. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> great. Okay. Okay, great. We have an additional proclamation to do today as well. And I believe um, Haley Jones. Hi there, Haley. How are you? Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for having me. You betcha. So today we're also, I'm also presenting a proclamation um, recognizing Haley Jones, um, who was born and raised here in Santa Cruz and her amazing achievements uh, in the past few weeks. So Haley, I'm going to read the proclamation and then happy to have uh, you say anything or you don't have to as well. So, um, but we, I know the council is very excited for having you here today. So. This is the mayor's proclamation recognizing, whereas Haley Jones, who was born in her current hometown of Santa Cruz, California, is the daughter of Monique and Patrick Jones and has one brother, Cameron Jones. And whereas Haley Jones first started playing basketball when she was five years old, and whereas Haley Jones' father played basketball at Colorado College, brother plays basketball at Pacific University in, in Oregon, Cousin Delisha Milton Jones is a two-time Olympic and two-time FIBA World Cup gold medalist and head coach at Old Dominion. And Uncle Tyrone James played football at Clark University. And whereas Haley Jones attended Archbishop Minty Mitty High School in San Jose and was a member of its honor roll each semester. And whereas during her high school years, Haley Jones played four varsity seasons of basketball and competed in track and field, receiving a multitude of honors. And whereas Haley Jones was the number one recruit in her class and became a guard for the Stanford Cardinal women's basketball team. And whereas Haley Jones was named an AP All-American honorable mention this season, but saved her best play for the NCAA uh, tournament and then raised it even more in the final four and whereas Haley Jones was one of two Stanford players to make the all tournament team. And whereas Haley Jones has a special skill set, and Stanford coach Tara Vandeveer compared her to former NBA great Irvin Magic Johnson. And whereas Haley Jones is a team oriented player and keeps all the pieces moving because of her court sense and unselfish play. And whereas in her first two years at Stanford, Haley Jones has produced amazing stats as well as received countless accolades. And whereas on April 4th, 2021, Stanford won its first NCAA Women's Basketball Championship in 29 years, with Haley Jones being named the tournament's most outstanding player after leading the team to the national championships. Stanford's win has drawn a star-studded receiving line from former Cardinal Tiger Woods to our nation's political leaders. And whereas in addition, Haley Jones participated in USA basketball, winning a gold medal at the 2018 FIBA U-17 World Cup and being named to the All-Star Five. And whereas Haley Jones, not, when not playing basketball, enjoys watching movies, going to the beach, cooking, hiking, and being with friends and family, now, therefore, I, Donna Myers, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim April 4th, 2021, as Haley Jones Day in the City of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to join me in congratulating her for being named the most outstanding player of the 2021 NCAA tournament and wishing her all the best in her future endeavors. Thank you, Haley. And I don't know if you would like to speak to us, but um, we are so proud of you and everything that you stand for and for all the small girls in our community who are looking up to you as an idol right now. And women, women in sports need more recognition. And that's um, why I brought this because you have done an amazing thing. And uh, we love Stanford and we're just so happy for you. So please Haley, if you have some words to say and Haley's family is here today too. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you guys. I could never imagine receiving an accolade like this or a whole day to myself. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for recognizing me and so happy to have my family here virtually at home. Um, I love you guys and you guys are my support system and I wouldn't be where I am without you guys. So I'm just thankful to the city of Santa Cruz for being my hometown. I love Santa Cruz, everything about it. I'm proud to be from here. So yeah, just thank you so much. And um, I look forward to April 4th every day, every, every year. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
Congrats, Haley. Um, Patrick or Monique, do you guys, uh, you know, have any anything to say today, or just just recognize, you know, it takes a family to raise raise these these great people, Haley and her brother, and um, and uh, yeah, I just if you have anything to say today, you're welcome to to make a few words and welcome Cameron. Also, I'm sure you're excited too. Uh, we'd just like to say thank you to the city of Santa Cruz and to uh, the entire city council for um, kind of making this happen. It, it was a surprise, you know, to, to be contacted by you guys and uh, to have uh, Haley honored like this. And for all of us, you know, all, the entire family has grown up in Santa Cruz and, uh, you know, we really feel a, a part of the community here. And so to have her um, excel the way she has, but then also to be recognized, you know, this is, uh, it feels as good as, as any other award that she's gotten, local, national, whatever. And so um, it's just a really special day for us, and we couldn't be prouder. Haley, you're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll open it up to see if any other council members have any words this afternoon. Um, you're welcome to. We have plenty of time. Uh, we're running right on time again. Any other council members have anything today to offer? Uh, Council Member uh, Watkins. I'm just cheering and just wanting to say congratulations. Thank you, Mayor, for bringing this forward and acknowledging that we need to acknowledge our local talent, but our women in sports. Uh, Haley, you made Santa Cruz super duper proud. You deserve a day. And congrats to your entire family. Uh, I was like, how old is she? As you were reading the procla proclamation, there's a million things you've already done. And I know it's just getting started for you in your career. So we wish you the absolute best and um, look forward to having you back in Santa Cruz sometime soon. But continue the good work that you're doing. Congrats. And Council Member Cummings and then Vice Mayor Bruner. Yeah, Haley, I just wanted to say congrats to you and your family on so many achievements so early in life. I mean, it's going to be great to continue to watch you grow as a person. So, you know, just know that we are, you have a community behind you um, and just keep up the good work because um, at this rate, you're going to continue to be an amazing person moving forward. So thank you for all that you do. Thanks for making Santa Cruz proud and keep up the good work. Thank you. Vice Mayor Bruner. So nice to meet you here, Haley, and congratulations on this wonderful achievement and all your hard work. So nice to meet uh, your parents and your brother, and we look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you when you come home. And um, more to come on that. We hope to. Um, continue to watch you grow, keep shining your light. It's wonderful to see uh, a, a young, beautiful black woman as yourself in, in this wonderful achievement and working so hard. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Excited to be home soon. Great. Well, Haley, thanks for joining us. I know you had to pop out of class and uh, just want to help thank your mom too. She's been in c contact with us. So I'm um, really glad this worked out and uh, go back to the drawing board. I, board. I heard you're sort of on the on the plane to go do some additional tryouts for the, I, I believe the Olympics, if, if, the, if I am correct. Is that right? Or Team USA? Yeah, I fly out Thursday to South Carolina for a, a team camp to try out for an America team in June. So, yeah, uh -huh. leaving soon. Great. Well, good luck, and thank you again, everybody, and congratulations. And congratulations to Stanford as well. <laughs> thank you again. Okay. Bye-bye. And next up, uh, we, um, I'm gonna, since we're running a tiny bit early, um, I'm just gonna take a five minute break for our council members, um, get up and stretch, and, uh, and then we will be back um, at, right at noon time, if that works for everybody. We'll be back at noon, thank you. Okay. Okay. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our regular meeting.
Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be opened up for public comment. Please note public comment is heard only on items council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are numbers 10 through 37 on our agenda with the exception of item 16. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Seeing none, I'd like to ask the city clerk administrator to announce any additions or deletions to the agenda today. There are none. I'd like to make an announcement regarding oral communications today. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur at or around 5.30 p.m. today. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in at 5.30 p.m. today. I will go ahead and ask the uh, city attorney to provide a report on closed session, please. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor uh, Myers, members of the City Council. This morning, the Council met in closed session at 8.30 a.m. and uh, discussed the following items. Items one, well, item one was a conference of legal counsel concerning liability claims, the claims of Martin Basurto, and a claim by State Farm Insurance. Those items are listed as item 17 on your consent calendar for this afternoon. Item two was a conference with labor negotiators. The council met with and gave instructions to its uh, negotiator, uh, HR Director Lisa Murphy, with respect to uh, the following bargaining group, SEIU temporary employees. The third item was a conference with legal counsel uh, concerning anticipated litigation and the council met with legal counsel and discussed two potential litigation items. Item four was a conference with legal counsel involving existing litigation uh, and the case that was discussed is Santa Cruz Homeless Union et al. versus the city of Santa Cruz et al. currently pending in the United States District Court. Um, there was no reportable action this morning. Thank you, Mr. Gundotti. I'll now um, turn it over for item number eight, which is the city manager's report. Um, and this will be regarding updates on the city's business, COVID-19 response and events. Thank you, Mayor. Um, got a couple of items to update the council on. Um, as uh, we've done regularly, um, some COVID items and then some other items. I'll we'll start with uh, first uh, the uh, River Street uh, shelter closure. Uh, we've been getting a number of questions regarding that announcement. And so I'd like to ask our uh, Lee Butler to just kind of give an update on, on the, the status there uh, to, to provide information to the public. And then we'll move on to the COVID-19 updates. Thank you, Martine. Um, as the council is aware, the, the River Street Shelter is a program of Encompass in partnership with the county. Encompass is a, a nonprofit and it is not a city program. Um, the city was not involved in the decision to cease the shelter operations, um, but the, the city does have an interest in that for a number of reasons. Um, first off, the city owns the property on the Coral Street campus that has been leased to Encompass for many years um, or their fiscal agents for many years. Um, and they were operating it as a 34 bed shelter program for mental health patients of the county. Um, given the COVID restraints that are currently in effect, um, it's my understanding that about 13 clients are currently at the shelter. Um, the, the county and the city worked together last year to extend the lease until um, the end of June of this year. And the city was aware that Encompass was not planning to extend their lease beyond the current term at the end of June. But we just recently learned that they would cease operations on May 1st. 
Um, staff was also aware of Housing Matters' desire to explore moving its recuperative care center onto uh, the city property at that um, River Street Shelter location. And of course, shelter for people experiencing homelessness is greatly needed in the city of Santa Cruz, especially right now. Um, the city is in conversation with the county and Housing Matters about the future use of the space. But at this point, we've communicated that um, the priority use of the property is yet to be determined and that we have not initiated a conversation with the council yet about that priority. And um, that's the, the update on River Street at this point. Uh, also, uh, I did, uh, just so you know, I did uh, uh, talk to the uh, Monica Martinez, the executive director of uh, uh, Encompass, who uh, uh, noted that if uh, council members have any questions regarding uh, the uh, process or, or the operations there, that uh, she'd be very happy to, to speak to you um, and provide you with additional information as, uh, as needed. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to ask our fire chief to, uh, who attended the latest update on COVID to give an update on that. And then after that, I've got a couple more items to, to highlight. Go ahead, Chief uh, Heidi. Go ahead. Welcome, Chief. I met uh, Mayor and City Council, uh, Jason Heidi, your fire chief. Um, so I'm gonna uh, present what I've been uh, presenting in the last few meetings, and this is based on information from the state as well as uh, from our local county. And what you're seeing in front of you is the, the most up-to-date information for our county specifically. And the good news is, is that our um, cases are dropping um, and the number of fatalities has remained uh, relatively flat. Um, and, uh, you know, important to note here is that, you know, the single largest source of transmission of COVID is still person to person within households. Um, so our cases are dropping, which is uh, good news, but we are still seeing some uh, of, of that. Next slide, please. And really what this is, is um, it's the, uh, you know, the, the case rate for the number of new cases on a rolling average. And again, there's a precipitous drop uh, toward the end of January into February, and we're maintaining uh, that low transmission rate, our positivity number. And that's really good news, um, but we need to continue to do the work uh, to make sure that we keep those numbers low. Um, you've seen in the rest of the US, there are some states that are starting to see surges and some other parts of the world, um, in Italy, France, they're seeing uh, larger numbers of um, you know, transmission. Next slide. So this is California COVID, and really what this is, is I think this shows um, light at the end of the tunnel for us. Um, it shows the to total number of cases within the state, but it shows that, that ca those cases are dropping uh, per 100,000. And then there's a lag time in deaths, and those numbers are also dropping. And then the test, the positivity rate, those numbers are dropping. Uh, they, within the state, there's been a total of 22 million, or almost close to 23 million vaccines that have been distributed within the state. And as that number increases, um, the number of people who have immunity and can't transmit or suffer really significant medical issues, um, you know, again, we're getting closer to the end of the tunnel that we've been in here. Next slide. And this is from the uh, vaccine dashboard. And it kind of repeats a lot of the numbers as far as the overall number of doses, but it specifically points out um, the uh, county of Santa Cruz. So there have been um, close to um, 192,000 vaccine doses uh, distributed within the county. Um, and some of those are first, first shots, not necessarily you know, the second shot, um, but most of the information that has come out is after your first shot, you do have a pretty significant immunity to, um, to COVID as well as transmit, transmitting. You have to get that second shot because that's really what kicks your immune system into gear to uh, preventing um, you know, that serious illness. There have been a number of cases where people have tested positive after being vaccinated, but the good news is if you're locally at least, those people have been asymptomatic. So uh, they're not suffering uh, significant health issues. And if you look at the bottom dose here, or the bottom bar graph here, it just shows that there's been a steady increase in the number of vaccines distributed by day, by week. And so we're slowly getting to that point where um, our community as a whole is gonna be much more um, safe. 
And we're still within, as frustrating as it has been, within the state of California, within the 58 counties, we are still in the top, I think we're six out of 58. So we're at the top 10 as far as uh, distribution of vaccines uh, per capita. Um, so that's the good news. And those, uh, as the vaccines uh, become more available, they're ramping up those distribution efforts, both through the county health office, um, and then also, also through their partners, uh, through PAM Dignity, and they're expanding that out to um, other uh, places, CVS and Safeway. So the availability of vaccines um, is much more widespread than it was a month ago, and they're also opening up the um, you know the qualification to to be vaccinated, and that's going to expand significantly here in the next uh, few weeks, I believe. Next slide. So that kind of gets to this thing, uh, where, where we are at. Currently, we're in the orange tier, um, and I don't have a crystal ball, but if I was um, asked, I would think that we, uh, given all the indicators, um, I see us moving into the yellow tier in the near future. Um, and then also the governor announced that on June 15th, California will fully reopen its economy, but it's predicated on two really important considerations. One, equitable vaccine availability so that all people who want access to the vaccine have access to the vaccine. And then the other one that's really the whole reason for you know why we've done these restrictions and these tiers and all, this, all these things that we've gone through is that a low burden of disease, and that is you know, our hospitalization rate, people with significant long-term health issues, and that vac vaccination will prevent that. Currently, our hospitalization rate here in the county is really low, and that's good news. That means our hospitals are available for all those other issues that still occur, and they're not necessarily being displaced by um, that COVID, um, you know, the, the people who have COVID. So I see it's moving into the yellow tier shortly, um, and then uh, from a California whole perspective, us, us moving toward a more sense of normal, which is really, you know, where we need to try and actively go toward. Um, so more information will come out with that, but um, I think that's good news for all of us. Um, but we really have to meet those two criteria, which is vaccination, availability, and taking advantage of it, and then monitoring what the impacts are within the healthcare system um, as a whole. Next slide. So um, much like uh, my last update, um, how to get a vaccine appointment, because this has been an ongoing, um, you know, source of confusion. I think it's been really frustrating. You know, am I eligible? Where do I go to get this? And I would point everyone to SantaCruzHealth.org. They have a list of uh, within their vaccination page of all the different mechanisms and who's available and how to access that, who to call, um, and then you know, how do you sign up to get notified? And that would be MyTurn.California.gov. Uh, but locally, we're here in the, in the county, go to SantaCruzHealth.org. And uh, the more uh, vaccinations that we uh, get into people, the sooner we can get back to normal, which is um, you know, our, you know, one of my primary goals at the beginning of this for my department was to get all, all of us through this with as little impact as possible. And I think we're getting to that point. And um, I would also put that same goal to the entire community. And that's gonna be a combination of uh, vaccines and if you go to the next slide, um, really we need to um, can go, yeah we need to continue what we've been doing that works. Vaccinations are the end point, but in the short term, we know that doing those um, basic measures of you know you know washing our hands, keeping our distance, you know stay home if you're sick, and then wear a mask. Um, even for those vaccinated, um, it's kind of uh, one of those things where we don't know who's been vaccinated. But if you're indoors for a prolonged period of time with somebody, then we continue to do that really low impact measure, which is you know putting a mask on, um, and we can get through to uh, you know getting back to normal and being able to have gatherings and uh, give hugs and see people. Um, it's been a long year, but I think we are getting closer to the end here. Um, and that's what I have for you, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions if you have them. Are there any council members? Uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you for that information. Uh, I'm wondering if there's any updates on um, in-person meetings uh, and, and in regards to council meetings and if there's any projections on when that would happen. Um, I, you know, I'll, I'll defer to um, Martine on, on this for a whole, but 
I don't know that there's been any strict guidelines or guidance that's come out in um, how we go about that. Like, at what point do we say we're okay? Right. Um, I do know that we've had conversations because that's an end point or our goal to getting back to normal. Um, I see that if we do do this, that there will probably be some modifications as far as masking or distancing. Um, you know, at, at what point do we, you know, move back toward that? Um, but that has been a, uh, you know, what's the trigger point? What are the conditions? But we do know that we need to get back toward that. Yeah. I would add that we are working on a, um, a plan to, uh, uh, how do we get back to, uh, to normal based on uh, criteria and so we're currently actively working on that and uh, a number of uh, the organizations and cities throughout the state are as well so we're talking to each other to, to figure that out and sort that out uh, it, uh, i think 100 percent back to normal i think everybody recognizes is going to be a little while still uh, although there will be some significant changes obviously as we go to move to the yellow and the green tiers but some of the things like the masking and some of the social distancing will continue. And then also we have to evaluate how the pandemic has really impacted our operations. And there may be some things that we will want to continue just because it's a, uh, it's just something that's just a new way of doing business. Uh, for example, we're looking at uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, working from home uh, and, and doing more, more hybrids of that than we've done perhaps in the past. So that's all something we're currently in the process of evaluating and working with the departments to put that forward. And as soon as we have a plan, uh, we'll, we'll bring that to council and give you an update on, on all of that. Great, thank you. All right. The council member Cummings, please. Uh, just briefly for the public, um, can you just remind us the population of the county? Because um, it just seems like we're, we're more than about halfway through, it sounds like, of vaccinations for the county. We are, our, our county population is roughly about 260,000 people within the county. Um, and as you saw, we've given, or not we, but there's been about 190,000 vaccines uh, distributed. And some of those are first shots, some of those are the complete two shots, some of those are the single shot series. So we are really getting to that tipping point of more than less. And we're also mirroring what's happening within the state of California with, I believe we have about 40 million um, people and, and, and 22 million uh, vaccination doses have been distributed. So um, we are getting closer to that. Um, and I don't have the exact breakdown for the city itself. Um, I, I, can't get, I can't get that information. Um, but now is not the time to give up on those really easy measures as well as actively seeking out a vaccine uh, when you become eligible. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Heideck. Good to see you. Appreciate the update. Martine, is there other items? Yeah, a couple of uh, quick items. Uh, I'll start by uh, just sharing my screen real quick. Uh, <coughs> essentially, can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, it's just the uh, city's homepage. I wanted to just highlight a couple of things and using the uh, home screen to, to uh, guide uh, the community. One is uh, related to the vaccinations. We have had a request uh, for um, there's a need for volunteers at the community vaccination clinics. Uh, and the one in particular that has uh, asked for uh, volunteers, they really need volunteers, is the uh, Dignity uh, Vaccination Clinic, which is being held over at Grants 40 uh, Middle School. And um, the way to uh, volunteer is if you go on the city's main page here and you'll see at the top, there's the city's response to COVID-19. That'll take you to the city's COVID-19 uh, website, and then at the top of that, um, you'll see a, a link here to the Dignity Health, Dignity Health Medical Group uh, COVID-19 Vaccine Clinic, and there it, it'll take you to uh, a, um, it's the uh, sign-up site for, sign-up genius for that uh, clinic, and it gives you uh, information on what's required, and really there's no medical experience required, you just have to be 18. Uh, and it gives you all the information that you may need about uh, what you can do. They need people to help with directing traffic, confirming appointments, handing out forms, sanitation, sanitizing surfaces, and, and that sort of thing. So uh, this is just something that uh, there's a, a need to, uh, uh, to do uh, to assist the community. So I wanted to highlight that. And then the other thing I wanted to, um, oops, uh, to highlight is uh, going back to the city's homepage here. Uh, there was a question earlier about the, the survey for the city manager of recruitment, uh, and it is can be found on the main page. If you go to the main page and just scroll down, 
that under news, you'll see there's a link here to the, uh, the, the recruitment uh, page for the city manager, and that'll take you to the HR uh, page where you'll find all the information about the, the status of the recruitment and how to link to the, the survey and all that. So I wanted to highlight that as well for the council. And with that, I'm completed with the updates. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Martine. And thank you for um, bringing up the dignity, um, the need for volunteers. I've been volunteering at that clinic and uh, just the posting that people have done, um, I was there yesterday and uh, they're already getting more volunteers. So that's super helpful. And um, so thank you for using our social media to be able to try to gather up some additional, we definitely don't wanna lose a vaccine clinic because of lack of volunteers. So thanks for pointing that out. I really appreciate that. Um, and council member Cummings, did you have additional questions? I did, I had two brief questions. One was related to the River Street building. I was just curious, um, you know, moving forward with the use of that building, is there gonna be a role of council or members of the public? Because I know it sounds like there's an interest from um, uh, Housing Matters. And then I also you know, hear from people though the need for more behavioral health and mental health beds. And so really trying to meet the needs of the community. So I'm just curious about you know, what that's gonna look like moving forward in terms of how that building's used. I'll let uh, you go ahead. So I was going to say, you can go ahead. But, but basically, this, yes, the city is a landlord. We have a landlord role. We don't have a role in so far as obviously operating programs or, 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 uh, or direct service provisions, but we are the landlord. And so the, there are discussions with respect to the use of that um, in conjunction with the county, who's the, largely the, the uh, funder of the various programs in Housing Matters as an operator. Um, so those discussions are happening, uh, and we have a role insofar as, again, is the, uh, is the uh, landlord aspect of that. But again, we also have an interest overall in the provision of services, uh, and so we'll, we'll have that input as well. I don't know if you want to add anything more to that. Uh, just that um, the, the council actually approves the, um, the lease, ultimately. Okay. Thank you. And then the other question I had was related to COVID-19. I know that there's funding from the most recent relief package that's coming through the states and going to cities and counties. And I was just wondering if you could give an update on how much we're anticipated to receive. And then is there any process or discussion around how that funding is gonna be spent? The, uh, the state or the federal? Uh, okay. Yeah, so the, the, the most significant one that uh, has been provided is from the federal, that was from the, uh, the federal stimulus package just recently approved. Um, and we anticipate receiving about uh, 15 million uh, in that. Uh, uh, largely, um, it will likely, uh, and this will come back to the council in, in, in the budget process, but uh, uh, largely it'll, it'll uh, have to be allocated towards uh, trying to uh, maintain and retain essential services, uh, current services, as we saw uh, revenue losses of over $20 million in our own budget. So that will help with uh, fiscal stability by as time to look at uh, trying to address uh, the uh, projected fiscal year uh, budget for next year and really uh, keep us from making you know, severe cuts in, in next year's budget. However, in addition, there is some uh, CDBG uh, related funding that will come that's uh, additional for specifically for homeless uh, services. And so we'll be looking at that to allocate that towards uh, uh, the uh, provision of uh, shelter facilities and, and perhaps uh, with the implementation of whatever action the council takes as it relates to the uh, uh, temporary outdoor living ordinance or uh, again, the provision of uh, sheltering and, and, and the high needs for uh, assisting the homeless community. So those will be the, uh, but those will come back to the council as well. Thank you. Thank you, Martine. Any other questions for Martine? Not seeing any. Okay. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, sir, very much. Next, um, we'll move on to the city council. Um, I'll call now on the clerk, excuse me, city clerk to provide any updates to our calendar. There are no updates. Great, thank you. Okay, next up is the, um, our consent agenda today. And these are items 10 through 24 on our agenda. 
For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items 10 through 24. Please note, we will not be discussing or taking comment on item 15 today. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying you have been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any item, council members who wish to comment on or pull any items? And just a reminder for the public today, we will not be taking action on item 15 that has been, um, that will come before us on April 27th. Uh, is there any council members who wish to pull, comment or pull any item? I see council member Colin Tari Johnson's hand. Thank you, just a comment on item 14. Okay. And council member Cummings. I had a comment on items numbers 13. Well, I have a question for 13, a comment for 14. A question on 16, and I'd like to pull number 18. So a question on 13, a comment on 16, and comment, uh, a comment on 14, a uh, question on 16, and then poll 18. Okay. Okay. And Council Member Brown? Uh, all of mine have been covered. I, I do want to comment on um, on 16 as well and 18. So um, I'll do that when the time is right. Do you have a comment on 16? Uh, questions and comment, yeah. Questions and comments, okay, great. Okay, great. Okay, uh, so for our consent agenda, item number 18 will be pulled today. And now I will go ahead and ask for uh, questions or comments. I believe item 13 was pulled for question or comment. Is that correct? Council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. I wanna thank the uh, general manager, Igor Garvik uh, from the Catalyst for contacting us um, for all the work that he's done on this item and for um, Mayor Myers and Vice Mayor Bruner for helping to bring this forward. I did have a comment maybe if um, our economic development director is on the line there she is. Yep. Hi, Bonnie. Welcome. Bonnie. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I had some members of the public reach out, and one thing they brought to mind is, you know, whether there might be a potential for the city through some of its different funding sources to potentially um, provide financial support for some of the music venues in town that they might be able to pay back. So similar to the loan program, or even maybe a grant program that could be created since they're gonna be closed for so long. And then knowing that, you know, as we reopen, there's gonna be a lot of energy around getting back into concerts. And so there might be an opportunity for those kinds of venues, specifically those that have been, you know, shuttered for so long to give back. And so I was just wanting to bring that question that I heard from the community forward to see, you know, what opportunities might be available. So we do have our newly expanded Grow Santa Cruz loan program that's been funded with uh, the major $2.75 million loan from the Economic De Development Administration. And that's going to be leveraged up to $4.5 million for the city of Santa Cruz um, through existing sort of match um, with National Development Council. Um, there are two loan opportunities within that, the major capital infrastructure loans of half a million, and then smaller um, loans of, of around 50,000. And um, that is a, for working capital. And so that is a potential for opportunity for live music, music venues as well um, to apply for those funds. And they'll have technical assistance in applying. Um, it's, it's a streamlined application and we have great support both with uh, the Small Business Development Center who's going to provide some technical support and National Development Council. So it's a really nice expansion of our existing Grow Santa Cruz loan program that's a recovery, expanded recovery effort. So that's the main sort of funding that we have. When we look at grants, I mean, the amount of funding is something we can explore 
um, but typically the amount of funding is is fairly large per music venue, and so unless council would like to direct a specific funding source towards that, I think it might be a challenge for us to do additional grant funds or a grant program specific to live music venues. But the loan program is up and running now. We're having a soft launch um, in the city because we already have an existing program that we're expanding, and we expect to actually do some pretty extensive marketing countywide here within the next month um, of the overall program and that opportunity. Great, thank you. And is that, um, if, if we wanted to share information with um, people who are interested in contacting us, is that through choosesantacruz.com? Yes. Yeah, and we'll be also putting out, we'll post it on choosesantacruz.com, uh, and we'll also be doing pretty extensive marketing on that. Our existing program is there now, um, and we're actually just finalizing some of the marketing materials this week and next week with um, National Development Council for that. But they can apply or inquire right now, and we'll get them um, in the process. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bonnie. Any other questions from council members on item 13, questions or comments? Okay, moving on, I'll go ahead and look for comments or questions on item number 14. Was that one called, was, yeah, I think, mean, yes, go ahead, council member Collintari Johnson. Thank you, it took me a moment to raise my hand. Um, yeah, I wanted to thank Mayor Myers and staff for um, supporting the resolution to acknowledge the um, holy Muslim holy month of Ramadan. Um, this began yesterday evening and um, it commences for the rest of the month, the next month. And it's really a focus uh, on spiritual renewal and reflection. And um, it's a month of giving back to the community and, and charity. Uh, so I wanted to acknowledge that this month of Ramadan has begun, and I wanted to, um, to all of the Muslim Americans here in Santa Cruz and all the Muslims beyond, I wanted to say Ramadan Mubarak. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Okay. There was a question or comment on item number 16 as well. I think that was pulled by council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, one thing that stood out to me with this is that um, the funds that are coming back to the city were supposed to be used for tenant relocation and assistance. And I know that when projects come forward, oftentimes we hear that um, you know tenants who were previously in some of these projects, if they were displaced, they get first right of refusal. Um, it sounds like these funds are supposed to be used for relocation assistance, but there's a it seems like a significant amount of funding that's left. And so I'm just curious about, is there any information on you know, whether those tenants who were in, who were displaced from that development, whether they received the assistance and kind of why there's so much funding left over um, if we were expecting this to go to help support those tenants? Councilmember Cummings, let me um, ask Jessica DeWitt, who I believe is on this call, to see if she has specific information. The um, information we did receive is that this is funding that was not used. So it's our understanding that their, their needs were addressed. Those that needed relocation assistance and benefits um, were, were able to receive that. But I don't have the specific breakdown. So I see Jessica's on, so I'm going to defer to her to answer that question. Yeah, so oftentimes, so this funding originally came through the infrastructure infill grant through state HCD. So, so they're making a, you know, a conservative estimate of what they think the relocation funds will be. Um, my understanding from the property owner slash developer is that they they did meet the needs of the re, the tenants that requested relocation assistance. As to whether the the pot was too you know too big originally, you know I'm I don't know the exact answer to that question, but I do know that they did meet whoever asked for it or requested relocation assistance received it. And so now now the idea is this is a very uncommon situation. So you know it's not like this is going to happen every single time we have an affordable housing development, um, but. Since this has happened in this uncommon situation, the state is trying to now make sure other folks who are low income in the community also receive the benefit of this direct subsidy. 
Um, so that's why there, in the staff report, it directly references having it go directly to the, the, the community, not through a secondary uh, service provider. And, and I will just add, uh, Council Member Cummings, that um, there is state required, had required noticing to all the tenants um, in the property, and that did happen. That was my next question, so thank you. Okay. Council Member Brown, did you have a question on this item? Yeah, just to follow up, um, you know, I'm, I, um, I appreciate the explanation and I'm, I'm glad that we're able to, you know, keep this money in our community and use it for these purposes. I'm really glad HCD agreed to your proposals. Um, and I'm not quite so sanguine though about the, the role the developer played in actually providing, um, you know, relocation assistance because, you know, I was involved in conversations with tenants there, with legal aid, with many, um, you know, different actors who were involved and it didn't seem like the uh, developer was um, doing their best to make sure this information was available. So. How if they met the requirements, I understand that. I don't believe that the tenants were really under many of them did not really understand um, what was gonna what was happening and what they could you know what they could um, get to assist with their um, displacement. Uh, so you know I'm just and I had a feeling way back when when we were having this conversation about the tax credits. but I so given that, I, I just worry that um, you know, we're, we're monitoring, and I know we have a system for monitoring um, and the, you know, the affordability level for affordable housing units. And so I just wanted to ask, you know, what, where that, what's the plan there? Um, and, and just really stress that I think it's really very important that we watch this particular um, development for any potential violations because they, they don't seem really inclined to, um, try to be helpful. And, you know, I mean, it's, I, I'm sorry to say that, but that's just what happened. Um, so I, I don't mean to, you know, critique <laughs> the effort, but it's it, it, it happened. So I see Jessica maybe is going to Yeah, I mean, I can speak to the, so the various funding sources that this developer, developer applied for, um, for instance, the affordable housing tax credits through the state, as well as state HCD funding, all of those have requirements for monitoring for affordability. Um, and, you know, this property should be uh, uh, meeting the compliance on an annual basis that's double checked by the state. Um, I need to check to see if we're, uh, Bonnie, I don't know if you, if we gave some money. I don't think we, I don't think there's any city money in this, um, in this project. So technically, they do need to to perform for the inclusionary, so the city would be able to at least keep an eye on what's happening with the property and the compliance, and um, we can probably work with the state on trying to request um, whatever reports they get. Um, you know, we could ask for those as well. Yeah, that would be really great, and I, I don't imagine that it requires a motion, but if if we could just get, if people think that's a good idea, I would love to see that happen when the time comes, when the reporting happens that we get to see it as well. Thank you, council member. And is that a request to get like a, like an FYI regarding that or is that? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. FYI would be good. Okay, yeah. great. Thanks. Thank you for that clarification. Any other uh, questions on item 16? Not seeing any. Okay. Okay, we are going to go ahead and uh, move on to public comment on our consent uh, agenda. If there are members of the public that would like to speak to any item on the consent agenda with the exception of item number 18, now is the time to do so. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted the timer will then be set to two minutes. And I see one item, one, uh, one participant in the audience um, assuming you would like to 
comment on or one of the items on on the consent agenda. Is that your intention? Looks like it. Okay. Um, phone number four two nine four, please. This would be on all items on the consent. Any item on the consent agenda, I aside from item eighteen. Go ahead, please. Hello. Can you hear me out there? We can. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> this is Nicole Baum. Um, I'm calling. I'm the events and outreach coordinator for the Santa Cruz Community Farmers Markets. And I'm calling in support of the potential for additional funding for the Market Match Double Up program. Um, I want to start by just saying thank you to the city uh, for your enormous support thus far. Um, people are grateful and greatly impacted by this program, which we started in May of 2020. Um, hundreds, if not over a thousand residents have participated at this point, and many farms are also uh, experiencing a really significant boost economically from this program. Um, prior to the market match incentive, use of EBT at the downtown farmers markets was about 30 individuals participating weekly, and after six months of the market match incentive program, that number has grew to 164 participants on average, and at this point, as of March of 2021, we had an average of 182 participants weekly. Um, so that number is still growing all the time, and um, that 182 participants represented almost $9,000 going into the pockets of residents for fresh fruits and veggies, and then eventually into the hands of regional farms as well. Um, since we began the program in uh, May of last year, uh, the, there's been uh, $72,000 that have gone into the hands of residents for fresh fruits and veggies at the markets. Um, and of the people participating in the program, over 750 of them were first-time participants in the EBT CalFresh program at the farmer's market. So um, I just want to say one more thing which is that I've been doing some a little bit of research and I found an interesting study out of Colorado State University that showed that um, for every dollar invested in a healthy food incentive program, we can expect to see up to $3 in economic activity generated as a result. And so the program, this market match double up program that you all have been supporting um, addresses food equity and food access for residents, but it also has a, um, a big impact on the general economy in our city. So thank you very much, and we hope to, that you will consider uh, continuing to fund uh, the program at the market. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm now looking for a motion on our consent items 10 through 24, with the exception of item 18. to see who got there first. Um, that would be Council Member Cummings, followed by Council Member Watkins. I'll move the consent with the exception of item number 13. Oh, sorry, with the exception of item number 18. Okay, Council Member Watkins. I'll second that. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion by Council Member Cummings, seconded by Council Member Watkins to move items 10 through 24 with the exception of item 18 on our consent agenda. And could I ask for a roll call vote, please? Council Member Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We'll now move on to item number 18 on our consent agenda, which has been pulled. And Brian Organo, our parking program manager, uh, if you would be available. This is um, the item that we will be discussing under the consent agenda is the beach area parking meter rate ordinance updates. And I believe council member Cummings, I believe you, you um, pulled this. Would you like a presentation on this from staff or how do you want to proceed? Um, I just have a, 
a couple questions uh, related to this item and related to some items that came before us in the past. I know that um, previously, and, and especially during COVID when we were making, um, we were trying to prioritize uh, the city's work given that uh, many city staff uh, were unable to work because of the impacts of the pandemic. Um, we There was an item that we had been discussing related to uh, providing some of the funding from parking to go towards supporting the impacts to the Beach Flats community. And I wanted to revisit that because um, I was contacted by a member of the public because you know they, they see that the, the meter rates are you know going up and they were wondering you know we had this discussion going on and we, we stopped that for the purposes of the pandemic but um, a lot of people are still really concerned because the beach flats um, unlike i think any other neighborhood in santa cruz only has one way in one way out and during the summer it's probably one of the most heavily impacted neighborhoods in the city of santa cruz and it's the lowest income neighborhood in the city of santa cruz and so i just wanted to see you know, um, given that discussion that we had initiated, you know, what, are, what are some opportunities for us to really think about how we can um, provide some community benefits given that, you know, the boardwalk brings in uh, a lot of revenue, the city is able to um, use some of the revenue from the parking and its general fund, but yet you have this community that is severely impacted. I mean, in the summer, on a good weekend, if you leave, and as a resident, if you leave the beach flats at 10 a.m., there are often times where you cannot get back in the neighborhood without sitting in traffic for over an hour until after 5 p.m. And you know, given that it's our most, our lowest income community, we face these impacts. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to bring up that point of you know, how do we provide additional community impacts to this neighborhood that's so negatively impacted by the traffic that we generate for revenue for the city? So maybe what I what I'll do, council member, is um, Brian. Would you like to just give an overview of the item, um, and that way we can get everybody sort of acquainted, and then maybe I believe the item is uh, yeah regarding the meter rate ordinance. Um, but maybe there's comments or discussion about uh, council member Cummings' uh, uh, questions after that. So Brian, are you prepared to with the PowerPoint, or do you want to walk us through it? I know there is a two-page staff report. It's pretty straightforward, but I just didn't know if you wanted to add anything, any context to this, or if we want to jump into those specific questions presented. Yeah, I don't. I don't have a PowerPoint uh, presentation prepared for today, but I can share a map of the specific areas that we are talking about that affect the two ordinances for the two different rate structures um, to help orientate the rest of uh, council. Can you guys see my screen now? Uh, we can, yes. Okay. Uh, so the, the two ordinance changes that are proposed um, today for introduction um, are related to the beach meter areas, and there's two different zones. So in red, we have uh, rate one, which is a variable two hour rate, and in the green, we have rate two. Uh, we, we took action on this just a couple years ago to increase these rates, and I think the same conversation that, that Justin's bringing up was brought up then. Um, but we have certain thresholds of, of being able to adjust these within Coastal Commission um, regulations without having to go for a full coastal development permit. Um, and so we're bringing this forward again for another 25% increase um, on these meters, which would bring the rate up to a base hourly rate of $2.25. Um, the conversation isn't addressed in the staff report that Justin brings up in part because it's more of a budgetary question. These revenues do go into the general fund. Um, and we would see an increase year over year in general fund revenues. And I think that those additional conversations um, could be continued during budget process times. And you know, the discussion of allocation of funds for particular projects um, is something that can be handled every year uh, during the budgetary process. And so it's pretty straightforward in the staff report and it's pretty straightforward today that what we're looking to do is, is give permission to implement a, another 25% increase in these two meter zones. Um, the residential neighborhoods also have a, a residential permit program in place that help protect them from some parking challenges, um, and that still remains very affordable uh, as far as an annual permit, and we enforce uh, very heavily in the beach area to try to help protect the residents that are adjacent to these areas and discourage uh, parking behavior from impacting them, um, you know, continued every summer that we see as the beach is an attraction every year. So. Um, if there's any other specific questions about the ordinance, um, I, I'd be happy to answer them or about um, enforcement practices in, in the beach area and, and the 
impacts of this ordinance change. Thank you, Brian. I'll go ahead and uh, open it up for additional council member questions at this time. Council member Brown. I, yeah, thank you. I, um, I read the report, the agenda report. I understand the intention and it, it fully fits with our, um, you know, our, our goals around, um, you know, pricing for length of stay and um, all of this. So I, you know, I, I, that's not a concern for me. I, uh, I did have some of the same questions raised uh, as council member Cummings. And, um, you know, uh, so I, I guess I want to um, just put in a, my voice of support for having that conversation when the time comes. I do think that when it came up the first time around, we had a pretty productive conversation about some of the things that um, Beach Lots residents experience related to parking and, um, and just overall impacts. And it does seem uh, worth a conversation to talk about how to target some of that funding uh, to ameliorate those uh, impacts. So I, when, I'd love to have that conversation when we get there. Um, and then the other question I have is um, about the, you know, so you've said you're, um, you're in kind of in touch with the Beach Lots community and kind of tracking the effects related to parking and citations and permitting and all of that. And so I'm, I'm just wondering if we have any data on what that looks like. I know that's, um, I mean, not right this second, but is it would it be possible to try to get a handle on, you know, how many tickets are being issued? Um, are they connected to the extent we can figure that out to any the the community, the, the housing there? Um, just to understand what you know, because all of my um, feedback is, is anecdotal. You know, I, I have friends who have lived in the beach lots over the years. Um, some of whom have uh, you know kind of limited capacity to. Um, you know, get information via the internet or, you know, connect with the city and they end up getting, you know, tickets and towed and, you know, they live there, but they don't know what, how to deal with it. And, and so I, I guess I just want to um, see if we can, um, you know, have that conversation in the future with some of that information attached to it, um, just to, you know, kind of help us understand where to go, if anywhere. Thank you, Council for, Member Brown. Oh, go can ahead, I, Brian. Can I, can I respond? Yeah, for citation data, we can provide some of the citation data, and I know that there's you know some additional traffic studies that talk about you know impact in that corridor, especially during the summer season. Um, it, it would be hard to distinguish some citation data, but we do you know we track it separately for like say a permit violation with a resident, and try to work with the with the residents that are impacted the most and respond to their complaints as much as possible um, to try to keep the the nature of the supply and demand you know, from spilling over into the neighborhoods. I think it's always a challenge of finding the right balance. So some of that data does, does exist. Thank you, yeah. And, and I appreciate all of your efforts to try to manage this. It's a very difficult situation. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, and I'll just echo what Council Member Brown said. There's a way that we can get a memo um, or an FYI with that information, I think it would be great. And then also, if we might be able to get some kind of, um, some information about, you know, even potentially how much would it cost if we were, if the city was to provide parking passes free for Beach Flats residents, um, I think it would just be a good thing to know because if it's a minimal amount, then it might be that we could provide that from our general fund to the residents here, given that it's the lowest income community and highest impacted by traffic during the summer. So if we could get just some information, um, you know, per household or per address, you know, if we were to give each um, each household in the beach flats a parking permit for the summer, what that would cost. Good. Brian, does that work for you? You kind of got what kinds of questions would be answered in FYI? Yes, I took some notes. I, I think I could help cover some of those additional questions from, from both Council Member Brown and Cummings. Okay. Any other questions on this item? Seeing none, then I would uh, look to come back to uh, a motion for item number 18. That was pulled. Mayor, we need public comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Bonnie. I'll go ahead and bring this out to the public. Um, this is for item number 18 on our consent agenda. 
Is there anyone in the um, audience that would like to comment on this? If you would, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. I'm not seeing any hands at this time. So I'll go ahead and bring it back to council and I would be looking for a motion on item number 18. Uh, I have council member Cummings. Uh, I'll move on uh, item number 18. I did have one final question. I know we've we've discussed, you know, potentially having some kind of discussion around um, ways that we can uh, provide or, or identify benefits for the beach class supplies community. I'm just curious, when would that be a good conversation to have or how we could make that conversation happen? And I don't know if that's for the city manager or city staff. Uh, certainly, as, uh, as Brian uh, pointed out, you can have that discussion as part of the budget process if, if the, uh, the consideration is to set aside funding for uh, general fund revenues for a particular uh, neighborhood or a particular purpose. Uh, that, would, that would make sense in, in that regard. Thank you. I have a motion by Councilmember Cummings. Uh, Councilmember Golder. I'll second that. So I have a motion by Council Member Cummings, seconded by Council Member Golder um, to uh, approve item number 18 on our consent agenda. And Bonnie, can we do a roll call vote, please? Yeah, I just want to confirm it's to move staff recommendation. Staff recommendation, proposed. yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yes. Okay. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, I am going to go ahead and uh, next up is our consent public hearing. And then we have going into general bent business. Um, I'm just looking, Bonnie, I believe we're doing pretty well, a little bit behind. Um, Okay, yeah, let's go ahead and move into consent public hearings. This is item number 25 and 26 on, your, on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Are there any council members who wish to pull items 25 or 26? I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, okay, last, last, uh, and then um, we will go ahead and look for a motion on these two items then. We, we well, need I, public comment. Do we need to go, okay. Sorry, okay, so, okay, sorry. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and uh, put this out for um, public comment. So this is items number 25 and 26 on our agenda. And this is on the consent public hearings part of our agenda. And I am not seeing any hands. So I will go ahead and look for a motion on our consent public hearings for item number 25 and 26. And I see council member Watkins. I'll move our consent public hearing uh, item 25 and 26. And council member Golder. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion by Council Member Watkins and seconded by Council Member Golder for, to approve uh, items number 25 and 26 in our, under our consent public hearings. Although, uh, can I please have a roll call vote? Mm -hmm. Council Member Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Did 
I miss that? Go oh, no, you're muted. Sorry. Oh, I, I, Thank you. Sorry. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That pass and pass, excuse me, that motion passes unanimously. Uh, and just for the public today, I just want to recognize the work of our staff on bringing forward the um, the ordinance on school district and employer sponsored housing, uh, inclusionary housing. And um, I think that's a huge achievement for the city. So I really want to recognize our planning commission and our um, planning department and our, of course, um, economic development department. I, I believe we're probably pretty close to one of the first cities in California likely to do this. So um, just something to be really proud of. And thank you everyone for all your work on that really over the last year, almost year and a half. Okay, um, we are running pretty much on time. Um, we are a little bit behind. So um, I had scheduled in a break here um, so that folks can get up to the sandwich, uh, get some lunch. Um, I would like to try to get everybody one o'clock now. Why don't we come back at 1:25 and um, hopefully we'll get a we'll get a 25 minute break in here. So uh, for the public, we are going to uh, take a break and the council will be back at 1:25. For members of the public, we are now on agenda item number 27, the Arts Commission appointment. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and action. And. I believe, Bonnie, you are the pre presenter. I am. Thank you, Mayor. Um, council, I do know we normally do a rotating. We start with one council member and do nomination down the, the road. But being in Zoom, I think maybe, Mayor, if you're amenable, we could do just whoever has a nomination can raise their hands and any new nominations can raise their hands. And then we'll do the vote. Okay, sounds good. And Bonnie, can I just take the, okay, we'll just, yeah, one by one, 27, 28, 29, we'll do it that way. Okay, great. Is there a motion from uh, council members uh, regarding a uh, member for our arts commission? Uh, I, see, I see council member Golder. I can nominate Rob Blitzer. And I will second that nomination. And um, so Rick, like it's, not a motion, it's not a motion yet. We're now just doing the nominations and then when we just get the our okay. nominees, then we'll do a vote, but yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so we have an, a nomination for uh, Blitzer. Uh, I see Council Member Brown. Would you like to nominate someone? Uh, Chris Carr, Christopher Carr. And Council Member Cummings. No? Okay, you're good. Any other council members with nomination? No. Okay. And then, Bonnie, do I, you want me to call on each one separately then? And take um, I can go ahead and, and uh, yeah, I'll do a roll call vote. Um, so for nominee Blitzer, um, we'll do council member Watkins. I was gonna go with Carr. So should I say no or? or? Yeah, actually, let's just, I'll do a roll call and you state your, your vote. So, Council Member Watkins, you were going to go for Carr. Yes. Kalantari Johnson? Carr. Brown? Carr. Cummings? Carr. Holder? Holder. Vice Mayor Brunner? Blitzer. And Mayor Myers. Blitzer. So it's Christopher Carr. Great. We'll move on to Sister Cities Committee appointments. And is there a council member that would like to make a nomination? 
Is uh, Councilmember Cummings? I'd like to nominate Hira Park. Councilmember Brown? Did you have the same nomination? Yeah. Okay, great. We have one nomination, Hira Park, unless there's any other council members with any other nominees. Doesn't look like it. Okay, we'll go ahead and have a vote. Roll call vote. Well, I think it's. And no other nominees. So it like is happening. Sorry, we don't have to, so we don't have to memorialize it with a vote. Okay. Um, and next up, we have the Equal Employment Opportunity Committee appointment. And I see uh, Councilmember Contrary Johnson, Watkins, and Golder. I'd like to nominate Alfredo Monique. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Watkins, did you have a nominee? Michael Polhamus. Okay. And, okay, so we have two nominees this time. Uh, same way, Bonnie, you wanna just have council members name their, their uh, preferred member? Councilmember Watkins. Michael Polhamus. Calentari Johnson. Alfredo Monrique. Brown. Alfredo Manrique. Cummings. Alfredo Manrique. Golder. Michael Polhamus. Vice Mayor Bruner. And Alfredo Manrique. And Mayor Myers. And I would vote for Paul Hamas. So we have a new member, Alfredo Manrique. So great. Thank you, council members. And we will move on to item number 30. Item number 30 is explore renaming locations and landmarks from Loudon Nelson to London Nelson. And I'm, actually, I'm sorry, Mayor Myers. I'm so sorry. We, we didn't open for public comment. Oh. On any of the yeah. Okay. Go back to item number 20, 27, 28, 29. Was there any attendees that wanted to? Apologies to the public. I'm moving too fast today. I'm moving too fast today. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone in the audience. Okay, so we will move on to item number 30 now, explore renaming locations and landmarks for Loudon Nelson to London Nelson and accurately honoring and depicting the history of Mr. Nelson. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order for the item will be a presentation um, by staff followed by questions from the council we will then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and action. If you are, I'll, I'll remind folks how they can um, get into uh, uh, public comment after we hear um, from the staff report and, uh, and we take questions from council. So I'll go ahead and turn this over now to Rachel Kaufman, our recreation superintendent. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, City Council members. Can you hear me okay? Just a quick check. Perfect. My name is Rachel Kaufman, Recreation Superintendent with Parks and Recreation, and today I'm bringing you a topic that has been long discussed in our city, uh, the recognition of local hero Loudon or London Nelson. And since uh, the name of Mr. Nelson is a key point of discussion, just for clarity, I'll refer to him as Mr. Nelson moving forward in this presentation. And joining his panelists today um, is Santa Cruz Equity Project founder, Luna Bay, local historian, Ross Gibson, Loudon Nelson Community Center Supervisor, Iseth Ray, and Civic Supervisor and City Liaison to be a friend at the town clock. Uh, Jesse Bond. Included in the agenda packet, as you have seen, are many historical documents and articles uh, which both affirm the complex history of Mr. Nelson's name 
and also show the community's struggle over time with how to accurately honor his contributions to the city. From 1948, when a Santa Cruz chapter of the NAACP is described as being aware of the story of Mr. Nelson and advocated for a monument to commemorate his life, to 1978 and 1979, when Lowell Hunter advocated for the property on which the city school administrative buildings now stand um, to be named Loudon Nelson Plaza and the community center to be named Loudon Nelson Community Center. To 1984, when the group Friends of Loudon Nelson advocated to city council for the center and landmarks to be changed to London Nelson and were subsequently met by opposition by leaders in the black community who had fought for the original naming of the center to the present day when the Black Lives Matter movement inspired a recent petition on change.org to correct the name of the center to London Nelson. It's clear that how to accurately honor Mr. Nelson's important contributions has a long history of its own and is what we'll be discussing again today. But before moving forward, I just wanna clarify what we're asking of city council today. Um, we're not asking you to make a decision on the name of the community center today. Um, we are just simply asking you to endorse the community's effort to continue to explore the renaming of locations and landmarks honoring Mr. Nelson and to direct the Historic Preservation Commission to place an item on the May 19th agenda to discuss the name correction. And so after the meeting with the Historic Preservation Commission, then we'll come back to council at that time for a recommendation. So I'd like to start just with what inspired today's discussion. Um, in August of 2020, the Loudon Nelson Community Center Supervisor, Isis Ray, received a petition by community member Brittany London, and, and yes, her name is Brittany London, just coincidentally, uh, that she launched on change.org to rename the Loudon Nelson Community Center the London Nelson Community Center. And the petition received over 1,300 signatures from community members and is still active online. Isis and I met with Brittany to discuss the petition and we reviewed historical documents that were kept at the center. Considering the complex history, which I just described, uh, a small project team was assembled to uh, discuss further the best next steps on how to proceed. And the project team included petitioner Brittany London, NAACP President Brenda Griffin, City Council Member Justin Cummings, Santa Cruz Equity Project Founder Luna Bay, local historian Ross Gibson, Loudon Nelson Community Center Supervisor Isa Ray, Civic Supervisor Jesse Bond, and myself. And in January and February 2021, the group held four meetings uh, to discuss if and how to move forward with renaming of locations and landmarks honoring Mr. Nelson. Items discussed at these meetings included just review of historical evidence, the opposition by the black community in 1984, the various locations where Mr. Nelson is honored, and what further efforts should be pursued to educate the community on Mr. Nelson's legacy. Unfortunately, Brittany is not able to be here on the Zoom call today uh, to describe her reasons for launching the petition as she just gave birth last week. Um, and I'm sure she's watching the presentation from home. Hi, Brittany. Uh, but at this, <laughs> at this time, I'd like to introduce Luna Bay, a member of the project team, uh, to read a letter that was prepared by Brittany about her efforts. So Luna, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Brittany's letter says, growing up in Santa Cruz, the Loudon Nelson Center has always been an important cultural oasis. My first summer camp that I attended at the age of six was at the Loudon Nelson Center. From Juneteenth events, plays, and friends' birthdays parties are just a few of the memories that are anchored to this building. Over the course of the last year's pandemic, I started a petition on why I believe the center deserves to have a name change, and over 1,300 people who have signed the petition also agree with me. The history that parallels with this land reflects the importance of black culture and its existence here in Santa Cruz. As a black woman and Santa Cruz local, I think it is beyond imperative that we have 
history that accurately reflects the name of one of our first black leaders. We're better time than now not only to rename, but to reclaim history. My hopes are that this decision is unanimous and that we can honor Mr. Nelson in the way that it was intended to be from the very start. Brittany London Porter. And I'll turn it back to you, Rachel. Thanks, Linda. And um, first, you know, so before we're beginning the, this, this discussion, um, it's important to talk about the contributions by Mr. Nelson to the Santa Cruz School District. And um, Luna, who just spoke, has done extensive research on Mr. Nelson's life. So actually, I'm going to swing it back over to her, and she's going to uh, share this history with you about these important contributions. Thank you again, Rachel. Um, I first want to start uh, by thanking you all for taking the time to, uh, to to hear this. This is very exciting to be a part of. Um, and I would say it's, it's clear now that if a school system was to shut down, the entire city would go with it. Um, that's very clear right now. Imagine what it was like in Santa Cruz where there was no Highway 17. There, were, there was no Highway 1. There were no railroads. There were people on wagons who made it down here to this little enclave of, of a town. And if the school system in the 1800s was to shut down, there would be no Santa Cruz. And the school system was saved by the contributions of Mr. Nelson. Mr. Nelson was born enslaved in North Carolina. He was then trafficked to South Carolina, where he was uh, purchased and then taken to Knoxville, Tennessee, in order to meet with Matthew Nelson, who trafficked him and Marlboro Nelson to California with the intention of having them mine gold for him. Mr. Nelson and Marlboro were able to accumulate enough wealth where Mr. Nelson was able to purchase his freedom, which was no small feet and was able to travel all the way to Santa Cruz and to set up rent a piece of land and eventually purchase it to live out the rest of his life. Marlboro could not stay with him as he was worth much more and did not have enough to purchase his freedom and likely went back um, to Knoxville, Tennessee with Matthew. But Mr. Nelson ended his life here. And on his deathbed, he left his entire fortune and everything he owned to the city of Santa Cruz to keep the schools open. This was no small decision. This action alone saved the city. If the schools were to close now, the city would go. And the same thing happened then. So considering such a contribution, the very least we can do is say his name correctly. Say his name as he would have heard it. Say his name as it was heard at Pacific when people were buying his food and his fruit and getting their, their, uh, their shoes fixed. His name was London, and he should be memorialized and honored as such. Now I'll pass it back to Rachel. Thank you, Luna. Um, as Luna stated, the contribution to the city is significant, and many groups over time have looked to honor Mr. Nelson's generosity and support for education. Uh, but the question does still remain on the name to use to honor his contributions. And his name is both recorded as London and Loudon Nelson, as well as, um, as you'll soon see, other misspellings. And so we're very lucky today to have to talk more about the various names of Mr. Nelson and provide a background. Um, it's our local historian, Ross Gibson. Ross has recently published an article in the Santa Cruz Sentinel about this very issue. And so at this time, I'm going to share my screen for some slides that Ross is gonna share with you. Thank you, Rachel. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Ross. Thanks for being here. Sure. Uh, Bill Reeder did the original research on London Nelson traveling throughout the South to collect uh, documents that told part of the story. And he showed that plantation owner William Nelson named his enslaved workers after English cities, London, Canterbury, Marlborough, and Cambridge. At the Santa Cruz County Courthouse, Reader assembled around 50 documents, half of which were copied a second time as a negative in an effort to read the difficult handwriting. So in the 75 documents, we learn that during Nelson's life and shortly after his death, 
all documents referred to him as London Nelson, as we can see in the upper half of this uh, sampling. Yet probate did not close until 1875, 15 years after his death, by which time most who knew him were gone or had forgotten. Thus, the written record became all the more important, yet poor penmanship can be read as either London or Loudon, and clerks definitely started to spell it Loudon. Next slide, please. One of the probate documents was written by Dr. William Slocum, clerk of the probate court and editor of the Santa Cruz News. And he included a clipping of the newspaper probate notice, which easily shows it is referring to the estate of London Nelson. Next slide. This wasn't the only time that poor penmanship had changed his name. Here we see his handwritten name has also been interpreted as Shannon Nelson on a mining document, London Nielsen on a deed, Lyndon Nelson in one Sentinel article, and Ludlow Wilson in one Surf article. So with this wide variation of interpretation for his name, how can we be sure his real name is London? Next slide. This survey of sources shows all newspaper articles in 1860 and 1861 refer to him as London when they give his first name at all. This corroborates the handwritten documents. Yet after probate closed in 1875, the poor penmanship evolved into deliberately spelling his name Loudon, upon which the inscription of his tombstone was finally based when it was erected in 1876. Yet even with Mission Hill students honoring his legacy and tending a grave that once read, that read Loudon, teachers and historians continued to insist that his real name was London. These include historian Leon Rowland in Articles and Books, and Margaret Koch in Santa Cruz County Parade of the Past called him London Nelson, also known as Loudon Nelson. Next slide. Our group determined that his last will and testament was the closest thing to the man himself confirming his name was London Nelson. I'll turn it back to Rachel now. Thank you, Ross. And I, I just wanted to note here as well that um, even in the markers um, that we have currently that honor Mr. Nelson, there is, although, for example, the Loudon Nelson Community Center sign, it is still Loudon Nelson Community Center is, uh, representing the um, question and, and that his name was actually London Nelson on the sign itself. There's a small notation that says, in memory of London Nelson, 1800 to 1860. This, this is also um, at Evergreen Cemetery. It is noted where you see on the gravestone marker, it is Loudon Nelson, but in 2006, a placard was um, added in front of the gravestone in which in parentheses, the, the writing is so small, I had to zoom in here, but you can see it's Loudon, parentheses, London, Nelson. There's no explanation provided here um, on why the two names, but it was notated because we know there's this um, question. And then as far as the other places that uh, he is honored, there's a plaque at the City School Administration Building um, this monument where at the top it says in honor of Loudon Nelson, 1800 to 1860, an ex-slave who left his estate to Santa Cruz schools. He believed in education for all people. And this, it, we understand, is the site too of the Loudon Nelson Plaza, although there's no sign notating that it's Loudon Nelson Plaza. In one of the uh, historical documents I read, that is included in your packet. It states that there was a sign, but it was burned by a fire. And then just so to orient yourselves, um, 
This is the Mission Hill School in 1972 on the property that where now the city school administration offices um, lie. And you can see the, um, the wall, the rock wall, is really consistent in between both photos. Um, as referenced earlier, in 1984, a group named Friends of Loudon Nelson did advocate for the changing of the name of the Loudon Nelson Community Center and Loudon Nelson Plaza to London Nelson, citing historical documentation that Mr. Nelson's name was London and not Loudon. And according to a Santa Cruz Sentinel article dated November 14, 1984, Santa Cruz school trustees agreed to change the name of Loudon Nelson Plaza to London Nelson Plaza, but only if, city, if um, the city and county changed the name of the Loudon Nelson Community Center first. At that time, the center was jointly run by the city and the county. In December 1984, um, a proposal was brought before Santa Cruz City Council by the group to rename the community center. Members of the black community who had fought for the plaza and the center to be named after Mr. Nelson were opposed to the renaming. A Santa Cruz Sentinel newspaper article cited sentiment that local researchers and historians were not on hand when the work of naming the center was being done by black leaders and community activists in the 70s. Also, he was known among the black community as Loudon Nelson. And due to this opposition at the time, the city council unanimously voted to keep the name Loudon Nelson Community Center. The current project uh, team that's been working on this felt it important to attempt to contact people from that time to engage them in conversation. Um, at the second project team meeting, Ida Johnson attended to provide feedback as someone involved with the discussions at the time and familiar with the opposition. Ida expressed the importance of making a decision based on solid historical evidence. She was the only community member from the, the only community member the group was able to identify that was living from that time that it came before city council in 1984. And then finally, in taking up this question, um, once again, you know, members of the current project team reviewed many documents including included in the agenda packet and the ones showed by Ross Gibson. And based on this ev evidence, consensus was reached by the project team that Mr. Nelson's name was London Nelson. And therefore, the project team is bringing forth to you today, we're asking for the, that the Santa Cruz City Council endorse the community's efforts to explore renaming locations and landmarks honoring Loudon Nelson to London Nelson and pursue a more accurate depiction of the history of Mr. Nelson and explore further education efforts on his contributions to Santa Cruz. That the City Council directs the Historic Preservation Commission to place an item on the May 19th agenda to discuss the name correction and bring back a recommendation for City Council to consider. And just to note, in terms of the City's health and all policies, this item supports uh, strongly the health and all policies pillar of equity. As we strive for historical accuracy of Mr. Nelson's achievements, we emphasize the importance of community connectedness, diverse representation and cultural life, and a sense of belonging. And so that concludes our presentation today, and we are happy to answer any questions uh, from city council members at this time. Thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you to the members of the project team and to council member Cummings for bringing this forward. Um, I will go ahead and um, open this up for uh, questions from, from council members at this time. I am not seeing any council members with questions. Uh, so I'll go ahead and take this out to public comment. So for anyone, for members of the audience who are interested in uh, discussing item number 30, uh, 
explored renaming locations and landmarks from, from Loudon Nelson to London Nelson and accurate honoring, accurately honoring and depicting the history of Mr. Nelson, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. And I am not seeing any members of the public at this point raising their hands, so I will bring it back uh, for council deliberation. Um, and again, this is a would this recommendation here is to endorse the community's effort to explore renaming locations and landmarks honoring Loudon Nelson to London Nelson and pursue a more accurate depiction of the history of Mr. Nelson and explore further education efforts on his contributions to Santa Cruz and two, to direct staff to the, to the Historic Preservation Commission to place an item on the May 19th agenda to discuss the name correction and bring back a recommendation for the City Council to consider. I see uh, Council Member Watkins. Yes, thank you. I just wanna thank the committee members and um, everyone for their time and, and just the really thoughtful presentation as well as agenda report. It was like kind of a, a trip down, you know, just a complicated history. And, um, and I also really want to thank you and acknowledge just the importance of uh, having an accurate uh, reflection of an individual who's had such a huge impact on our city. And it deserves that due diligence to have that come forward in a way that's been informed by the community as well as history. And so um, with a sincere appreciation, I'm happy to move the recommendation as um, presented in the agenda packet um, and, uh, and offer my sincere uh, gratitude for your efforts and work on this. Thank you, council member. I have, council, uh, excuse me, Vice Mayor Bruner is up next. Uh, I will second. And I would like to say that I really appreciate the work the group uh, did in over the past year with the meetings and um, the agenda report was a step in time, including copies of microfilms and it was very, a uh, wonderful part of the agenda to dive into and read and thank you for that information and for bringing in the community as well as the history of uh, Mr. Nelson, Mr. London Nelson, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. We have a motion on the floor. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, take additional comments from uh, council members. Council member Collintari Johnson, please. Yes, thank you. I'd like to echo the sentiments of my colleagues. Thank you for the whole team and council member coming for bringing this forward. I just wanted to note um, a letter that we got um, from from uh, two educators at Shoreline Middle School that was so touching of the assignment that they um, engaged their students with. Um, and they uh, wanted to further engage, at least these two teachers from Shoreline wanted to further engage. So as we explore further education opportunities, um, perhaps we can take up their offer and engage our middle schools beyond Shoreline um, to see what's possible. Thank you. Great. Council Member Golder, please. This is something I've been really excited that's been coming forward and I wanna thank all the work that the group did and thank you to Brittany too for bringing that petition forward and getting the community's attention on this issue. So thank you, everybody. Council Member Brown. I just wanted to add my gratitude to all of you who have worked on this, Ross, Eric Gibson, for sharing and you know making the story accessible to us, and um, and really, really, um, you know, following the the. Um, the, the efforts that have been made over time and you know kind of how this all fits into the current moment and um, I want to thank Ms. Bay and um, uh, Ms. London um, Porter, London Porter, is that right? Um, <laughs> for, uh, for bringing this to our attention. I just think this is an example of uh, you know an, an effort that where community gets involved and we work together and you know find a way to you know make really positive things happen and I think attention to the the really really critical and you know amazingly positive role that this um, you know former enslaved 
formerly enslaved African uh, um, made to our community. Uh, it, it's just wonderful to, to see this um, happening now in this way. And um, thank you again for all of your efforts and thanks to the staff and to Council Member Cummings for following through and you know working with the group on this. Council Member Cummings. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to thank uh, the community members, in particular Brittany, for starting that petition and then for engaging with our city staff. And for I, I know there were a number of council, council meetings last year with everything that was going on. She had mentioned during oral communications uh, the work that she had been doing, and it was just really you know great to see this come forward. Um, and I, you know these meetings sometimes went on longer than they were supposed to and we'd be having two hour long conversations really kind of going back and forth over you know understanding the history and it was a really great experience to see how we were able to identify you know what what is proof and you know what should be considered and how you know how we could put, fit the story back together and i know uh, luna worked a lot with Ross and with uh, Jesse Bond going over, and Seth going over, you know, documents where they had to pull out binders and dust, knock the dust off and 75 different documents and kind of, you know, seeing when certain um, signatures were written and what documents made the most sense to reference. And so it was really, you know, a big uh, effort and m much of which was volunteer. And so I just really want to commend you all on, um, a wonderful effort to pull this all together, and I'm glad that uh, you all allowed me to be a part of it. Yeah, and I'll just um, close comments. Um, it's just, uh, it's so meaningful to honor this person with his real name, you know, and really, really just set history right and, um, and be able to teach people about how easy it is for someone's history to be changed because of someone's handwriting or, um, you know, interpretation by someone sitting at a desk, um, whatever that may be, whatever bias they may have had. Um, I think it's just, uh, it's such a cautionary tale of how quickly you can rewrite someone's re real being um, because the one thing we all have is a name. And um, so I think you guys have, um, done more than just sort of rename or, uh, you know, think about this as just, uh, you know, renaming a community center or what have you. Um, I hope that you have restored his dignity by giving back his real name. So in your, your, your work has done more than just uh, the immediate sort of impact and nomenclature in our town. It's really an honor to him um, and, and really who he was. So thank you, Luna and Brittany and Justin and, Ross um, and Rachel, all of you. Um, it's a very, very monumental thing and, and really, um, so thank you for all your work. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to um, move the staff recommendation, which is to endorse the community's effort to explore renaming locations and landmarks, honoring Mr. Nelson, Mr. London Nelson and pursue a more accurate description of the history of Mr. Nelson and explore further education efforts on his contributions to Santa Cruz and also direct staff to the Historic Preservation Commission to place an item on the May 19th agenda to discuss the name correction and bring back a recommendation for the City Council to consider. So we have a motion on the floor to do that and I will ask for a roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Watkins. Aye. Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Brown. Aye. And I just want to give one more shout out to Bruce Bratton, who first taught me about this history and has been working <laughs> to rename uh, the center for a long time. So I enthusiastically. Thank you. Cummings. Aye. <clears throat> Golder. You're muted, Renee. That's so weird. That's the second time I unmute you didn't hear me. Aye. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Thank you. Vice Mayor Bruner. Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. So we'll look forward to having this come back for a final vote and a final name change. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you all. Okay. Well, that looks cool. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, 
Uh, next up is item number 31 on our agenda. This is the 2021 peak season water supply assessment. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. I'm gonna turn this over to Ben Pink. Uh, he's an environmental projects analyst with our water department. Welcome, Ben. Hi, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, good day to all of you council members and mayor. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, can everybody see this? Okay. Um, thank you very much. I'm gonna, um, this is gonna be a very different kind of presentation than the one that you, were, you just had. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the uh, water supply outlook for water year 2021. Um, this is a relatively brief presentation, but uh, this is the agenda. I'm gonna go over um, a little bit about the uh, a description of our water supply outlook and the model that we use and the timing of our forecast. Um, I'm gonna cover uh, a bunch of slides that talk about the, the review of this year's water conditions, um, which will get us to a staff recommendation and uh, hopefully have time for questions and discussion at the end. So um, I'm coming to you now uh, in uh, April, which is um, marks basically the end of our wet season and it's the, the point in time where we evaluate our water supply. Uh, the end of March is typically the end of the wet season. And uh, as we go into April, uh, April is kind of a transition month. Um, we can still get, uh, possibility of rain in April, but um, as of right now, there's really no rain in the forecast. So we can be um, fairly confident about our, um, you know, what we have, uh, what we've accumulated so far in terms of uh, water storage and what, what the outlook is gonna be. Um, so we're essentially talking about um, the peak season um, what's gonna happen uh, over the peak season, May through the end of October, and wh what we'll be left with uh, by, the, by the end of uh, that peak season at, at the end of the water year, at, at the end of uh, September. So in our water supply outlook uh, process, we monitor and evaluate uh, these items here, um, rainfall, uh, San Lorenzo River flow, uh, reservoir storage, and that is um, at our primary uh, storage location of Loch Lomond Reservoir. And we monitor the cumulative runoff on the San Lorenzo River, which uh, produces a water year classification. And I can tell you uh, right now, I'll get to this a little bit more later, but we're in the critically dry water year classification. Um, so we have a, a water supply outlook model that takes into account those factors I just described as well as uh, customer demand. So how much water our customers are using, as well as uh, the hydrologic conditions in, our, in the San Lorenzo River and North Coast streams relative to fish flows. And that has to do with the commitments that we've made to provide water, a certain amount of water for the environment and for, for fish species. And we also uh, incorporate the availability of other uh, surface water and groundwater supplies. So I'm gonna start going into a review of the water year conditions to date. 
Um, in terms of uh, cumulative rainfall, uh, when I put this graph together uh, in late March, we were at uh, just over 16 inches. Um, and you can see how that compares to uh, previous water year, as well as the long-term average. Um, you know, by the end of a typical of the of the water year for the long-term average, we normally are at um, around 31 inches, and uh, thus far we've received uh, you know a little over 16. That gives you a picture of uh, rainfall. Moving on to uh, monthly stream flow, uh, this is uh, a measure of um, the stream flow in cubic feet per second measured at big trees on the San Lorenzo River. And the blue, the dark blue bars are the, the long-term average and the uh, lighter blue bars are the current water year. Um, so you can see uh, just how low, um, relatively speaking, our uh, river has been running this year. And then when you um, sum up the overall discharge on the San Lorenzo River, and you measure that in acre feet, um, this is the water year classification system I was talking about. And so what this chart shows is again, the long-term average, which is this um, uh, blue, blue here. It also shows um, a really wet year, which was 2019. It shows our current water year, which is down here. Um, and when, as of uh, April 1st, we were at a little over 11,000 acre feet. And then the, the purple um, down here is water year 2014. And if you recall, um, water year 2014 was also critically dry. That was the last time we were in a really serious drought condition. So what you can see on this graph is that we're tracking um, very much uh, on par with 2014. We'll probably uh, end the water year at the end of September uh, somewhat higher than 2014, but still well within the critically dry category. And then, um, this is really one of the most uh, important outputs of the water supply uh, model that I was talking about. So with the model, we, we, we put together all of that information and we come up with a projection of where the reservoir will be at the end of the peak season. Um, we started, um, we start the model, um, uh, when I did the modeling with uh, about 71% uh, of capacity. And by the end of the water year, we're projected to draw down uh, the lake to approximately 58%. Um, that still represents a, a healthy amount of water. It's, it's a, it represents uh, approximately 1.6 billion gallons worth but uh, drawing down the reservoir that much is something that um, starts to make us nervous. And it starts to make us think, think about, well, what happens if the next water year is also dry? I'm gonna show you a couple of slides now just to show you uh, some things that are going on in a larger context. Um, both in terms of uh, pr uh, projection of, of temperature over the next three months and also uh, conditions from the drought monitor page. Um, so this, this slide is a three month temperature outlook uh, produced by NOAA. And it essentially shows you the probability of normal 
or below average or above average temperatures for the next three months. And the, the orange to red colors mean that there's a higher probability of above average temperatures. And it's pretty much for all of the continental United States, including uh, California. So that's just saying uh, there's a greater uh, than likely uh, probability that um, temperatures will be above normal for the next three months. And this was produced um, in mid-March. Um, you might be familiar with uh, the drought monitor. This is a um, university-related website that um, monitors drought conditions throughout the United States. And this was just um, updated uh, a week or so ago. And the update uh, moved um, parts of Central California, including uh, Santa Cruz, into the moderate uh, drought category. So this just shows you um, that we're not alone in terms of the dry conditions. Uh, many areas across California are experiencing uh, some severity of drought and other cities are also you know, talking about different uh, possibilities of drought restrictions. Which brings me to um, our staff recommendation, which is um, essentially based on the, dry, the, the very dry conditions that we've had um, over this water year and with a, with a very healthy amount of concern and uh, caution about what might happen for the next water year, uh, we're rec staff is recommending that we implement uh, stage one of the newly updated water shortage contingency plan, which uh, the council uh, saw recently. Um, stage one is a targeted 10% reduction in demand, which represents uh, 136 million gallons, uh, a, a 136 million gallon uh, reduction over the entire peak season. And again, that is, uh, in order to conserve water in the event that water year 2022 is also dry. Um, I did not uh, put any slides in here that describe kind of our implementation and what a stage one really means for customers, but I'm happy to uh, go into that if you like. Um, and that brings me to the end of my presentation and I'd be happy to entertain questions. Thank you, Ben. Um, pretty sobering uh, situation we're in right now. Um, so thank you for that and for the um, information that you were provided in the context of um, not only the decision we need to make today, but kind of the cautionary tale of what may be ahead in the next couple of years. So I will go ahead and open this up for council questions. Uh, and I see uh, Vice Mayor Bruner and Council Member Cummings in that order. Thank you, and thank you for that presentation. Uh, my question, uh, if you could actually talk a little bit about the stage one water shortage. Uh, my understanding is, for example, there's uh, not the same uh, penalty assessments as associated with stage two, um, and, and just what that stage one will involve and again, I think the staff recommendation was for a five month period, uh, May through October. So what that would mean in our peak season. Okay, so um, yeah, so our, our, our peak season uh, goes from uh, beginning of May uh, to the end of October. So if we do in fact uh, declare the shortage, uh, the um, the plan would kick in for that period of time and, and any restrictions that are in the plan would cover that period of time. Um, so based on the, the updated water shortage contingency plan, uh, a stage one means um, under our new system of, of customer allotments, 
um, every residential water customer would give would be given a lot an allotment of 500 cubic feet five CCF and under stage one that is essentially an advisory allotment and there are no um, excess use penalties for going over that allotment however um, our messaging and what we're asking of the community what we're asking of the community is that um, everyone stick to those allotments because that is really our our way of conserving water and meeting those reduction goals that are in the plan i'm happy to elaborate a little more if you'd like Yeah, I, and again, I think um, this may have come up in my discussion uh, with Rosemary, um, the allotment of 5 CCF to water customers and, um, you know, is it by household, by meter, right? That detail, right. I think, is important to know. Right, so it's, it's, uh, it's by dwelling unit. Basically, so if you're living in a triplex, for example, the allotment would be 15. Um, if you have more than three people per household, you can, uh, you know, you can make a requisition, if you will, for additional uh, water. So that's a, a provision that we're, you know, working on getting in place so that those with um, with larger households can get additional allocations. Uh, it does apply to across the board. There's, you know, different ways of working with different customer groups uh, based on what their needs are and some of the characteristics of the use patterns and the, you know, businesses versus residential. Uh, there also is a, quite a bit of a, uh, you know, information that's going to be made available to help the customers take a look at their own individual use, uh, kind of a water audit strategy for their household as well as you know, various strategies for looking at how that water, you know, how they could make reductions um, in the easiest way for them. There will be no prohibitions except for water waste, which is always prohibited so that people couldn't use it if they want to water their outdoor, you know, areas instead of, you know, doing laundry, that's up to them. And what is the allocation for hotels? It's based on a 10% reduction off of their base year use, which I think in this case would be the last year for that we didn't have restrictions in place, which would be 2019. So uh, in a lot of cases, the businesses will, uh, you know, have to actually significantly increase their use from 2020 because of the COVID restraints. Um, and we would expect that there to be some kind of gradual increase in business use on the re based on reopening, and that's really being provided for. We're not terribly worried that businesses are going to, you know, all of a sudden go way off the charts because I think there will be a kind of a gradual re reopening there. But it's 10% really across the board. It's applied in a different situation for different kinds of customers, but basically it's kind of a that's a strategy. Re uh, irrigation, to the extent that irrigation is happening, whether it's uh, separate irrigation customers or, you know, people using, uh, well, it's mainly irrigation customers will be getting a 25% reduction. And so we'll be working because that's the least valuable of all of the uses. It's not to say it's not valuable, but it's in terms of the priority pecking order, health and safety and economic uh, strategy are the more the things we prioritize high, more highly. Thank you so much. Council member coming. Thank you, Mayor. Most of my questions were answered. I guess I just have, um, and I should restate that most of my questions were the same as uh, what Council Member Burner, Vice Mayor Burner had. So most of my questions were answered. Um, but I did have one question around um, communication. So should people expect to receive a mailer or will the information just be posted on the city's website? Um, how, how is this gonna be communicated? Yeah, go ahead, Ben. 
Okay, yeah, um, I think that's a really good question. And there's gonna be a series of different uh, communication strategies. Um, yes, for sure, there will be um, additional web pages specifically devoted to uh, describing the allotments and the plan for different customer classes. And those are being developed now. And there will also be a general um, customer letter going out to all accounts basically describing what the allotment is and what we're doing. Um, and then there will be some more general communications uh, coming from the, the water department in terms of social media and in our newsletter and things like that. Great, thank you. I have Vice Mayor uh, Bruner. I had a follow-up question on the communications and uh, um, I'm glad you brought up social media and other options because many renters don't ever see a water bill. It's included in the rent and um, so that, um, you know, there, there are as many ways of reaching customers as possible. Yeah, I agree. I have Council Member Kalantari Johnson next. Thank you, and thanks for this presentation. Just um, to um, pull that thread of the communications um, that was just brought up, um, I'm wondering if you can comment on how we will ensure cultural responsivity for our um, Spanish-speaking community members and how we will outreach to them. I had similar questions on the next item. Just. What, what will we do to ensure that um, our information is being communicated, not only in Spanish, but in a culturally responsive manner? Thank you. So I just wanted to mention one of the things we've been working on since we sort of changed the structure of the restriction policy to this is how much you get and you can kind of use it however you want. We do have lots of resources for our customers to, you know, look at how they're using water and to make decisions. And the, so we've created a product that's going to get posted on our website and that product has been uh, translated into Spanish or is not right now in the process of being translated into Spanish. We also have a number of folks in our customer service group who are fluent in Spanish and can interact with customers in that language in the event that people call in with questions. And we will definitely be, you know, making sure that additional language uh, uh, translations and for materials and outreach will be uh, happening to those, those populations. Can I add one more thing? Sure. Um, we have a um, software platform called WaterSmart, which we're also going to be doing quite a bit of outreach on, which is a, um, a customer portal where uh, uh, account holders and others who they assign can log in to see their, their water usage and there will be some uh, targeted information based on households' profile of what style house they have, lot size, occupancy, things like that. So they'll get some targeted conservation messages as well as being able to see their water usage and their allotment. So that's something that is gonna be a really uh, helpful tool this time around uh, to manage water use and we'll be um, doing a fair amount of outreach to get people to go to that site and sign up. There's no other council member with council members with questions. I see Vice Mayor Bruner. Just one quick follow-up to Ben. Oftentimes renters do not see that information. It doesn't trickle down. So just keeping that in mind as well. Thank you. Um, one, one of the things that we do with the SHMU review, which some of you are familiar with, is that goes to the property as well as to the account holders. So I think there, I know, because I've just seen the draft of the text for the, the most, you know, the next one that's coming, it's going to be time to go to properties in the, um, in this window when this is ramping up. So uh, that will definitely be a big method to, you know, provide information and links to where people can go for more information. Um, I had a question uh, either for Ben or Rosemary. Um, 
what does next winter look like then as we move forward? So, um, you know, this winter, obviously, we got all the way to March before we really, I mean, we had, I think, the one storm, two-day storm in January. Um, so we are, if we go into this, the, ten percent, the stage one, the warning, the shortage, uh, water shortage warning, when, when, what, what, what would you be looking for to let the council know sort of that next leap in stage, whether that's yeah. two and, and maybe if the, for the public to know that, you know, you could te technically potentially um, on conditions even skip stages, I would assume. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, maybe just, maybe just describe that a little bit for, for the public that might be listening. So, so I do want to just make a couple of comments about how we choose stages. It's not, uh, you know, must start at one, has to go to two. It's what the right stage is relative to the, to the situation. In 2014, the recommendation to council came in February, not in April, to go to stage three from, there wasn't even a, a restriction stage on in 2013, I don't believe. And so it was, it's based on the analysis that we do looking at, you know, how much is in storage. Uh, we do a look, do a first look at the end of, uh, typically at the end of January and present that at the Water Commission in early February. So we're monitoring through the, you know, historically the December, January, February have been where the, the bulk of the rain has come. Uh, not so much these days, it's kind of a little bit more spotty, but we'll definitely be monitoring. And in the event that we see another dry year coming through, then we will be, uh, you know, we'll be doing the same kind of analysis. We'll potentially be doing it and making a recommendation to the council earlier in the event that that's the thing that needs to happen. We're also doing a lot of additional analysis right now, looking at our our data sets and our um, sort of analytical resources that we can see if we can create correlations between, you know, what we're seeing in reservoir levels and what we might be seeing at the end of the particular water year. We're, um, we're looking hard at how the sort of carryover storage that we like to keep in Loch Lomond year over year uh, for that next bad year is, you know, should be changed based on what's, how our demand characteristics have changed. We're, uh, we have a lot lower total system demand now, and the, the sort of billion gallon carryover storage goal was established when the demand was about almost, you know, 40% higher than it is now. So is that a different, is that a different thing we ought to be doing? So there's a lot going on to really help us figure out, you know, what's the, what do we need to be looking at? Uh, how bad a year do we need to uh, care about? And one interesting thing is that, the years uh, 87, 88, 89, 90, which were four critically dry years in a row, they were all over 20,000 acre feet. They weren't, um, and those don't crash the system these days because demand is so much different from what it was in those years. So we're, we're slicing and dicing and pulling the data apart, really trying to understand what are the characteristics of a, the critically dry years that we really, really, you know, have to care about? A year like 77, the, the 76 and 2014, those are years that are really definitely in the you have to care about these. Uh, we're, we're looking at, you know, where those triggers are in some of the other years where we're still in critically dry, but maybe not in that kind of really big emergency place. That's helpful. Yeah, I've, I've read, you know, kind of this this concept of sort of we're in a kind of a, you know, kind of a longer term drought that may yeah. have these these little bit of peaks and valleys, you know, as you know, a mega drought, you know, that's been sort of documented in history of California and things like that. Yeah. I just I and and I think about it because, you know. It would be good for maybe in our communications, you know, and I'm not a communications expert, but. You know, people make decisions, for example, residents and homeowners who, you know, may go out and, you know, buy everything to start a big garden or something, you know, I mean, I just yeah. think, you know, really under letting people know, like, we're not going to sort of walk through this. We may jump from one to four or one to three and that, you know, the acknowledgement of really this, what I think is basically, you know, obviously climate change is here. Um, and yeah. so we 
you know, being able to, you know, just proactively really put that in that context of what people kind of how people need to think about water moving ahead is, is really helpful, I think, for, for folks. So they, they're just thoughtful of that. And it's easy to do because there's no rain coming out of the sky. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, that was my only question and, and comment. Um, I'll go ahead and turn this back um, to uh, the public and uh, unless there's any other questions from council members at this time. Okay, thank you, Ben and Rosemary. It was great, great uh, and sobering uh, presentation. I um, will go ahead and turn this back to, um, or turn this over to any uh, public members who have joined us today. If you are interested in commenting on this item number 31, the 2021 peak season water supply assessment, please, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand at this time. And I am not seeing any members of the public, so I will go ahead and turn this back to city council. And this um, is a motion to uh, approve a resolution declaring a stage one water shortage warning. And I see Vice Mayor Bruner. I wanted to say I'm happy to move a motion um, declaring a stage one water shortage warning and wanted to uh, just comment that, you know, um, I think this will really send a message that um, we, we can reduce and preserve our Loch Lomond reserves and um, really work as a community to be careful with our water water supply. Thank you for your presentation and all your work. Thank you. And I have member, uh, council member Colin Tart Johnson. Thank you. Yeah, I can second that motion and just wanted to acknowledge all the work, the thoughtful work that went into this and the forward thinking so that we can um, avoid the crisis as much as possible. Thank you. Great. So I have a motion uh, by Vice Mayor Bruner, seconded by Council Member Colontari Johnson to approve um, uh, a resolution declaring a stage one water shortage warning. And could I have a roll call vote, please? Mm -hmm. Council Members Watkins? Aye. Colontari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cumming? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion uh, passes unanimously. So we'll now go on to item number 32 and Rosemary Menard, our water director, will give us that presentation. Item number 32 is amendments to Municipal Code Chapter 1601 to align city code language with recently council adopted 2021 interim water shortage contingency plan. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. So Rosemary, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you, Mayor Myers and um, council members. Uh, I just, I don't have a, a formalized presentation. This is a, a, a piece of business that follows on the action that you took at the end of uh, February where you approved the change to the water search contingency plan. The structure of the new plan is quite different from the old plan and there were major elements of the old plan that were codified in the municipal code. And what we've done this go around is we've stripped out all of that old language that isn't relevant anymore. We've replaced uh, a major sections of the, that, sec that, that content with a reference to an adoption a, a formally adopted plan that the council would make and, and the state board does require a formal action for you to, um, the State Water Resources Control Board requires a formal action for you to adopt a water shortage 
contingency plan that includes notification and what have you. And then we've retained in the doc, in the municipal code, the in administrative enforcement, penalty structures, the uh, water um, waste prohibitions and the reference, uh, the re those kinds of references, appeals and exceptions in the muni code, but have taken out all the sort of details. So the action before you today is really a twofold thing. One of them is to approve the uh, changes we've proposed to the Muni Code as an emergency ordinance, because if we're going to implement the stage one uh, water shortage warning, we need to have those things in place uh, basically starting tomorrow. And then the second part is to go ahead and introduce it as a first reading for the normal procedure, which would bring it back for a second reading at your next meeting. And then there would be a 30 day window where, you know, before it takes effect. So um, the city attorney advised us that this strategy was a good approach that gave us the tools that we need immediately uh, to, you know, with these changes and then would also formalize uh, the actual action on the, the longer term changes. Um, and that's really the action before you today. Thank you, Rosemary. I will look to see if there's any questions from council on this. I'm not seeing any hands. I'll go ahead and put this out to the public to see if there's any questions from the public. If you are interested in commenting on amendments to Municipal Code Chapter 1601 to align city code language with the recently council adopted 2021 interim water shortage contingency plan, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand at this time. And I am not seeing any hands over on that side. Uh, so I uh, would look for a motion, Council Member Brown. I'll go ahead and, and move the uh, adoption of an emergency ordinance uh, revising Muni Code Chapter 16.01 uh, as written in the staff report and to also introduce, introduce for publication an ordinance revising uh, the Muni, same Muni Code chapter um, for a first reading. Thank you, Council Member and Council Member Golder. I'll second that. Great. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to adopt an emergency ordinance revising Municipal Code Chapter 1601 to align it with the provisions of the 2021 Interim Water Shortage Contingency Plan and to direct staff to introduce for publication um, that ordinance uh, as its first reading. Uh, I will ask for a roll call vote. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, we'll move on to um, our agenda items number 33, 34, 35, and 36, which is development charges and fees. Um, we are going to sort of treat these sort of as a group, I believe, and I wanna clarify with um, the clerk when we are voting on these, I'm assuming we'll have to take a vote on each one indiv individually, but could you clarify that for me? Yeah, I, I believe the intent is to have one presentation, um, sort of an umbrella presentation over all of them. Um, and then you would do public comment on all of them at one time, and we would have to do separate votes due to the separate recommendation. recommendation. Mm -hmm. Great, that's why I just wanted to make sure it was clear to the public yeah. that that's what we would do based on the, um, based on the presentation. So this again is items number 33 through 36. We will have one uh, group presentation. Um, and if you are interested in commenting on this item, uh, when the time is right, you will receive, I will announce that we will be going to public comment and um, I'll announce um, additional direction then when you're, uh, if you would like to uh, comment on this. 
Uh, what we'll do first is have the presentation by the staff and then we'll have questions from council and then I will turn it out to public comment. So I have a list here of presenters being Rosemary Menard, our water director, Steve Wolfman, Wolfman Associate Civil Engineer from Public Works, and Sarah DeLeon, uh, Principal Management Analyst with our Planning Department. Welcome, you guys. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. So I'll be controlling the slideshow for everybody today. We are talking about development fees, and thank you, Mayor, for the introduction. Um, we are all here, Rosemary, Steve, and myself. Um, Rosemary is going to be covering the system development charges. Steve will cover the sewer connection fee. And then I'll go over the child care and public safety impact fee and kind of start our intro and wrap it up towards the end. So an agenda at a glance here, we do have four items. So we wanted to make it ultra clear to you of how we'll go through this today. Um, essentially, the ask is for revision of two existing fees. That's the system development charges and the sewer connection fee. And we'll be considering the adoption of fee rates for child care and the public safety impact fee. You may recall back in 2019, the ordinance for the child care impact fee was adopted, but an implementing resolution never was. So we have those rates for you today for your consideration as well. Um, for the benefit of, of the public, we're going to go over a bit of what, you know, fees, 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 all these different fee types, what is an impact fee, what is a service fee, why we're updating and changing them and adding new ones. And then go into some of the specific methodologies for each individual fee, items 33 through 36. Um, and then towards the end, I'll wrap it up with some projects, some models, so to speak, for you to see what these increases and decreases mean if you were looking at it from a project level. So first, a bunch of fees. You guys might be familiar with lots of fee names, different taxes, assessments, property tax, sales tax, different types of development fees, dedication in lieu fees, all sorts of things. The ones we're talking about today are specific to impact fees, a type of development fee, and a service fee. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more here in a second. So an impact fee is a one-time charge on new development. Um, the revenues that we generate from impact fees have to be spent on very specific things, capital, um, such as facilities, equipment, um, apparatuses, and vehicles. Impact fees are very special in the sense that when you're creating or establishing an impact fee and when for the long run maintenance of an impact fee, there's very specific state requirements that you have to follow. Um, in regards to the long term maintenance of it, there's annual and five year reporting, which is quite different from some of our other fee types. Um, and additionally, there's often a nexus study involved that has helped establish a relationship between the fee between the fee being charged and what it's providing. Um, and you'll see that for our public safety child care and the system charges fees. Um, I want to say that impact fees are definitely not new. Um, back in the 70s when Prop 13 happened, you would see a very large shift to impact fees. Those were called first generation impact fees back then. When the local agencies lost a lot of the funding sources due to Prop 13, they started to rely on impact fees a lot more. Um, now we're in the second generation, so to speak, of impact fees. And it's those second generation impact fees that require these nexus studies making sure that charges have a relationship and they're proportionate to the development and the impact of that development happening. Um, so just a little bit of history there. It's a very um, common in feed these days and, and uh, one we'll, we'll see quite often. A service fee has many names as well. Um, a user fee, connection fees, fees for service. Um, this will kind of help our conversation later as well. When someone is applying for a building permit, for example, we consider the fees associated with that fees for service. Um, the cost of these types of fees cannot exceed the services rendered. So a lot of the time the calculations for the studies relate to time studies or otherwise. Um, we'll talk about this for the sewer connection fee and then later on when I show you some project examples, uh, the service fee is what we'll be looking at as well. So why the new fees? Why the revision to fees? Uh, very simply put, it's about long-term fiscal sustainability, specifically to capital costs for future and the growth that's coming and, and impacting um, the need for, for facilities. As well, I think that revenue diversity is important. Listed here are a number of the types of fees that we've been somewhat discussing. 
um, this column here, number two, you'll see that impact fees fall here, as well as our user fees and connections. We have already, you know, all these fees together play a role in providing local government services, operations, and facilities. Um, and I think it's important that we are updating and making sure that the prongs of the stool, so to speak, of all those fee types are diverse, and we're looking at the impacts of future growth as, a we as well as ongoing operations. The revisions to fees are important just to make sure that our models are sound, that they're equitable, that as things change, as needs and the environment change, as we start growing facilities, our models are being adjusted to reflect what's already done or perhaps new plans for the future um, that the council's determined the needs might be. So with that, we're gonna jump into part two and start going through the different fee methodologies. Rosemary, let me know when you want me to move on. Okay, I guess you can move on. Okay. So the water department has what's called the system development uh, charge in place. It's had one for a long time. It's also called a connection fee. It's basically something that we uh, updated in 20, uh, 2004. We updated again in 2015. And at that point, there was a, a direction to update that on a kind of a five-year basis going forward. Uh, we do an analysis typically involving uh, use of a consultant that uh, takes a look at our whole sort of system and tries to make some decisions about how to structure the fee analysis. What's, what you see here is that there are multiple ways that you can do this. There's, and, and to some degree, the choice of which way you do it is based on what your, what your needs are. For example, if you have a lot of capacity issues in your system, if you're in an area that's growing very quickly and you're gonna have to upsize pipelines because you can't move this much water from here over this part of town to that part of town where it's needed, that's a capacity issue. And sometimes you'll change the way that people, uh, you de develop the fees to specifically address that kind of problem. Um, you, you can also uh, do what, what we did, which is uh, shown in this blue box, uh, which has to do with, uh, it's a buy-in. So most of the people who are paying uh, rates or have developed things in the past have bought into the system. They've invested in the system. And new development coming in should pay their fair share. So the equity buy-in strategy is the strategy that we use. And specifically, the one that we used, and I think you can go to the next slide um, uh, for this, uh, is we made a decision to look at replacement cost minus dep depreciation. And the reason that we did that is because many of our facilities are older, it, it, but even though they have uh, long lives, a uh, 50 year replacement cost, for example, or a depreciation schedule is uh, very common for major pipelines or certainly for something like a treatment plant. So if you depreciate the value of your initial investment by 2% a year over 50 years, at the end of the time, your investment's not worth anything. But that doesn't really reflect what the cost is to replace it. And I'll give you one example. The uh, cost of the Grand Hill Water Treatment Plant when it was brought online in 1960 was $1.6 million. Those were the days. If I could only just get a new Graham Hill water treatment plant for 1.6 million, it would already be done. Its, it's price now is you know, like two orders of magnitude higher than that. So uh, one of the things that happens when you fully depreciate your older assets is that if you're doing your system development charge or connection fees, using those, that calculus, it doesn't reflect the real cost of what it's going to take to replace that. So we use a replacement cost, and I think you can go to the next slide, uh, Sarah. We use a replacement cost, which in our case, we've estimated uh, during the work we've done over the last several years at a, almost a billion dollars, 929 million. Uh, we subtract a number of years of our capital costs because that's going to get funded by ratepayers going forward. So that gets subtracted out and uh, also the debt that existed at the time this was done, which is about 32 million. And that gives us a total asset value upon which to base our question of the equity buy-in, how much should people pay to come on to the system at about 410 million. Okay, next slide, please, Sarah. Um, 
the, the way we distribute that cost is really to do uh, something that's called um, equivalent meter units. The capacity of a one inch meter is not, you know, twice of what a five eighth inch meter is, it's like four times. It's because of the amount of flow that can go through that pipe is at a one inch size is substantially more than can go through a five eighth. So the, um, the strategy that we use is based on meter sizing. The meter sizing for a particular facility is based on fixture counts that is done as part of the you know re plan review that we do to decide how big of a meter is needed to serve that particular facility to make sure that there's adequate flow in the system if everybody's using their shower at the same time, for example. And then the other thing that we did in our in our particular process is we um, we eliminated the per multifamily unit or per single room occupancy unit charge that had been used for a long time and just switched over completely to meter size as we would have used in for something like a, a hotel um, example. Okay, do you want to go to the next slide, please? So this, this gives you a sense of how many uh, equivalent meter units we have. And here's the, here's the capacity ratios. Again, you know, this 5 eighths is kind of the standard. It's the most, we obviously have the most of those in the system. But, but you can take the, the sort of total flow that would go to all of these other meter sizes and you get a number that's just 36,773 based on, you know, a, a 10 inch meter doesn't have, you know, has 210 times more capacity than a, and that's how you get to this. Um, we don't have very many of these in the system. This is UCSC basically, but they get that chunk and that's how we do this. One more slide, please. So we take the net asset value of the replacement cost minus the depreciation, and we uh, divide by the total number of, of meter equivalent meter units, and we get the base cost for a, for a single family meter. And if you go one more, I think you'll see what our proposed, our recommended cost structure is uh, using the, the most recent update that we've done. So we're actually recommending uh, decreases in all of the fees uh, and the elimination of the um, of the per meter uh, charges, which also, when you see the examples that Sarah's going to show you at the end, you'll see the impact that that has, particularly on multifamily development. And those things were done specifically to help support the, um, the affordability, uh, the goals that the council has for more housing, more affordable housing. Uh, we've been hearing from our the developers about the concerns related to some of this. And so it's been a way that we've been able to, you know, look at what we need from this particular buy-in, do something that's fair and equitable, but yet reduces the total sort of cost of connection to the water system. Um, I will say that uh, the, the system development charges aren't a very big part of our total annual revenue. They have, they have been, you know, maybe in the one to three million over uh, many years, which when you consider the total amount of revenue that we need to produce to operate the system and do the capital is not a very big part of what, what is getting produced here. But the other thing is that Santa Cruz is largely built out. So the, that fact means that it wouldn't be expected to be a large part of the total revenue. And I think pretty much with that, Sarah, I'm, I'm finished here. So I think this next goes to, to Steve. Happy to take questions along the way, or you know, we can wait to the end. So whichever works. Uh, good afternoon, city council members and members of the public. Uh, my name is Steve Wolfman. I'm the senior civil engineer um, in the public works department. And uh, let's go over a little bit about what the sewer connection fee is all about. So uh, this is a picture of our treatment plant. And, um, and the connection fee is basically uh, joining the wastewater club is like we, is, is how I like to think of it. Um, the monthly fees that have been paid over the years uh, and every year uh, by 
the uh, customers who are already connected to the system uh, paid for the construction of the system. It also pays for the operation of the system, but more importantly, it pays for the construction of the system. You can go to the next slide. And so our treatment plant, uh, using uh, the cost of what it costs to, the cost of what it costs to build the treatment plant, and then we, we, uh, we inflate that cost to today's dollars, we depreciate it. Um, as you may or may not know, our treatment plant is fairly new. Um, it was built in the, uh, mostly in the 90s. Uh, it was obviously, it was built way further uh, back than that in the 20s originally, but we've done major upgrades, um, uh, $60 million projects, $40 million projects, $20 million projects at the treatment plant over the last 30 years. And although we do have major um, improvements uh, that will be coming in the future, uh, the treatment plant, um, those future in, uh, upgrades or improvements will be paid for by the new customers. So we are just uh, looking at what the present uh, worth of the treatment plant is. The next slide is um, goes to the collection system, which is similar. Um, it's a little it's a little harder to gauge what the present worth is, but we do have a fairly good uh, records of the age of the different pipelines. We know what it costs in today's dollars to replace those pipelines, and uh, and then we do uh, depreciate it for uh, the uh, age of the pipeline. And then the next slide. Um, so, in summary, we we calculate what the system is worth today. Uh, and then uh, that gives us, we, we divide that by the use of the system, the capacity of the system, and then we uh, distribute that to any new customers. We, we figure out what the, the, the cost is to build this system per gallon. And then if you're gonna come in and you're gonna be using uh, a portion of that uh, system then that is how we uh, calculate what your buy-in cost is. Uh, similar to the water department, um, the, the cost, uh, the fees that we collect for new construction are really minimal to what we, uh, what we spend each year on both operations and construction and what we need to receive uh, what we receive in our monthly fees. The other um, component of it is that we, um, let's see, where, where was I? So we still here? Yeah, so uh, that's how we, we determine that fee and um, I think that pretty much ends my presentation. Oh yeah, so I was sorry. Like the water department, <clears throat> well, previous to this uh, new fee being reset, we have charged all residential units based on how many uh, apartments or how many single family homes are being built. Uh, as, the, as the water department has changed it to the water meter size, um, for both for residential and for commercial, um, the Public Works Department is gonna follow that example. We believe it does give a better um, estimate of the use. Um, and remember, the, we're, we're using the water meter size, even though it's for wastewater, but we take into account uh, how that relationship is between uh, a water meter and actually sewage generation. So it's a little bit uh, uh, tricky there. But as you can see, the, uh, the rate will actually a little bit more than double for uh, a 
lot of the commercial users with the exception of your multi-unit um, uh, construction projects. And, and in that case, the rate will actually decrease uh, somewhat significantly for larger uh, residential projects. I think that's it. Thank you, Steve. Can you all hear me okay on speakerphone or should I switch to my, okay, but thank you. <laughs> um, so I'll be talking to you guys about child care and public and the public safety impact fee. Um, so uh, just as a reminder, again, we've adopted an ordinance for child care, but we do have some revisions in front of you for that, as well as um, the implementing re resolution is here and we'll be discussing the rates, but we actually are asking to adopt that on 427. Same goes for child uh, public safety. Resolution will be adopted on 427. So we can really dive in and look at any changes you guys would like to see um, before then. So let's see here. So the child care impact fee. So this fee would be used to pay for new developments fair share of child care facilities in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, the methodology for this study is actually done by the county of Santa Cruz who has this impact fee already and they brought on Kaiser Marston and Associates back in 2018. Um, the nice part of that nexus study is that the county looked at child care needs and how the needs crosses jurisdictional boundaries. For example, people who live in the county may be working in the city of Santa Cruz and dropping their kids off to child care facilities here and vice versa. And so the, the purpose of their nexus study was really to also allow incorporated jurisdictions to use the nexus study to set their own child care impact fees. Um, and so that's what you've seen, yeah, that's what you see that set the rates for ours. We also updated the data based on city data um, from similar resources to account for child care numbers within the city limits. Um, and Kaiser Marston looked at what that demand is in non-residential and residential development, looked at um, child care demand by type, whether that was a child care center or family child care homes. Um, and they looked at the cost to develop such facilities and, and homes, and then recommended a, a fee range based on that amount. It's important to note that for both the Nexus studies, the fee range is the maximum allowable amount. So that's the top of the scale. A fee can be adopted from any range up to that number. Um, these were the fees based on that study and with the updated um, city data. So you can see single family and multifamily residential. In communicating with some of the developers about these fees over the last couple of years, um, their response and concern has been essentially death by a, a thousand cuts is kind of the common term. That was just a number of fees that they're charged. We'll see a little bit more of that later. Um, so to compromise a bit there, we are recommending a graduated fee schedule for both childcare and public safety. Um, copied that from the county, they did that for child care as well, and we hoped that that reduces some of the initial um, changes there. Um, the, the another thing to note here for multifamily that's a bit different from the Nexus study for public safety is that the single family residential rate, the 56 cents per square foot, is the cost that was analyzed. Um, the county took, made the decision to set multifamily residential at a rate lower that just lower than what the single family cost would be. And we've done the same. We've essentially taken 75% of the cost for single family and made that the multifamily charge for uh, the multifamily units. So just as a note there, that is different in public safety. And we'll go over that then. Another piece that you guys have to consider about childcare today is not only the discussion of the rates that we're setting, but how those funds will be managed. So again, the county has a loan awards program for their child care fees already established. They've done it for many years. If you recall from the 2019 staff report, I recommended a range of, of options. One being putting the work completely on ourselves, all control for us, and then the end of that scale being completely letting the county run with it in their program. After doing a little bit more research um, about child care and child care facilities and reading about the county's program more, I refined that recommendation to alternative three in this report. And the big difference there is the inclusion of a facility plan. 
Um, in looking at, at the demand of childcare and how and the county's expertise in understanding childcare needs, um, I think it would be a good idea to explore childcare demand specifically for the city. Understand where the children are, what age, what parents, what areas of our city, um, what facilities do we currently have to potentially leverage partnerships for those existing facilities, schools, childcare homes, whatever it may be. And look at that holistically as well through other policies like you know the health and all policies potentially and how we maybe put child care in a place that maybe reduces traffic, all sorts of things that I think that this facility plan can really address. Um, in looking further as well at policy design and implementation if we were to adopt the county's program and have them use their system to do our annual loan awards, um, I was spoke with finance and accounting, and they had a number of really great questions. Um, as you know, when you are looking at policy implementation and design, they can feed each other. Um, and they had a number of accounting questions that is making me ask for maybe some additional time to explore that with them in regards to how funds are distributed, how we track loan awards, um, and how that, that works on a real basis. And additionally, talk with the county to really see how we can incorporate some of the work with them. And to address those, this all three identifies the need for a written agreement to, once we figure out what the best approach is, clearly identify those expectations. So for example, if you guys do decide to use the county's existing program, where they continue to run loan award programs, they continue to do their own workshops and have their annual application committee review applications, um, then we can clearly put in a written agreement where we expect the council to hear about those applications, how the council would like to see those applications and when, and how maybe finance wants to see any annual and written reports in regards to the accounting of those funds. So I feel like the written agreement is a good middle ground compromise to reduce adding additional workload to ourselves to the best of our ability and relying on the county for their expertise for child care. So those are the two main things of alternative three for child care. Oops. I'm gonna jump into the public safety impact fee now. Um, so the public safety impact fee, um, the charges here will be used for, again, capital. It's an impact fee that we focus on facilities, apparatuses, vehicles, and equipment for both fire and police. All the things that are required for them to run their operations, whether that's emergency preparedness or emergency response. Um, the methodology here is a hybrid of an existing service standard as well as a plan-based approach. So when I say level of service, it's, it's all our existing fire and police facilities. It's not like, you know, if a new development gets a call, then we only send one truck to go to that brand new development. It's serving everybody, all vehicles, whatever vehicle is available to respond, that's the vehicle that goes. So with that, we decided to use the level of service approach that identifies the current replacement cost of all our existing facilities for fire and police, related apparatuses, vehicles, and equipment. Um, we allocated that in an incremental way on showing what do we have now, what would growth be, and then an incremental increase to maintain our existing level of service and establish how many additional square feet of facility will we need to accommodate for new growth how many new vehicles, how many new apparatuses. And so with those costs put together, um, that essentially establishes the rates that I'm about to show you. It's important to note that um, a lot of the costs that we use, the estimates were quite low. Um, specifically the replacement cost for construction, we use $630 per square feet for fire. Um, in reality, some of the closer fire facilities around us are at a price of about $1,000 per square foot but we wanted to be conservative, um, so we used the lower rate there. Additionally, for a lot of the vehicles, we used our original purchase costs. Some of them are, were purchased quite a while ago. And so the vehicle costs are probably a lot on the lower side because we use similar replacement costs as if because of, of based on the purchase costs we, we had from back then. So conservative um, on those parts. This is the fee schedule. Again, you'll see a three-year graduated approach, the fire program fee section, as well as the police section. And when I talk, told you earlier about the difference with multifamily, so we actually did a cost allocation based on the number of persons per multifamily unit. So these costs here, 
um, for police and fire actually show higher for multifamily in both cases based on the analysis that we used. We did not, like with child care, do 75% of the single family. Um, again, when we do these nexus studies, these are the maximum rates that we can adopt, a range of them, anything lower is at the council's pleasure. Uh, let's see here. I do want to take a note, um, just because of the public comments received for the exemptions in this section, um, especially about affordable housing. Originally, we have not put that in the ordinance um, because as I was looking at a lot of other public safety impact fees, quite a few jurisdictions did not include affordable units as exempt. And so I, I chatted about that with police and fire to get their thoughts. Um, and, and they agreed and I agreed that because of the demand to multifamily residential that they did not initially want to see that exempted. Um, additionally, considering that fire and police facilities are a direct cost to the city, unlike you know, child care facilities, and we thought it was important to have that conversation and leave it out in the beginning. It's important to note that with, with these impact fees, if you do exempt fees of any kind, we cannot later go back and say, we under collected here, so we need to raise the rates. You can't do that. You cannot address the deficiencies. So just to know there for your consideration. So what do all these changes mean? We have some going up. We have some going down. I have no idea. <laughs> I do. I have some examples for you. Um, so just a little point of fact, there, this is an old study. It looked at 1999 cost, pay to play in the California housing and, housing and community development, I believe. And per residential unit, it was varied from jurisdiction to jurisdiction from 4,000 to 60,000. And I think those costs vary based on council priorities and council needs. Some people have public safety impact fees, some don't. Some have childcare, some don't. So that's a lot of the varying range. Um, an average per unit was about 24,325. And when you look at what that means for us, here are some examples of projects. Now the cost you're looking at here includes the service fees that we talked about earlier. So for these particular projects, it includes the planning application and going through the advisory body process if the item had to go to the planning commission, for example. It includes the building permit fees as well for review, intake, and issuance of permits. That includes traffic, green building, all sorts of things. Um, so we have these before and after prices per unit, and you can see for multifamily, it's going down. When you start to look at um, smaller non-accessory dwelling unit structures, ADUs are exempt um, throughout both of these, then you do start to see a, a small increase, in this case I believe it was about $400 for quite a large addition to a single family home. Overall, however, a, a large reduction for multifamily development. is what I have, and I'll bring it back to you, Mayor, for any questions. Thank you very much, Sarah and Rosemary and Steve. Um, great, great uh, presentation, great PowerPoint. Love the graphics. Um, <laughs> so I will go ahead and um, look to council member questions regarding this. Um, and I see that we have council member Golder Councilmember Cummings and Vice Mayor Bruner as the first three. Thank you again for the presentation. That was great. And Rosemary, I just wanted you to share with everybody since it wasn't in the PowerPoint, but something that shocked me, like the average meter size for a single family residential was a lot smaller than I thought. Oh yeah, five eighths, five eighths inch. That's a pretty standard uh, meter size. It's, it's, that's actually the smallest standard meter size that exists in the industry. Um, but I would suggest to you that if they were making them new based on today's uh, kind of demand patterns and you know what, what we're using water for in a home might even be smaller, but that's pretty much the standard minimum size. Residential consumption has gone down dramatically in the last, since the 1992 changes to the um, fixture standards uh, through the plumbing code, billing code changes. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to clarify, so ADUs are exempt if someone's building an ADU from these fees? Yes. Okay. And 
and then my my second thing that I was wondering, just because we had talked a lot about kind of this infill idea of turning single family homes into duplexes and triplexes and things like that. So those would be underneath the one to 120, or would those be under the single family? Well, it, it sort of depends based on what's happening with the units. Um, I was actually talking to Sarah earlier today about an existing building that was getting divided up into, I can't remember if it was two fourplexes or two, yeah. Um, or two duplexes. Two duplexes, two duplexes, two duplexes, duplexes. yeah, sorry. Yeah. So if, if you don't require any kind of upgrade to the meter size based on fixture counts and how the water's gonna be used, wouldn't change at all. So it's only an increment. So for example, if we if we had a five eighth inch meter in this facility and we needed to go to a one inch just to provide the additional, you know, flow in the event that we have now two dwelling units in that, um, there would be that incremental cost associated with it as opposed to um, the brand new start from scratch costs. And so for some of these fees you wouldn't not not every pull, pull, permit you pull would trigger these fees. It would just be specific to like let's say you're getting a solar for your roof. It wouldn't trigger these fees. It would just be substantial remodels or new construction. Yeah. Correct. And then many remodels doesn't trigger water or sewer changes at all. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that for us. Next I have council member coming. Thank you for that presentation. I was um, curious, I know uh, you mentioned the, that we're not currently uh, exempting affordable housing from this, uh, but I was just, and I guess that's kind of a side note to this question that I have, but I noticed within the fee structure, um, so for, you know, the difference in the fees for residential and multifamily, but then when you look at retail, office, industrial, and hotel, it's substantially lower for the hotel. And so I was just curious why that's the case. Um, I, my assumption is is that, you know, hotels help bring in revenue, so therefore, you know, if they're bringing in more tax revenue, we want to make it easier for them and make the cost of hotels lower. And, and I guess another comment there is that it, it doesn't always, sometimes you make things lower in, in businesses, that doesn't mean it always comes back into the community. Um, because it could just lead to higher prices for for um, rooms, which goes to profit rather than you know making it more affordable for people to use hotels. And then um, also kind of linked to that is that you know with affordable housing, um, I, I understand that. Um, so for example, for public safety in particular, that there are calls to. Um, people who live in those units, but it's so difficult in the state of California to build housing. And so I know that we're constantly trying to figure out ways to make it easier to build affordable housing in the state. And it seems like this might be a mechanism. And in addition to that, for hotels, I mean, when tourists come in, that's an, a bigger burden on uh, police officers and our public safety. So it might actually make sense that the fee will be higher for the hotels rather than lower. So I guess ultimately my question is really trying to understand the difference in the fee structure for uh, what appears to be uh, commercial use and why it's so low for um, hotels versus the other types of commercial use. Yeah, thank you, Council Member Cummings. That's a really great question. And it actually has to do with the type of methodology that we've used and the densities per employee. So on one of those pages there, I'd have to look to bring it up, but the impact of a resident and employee, number one, it was assumed that an, a residential impact is the total of one and an employee is half of that. That's further broken down in hotels, density per employee is a thousand square feet in the study, a larger number. And so that's what made the fee outcome lower versus um, the per square footage required for someone for an office type employee. So it's really the methodology that we use that makes that look lower. Um, and it would be something that I recommend when this fee is updated, nexus fees should be looked at regularly, um, that a consultant brought on board can look at those a little bit in more detail, especially that hotel connection. I did bring it up to um, our consultant who helped us a bit guiding in the method to use, and she actually brought that one up as well as something that we should review and dive into later because of the points that you've just made. Um, for now, 
now, with, based on the methodology, that's the rate that has been justified. So a follow-up question to that, later on, would we, like, so for example, um, if we do a follow-up study later on, and I, I guess if we do a follow-up study later on, I'm just wondering if there might be an opportunity to increase those fees for hotels, which would then allow for us to exempt affordable housing. Um, so the idea being that, you know, if there's people, like, the use that comes with hotels is much greater than any individual business, I would imagine, because during peak season, you're going to have high turnover. People are constantly using um, water um, versus, you know, some other uh, commercial use. And just the need for us to figure out how we can make it more affordable for affordable housing to get built, um, if we can use that as as kind of an exemption. So, just a thought for us to consider maybe moving forward, um, because it seems like the rate for hotels is so low compared to all the other uses that it might make sense for us to increase that and use it to to create an exemption for affordable housing. Um. I wonder if I could, if we could ask, um, I see that Bonnie Lipscomb is on, and um, I think that it might be useful to put the affordability waiver question kind of a little bit front and center here. Bonnie, might you be able to respond to what are the terms and conditions under which uh, a developer can apply for the affordability, the, the waiver for affordable housing for some of these fees? So any affordable housing project uh, under our current ordinance can ask the city and it comes to the city council for consideration for a waiver of fees. Um, it does trigger prevailing wage, you know, for the project, the majority of affordable housing projects are going to be paying that anyway because they're receiving, you know, their state and federal funding sources. So generally that's less of an issue, um, but it is ultimately up to the city council of whether or not they grant those fees. Historically, our general practice has been for affordable housing projects uh, that, at least in the last, I would say, 10, 10 to 15 years, um, that we I, I try to uh, cover or have reduced fees so that we do cover the cost of delivery of the services. But for some of the discretionary fees, we recommend those being waived, all subject to council consideration. And I would just add um, that the um, code section that specifically allows for exemptions of affordable housing projects and, uh, and fees associated with those affordable housing projects, um, it calls out fire fees. Um, it does not call out um, police fees. And so if the council was interested in providing an opportunity for um, projects to um, be exempt from the public safety impact fee, um, in the future, then uh, revision to that separate code section, which is actually in um, uh, 24.16 of the zoning ordinance, separate from any of the sections that you're talking about today, that would be a, a good location for it um, if you wanted that to be a, a discretionary action um, and not something that was exempted across the board. And state law also requires an administrative section in our ordinances for fee adjustments and waivers. Just as a case by case, if the applicant feels that there is no nexus or connection, then there's also that as well. And just one last comment on the affordable housing fees is also in past practice, particularly when we had redevelopment, what we often did was backfill using redevelopment funds for affordable housing projects, the related city fees, so that the individual affordable projects and developers didn't incur those costs, but we did make, um, as those costs are real and the fees are real, we did um, pay those on behalf of the project. Thanks, yeah, it'd be great if there's you know, opportunities to continue this conversation, maybe to see what we could do to at least create discretionary um, uh, waivers for these kinds of fees. Great, I have Vice Mayor Bruner is next and then Council Member Brown. Thank you. Um, Sarah, it's so nice to meet you. Thank you for the presentation and the slideshows. Um, I, so my questions, I think, also aligned with Council Member Cummings, and um, I had questions about uh, hotel and affordable housing. And um, so 
for hotels, uh, there's an assumption that more water use and, and impact uh, impact fees would be more. Uh, you know, your last slide that you showed, um, multi-residential, do hotels fall under that? They no, don't. that was, no. Uh, or multi-family, whatever it said for multi. What, are they their own category? Yes, yeah, so, yes, A commercial. Commercial. Com just, there's just blanket commercial. Okay. And then we have those retail, office, industri industrial manufacturing, and hotel categories under commercial with varying rates. Um, so with these, uh, we fo these examples focus on residential housing, um, but you would similarly see, I think, and Rosemary could speak to that for her commercial side of reductions. Mm -hmm. um, you would probably see some reductions there, and I believe those reductions would outweigh the impact of the child care and the public safety fee. Um, I, I can just give you an, a, a couple of examples. So uh, we use a strategy called fixture count. Mm -hmm. So if it's a, if it's a hotel, uh, it goes to, you know, how many sinks, how many toilets, how many showers, how many, you know, washing machines, how many whatever else, the kitchens, et cetera, that they might have on site. So the, the, when a project like that comes in, the staff go through the plans in detail and they do fixture counting and then they make a determination using a, a kind of a mechanism that it, it's a standardized mechanism used nationally just to sort of convert this many fixtures to a meter size. Um, so the pretty much across the board, the cost of a, a four inch meter, for example, is going down some. The cost of a, a six inch meter is going down some. So those are those are all sort of changing in response to that. And as kind of as I mentioned earlier, and I, and I remember this because none of the council, current council members, I think, were on the board on the council at the time. But the last time the La Bahia project came forward, uh, it has a it's a project that has a two inch meter serving whatever is there. I don't know that it's currently in use because I think that facility or that that thing might be not um, being used at the moment, but. Uh, it was the fixture counting was done based on what the assumptions were about what the new development was going to be, and it was going to go from a two-inch meter that was there to a four-inch meter. And uh, at the time, I think there was a, whatever the increment was, around ninety thousand, uh, would have been their connection fee change. Okay. Okay, and then one last question for the. Um, Again, going back to water and new development, are there requirements for um, the fixtures to be like low flow toilets? Oh, yeah. Things like that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Toilets, uh, fixtures. I was looking, I was looking online at something recently and uh, for another you know, part of my actual life over there someplace else um, where I was trying to buy a, a, a faucet and they said, no, it can't ship that one to California. That doesn't meet the, I think it was a shower head actually. And um, so, no, because the, so the, we have we have plumbing code, building code standards, we have irrigation, you know, commercial irrigation standards. And those things have been in place and they've been ratcheted down over time. So, you know, if you went out to the Home Depot or the Lowe's or the Ace Hardware and tried to buy a toilet to replace the toilet within your, you can only buy ones that are low flow. You might be replacing one that used three and a half gallons per flush, but you would get one that uses 1.2 or 0.98 gallons per flush. Okay, and what about older, oh. Is there any requirements to upgrade at, after a certain amount of time or? We have, Santa Cruz has a, what's called a retrofit on resale ordinance that's been in place for, for a long time. And that meant that when you sold the property, then you, um, then you had to have the fixtures be in alignment with the, the current um, standards. I will tell you that uh, both from the, the, um, Washing machines, shower heads, faucets, uh, toilets, 
It's a very, in Santa Cruz, one of the reasons that our consumption is so low is that there is a very significant degree of sort of um, market saturation of all of those kinds of really efficient fixtures. I'm not saying there's not a three and a half gallon per flush toilet out there someplace, but that's the exception, not the rule in Santa Cruz. And it has to do with a whole range of, you know, the age of the housing stock. So when things fail, you can't buy uh, something that is more wasteful, that kind of thing. Yeah, and also thinking of some of the larger, you know, facilities like hotels, for example. Yeah, yeah. A, a lot of the a lot of the new uh, the new development clearly is one of the reasons we're not seeing the increase in demand over time from some of the proposed development is because it's very efficient because of the new fixtures that would be brought in. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, I now have Council Member Brown. Thank you. Um, really appreciate this series of reports, um, it, you know, to the extent that I can wrap my mind around how you're uh, making these decisions and the methodologies and, how, you know, how it, how it all works. It, it was really um, quite clear. So I really appreciate that. Um, I too had questions and comments related to the uh, the fees for hotels, and so I, you know I just add my two cents that if there's a way to kind of reevaluate that and think about the assumptions we're using within that methodology, that would be you know I think that would be great. Uh, and then with respect to the affordable housing. Um, exemption for the public safety impact fee. I, I totally understand that. And I my first question was what, why in the one and not the other. Um, and I appreciate the responses that uh, you and Bonnie Litscom, who, so yeah, she's still here, um, gave us. Um, but I did wanna just ask, given that, uh, that because these affordable housing projects, 100% affordable housing projects, always have deep subsidy and the city almost always puts in uh, a share, whatever it can do with the end of redevelopment, clearly less, but um, so were we to handle it in that same way as we, we used to do under redevelopment, um, rather than having a categorical exemption, a asking the individual project developers or, and or the city itself to uh, make that request to the council, um, the, the categorical exemption would mean that it just doesn't get paid. Whereas if, and I'm just trying to make sure I got this right, whereas if we don't exempt and then decide that we're gonna support helping cover the cost of those fees, it's essentially a transfer probably between the affordable housing trust fund into the, it would just be paid to the general fund. Is that, am I getting that right? Um, so I, I can't speak to the trust fund piece. I'll, I'll leave that to Bonnie. But what I can say is the categorical exemption that you're talking about by putting the exemption in the ordinance is a clean sweep. So no, right. no, fee, right. no project pays that fee. Right. However, also in that ordinance is a section that's required by state law um, for, favor, for waivers and fee adjustments um, and allows the applicant to go through that process. That would potentially be additional workload at public hearings for city council, but if the individual wishes and is like, I, I don't wanna pay this fee, it's significant, or the real intent is we don't feel this fee relates to our project, we don't feel we should charge it, that's an avenue for them to do that already in the ordinance presented to you today. Um, and then the, the other piece, that code section that Lee was talking about, 24 something, um, it doesn't specifically mention police, it only mentions fire, so you have a second option if you wanted to put them in that zoning code or code. Um, and then there's also Bonnie's trust fund piece that I don't have above my head, so I'll leave that to her. I think one of the distinctions is the discretionary piece. You know, depending on each individual affordable housing project, some have deeper affordability than others, some have different, you know, mixes. So the way it works now, it is really up to you at the council for you to assess and sort of gauge the, you know, the sort of the critical importance of meeting that unmet need for affordable housing in our community and how deep that affordability is. And um, based on that, you make those decisions and directions to us. 
of what fees we can reduce, uh, waive, or recover using our affordable housing funds. Um, and I would just say our our pot now, you know, because post redevelopment, when we had redevelopment, we had an average of two to three million per year dedicated set aside for affordable housing. So it was less painful sometimes to make these decisions. Whereas right now, with the limited funding that we have for affordable housing, we really look at you know how far can we leverage these funding, uh, this funding to create critically needed affordable housing units. So it is it is a balance. I do think ultimately it would be good to um, refine or further sort of uh, clarify the language in our ordinance around this because it, it is challenging, I think, for developers um, every time they come forward and it's a little bit nebulous in our ordinance how we address this. So this is an area where I think we could have some improvement in the future. Thank you. Um, so I, yeah, I guess hearing that, and that was exactly what I was trying to get at there. Thank you. Um, it, it seems to me that it, it might be in our interest to figure out at the front end how to just make that a categoric, categorical exemption for at, a, at least for 100% affordable housing projects um, as we are with childcare, um, and then making the requisite change in the zoning code to add police. So I, I'll, I'd be interested to hear how other council members feel about uh, trying to go that route. Um, and then just one side question is a clarification question. In the ordinance, it's attachment one under the public safety impact fee, um, on, in, under that agenda item, at the bottom of page five, or kind of, I guess it's really the top all the way, through, most of page five, under fee adjustments, um, child care impact fee shows up. Um, and I think it, it, and I was trying to understand and was I missing something, but I think that maybe that was just an oversight as you were transferring the, the standard language. Okay, so I just, so you know, There's it's there a couple of times. Yeah, it's there. I was there. gonna ask yeah, for but. someone to catch that for me, so thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> I figured, thanks. Thank you. Next, I have Council Member Watkins. Yeah, no, thank you for the presentation and the clarifying questions from my colleagues. Um, I'm really excited that the child care impact fee is here before us for official adoption. It's something that I've been wanting to see move forward since 2018, so I'm happy to see it um, before us today. I, I guess I just wanted a little bit of clarity that um, one, we can't go retroactive, right? Even though we had an ordinance on the books, you can't apply that, correct? Okay. And then two, um, that as we move forward potentially with adopting this today, and those fees are uh, incurring then at the same time as when the research around county city partnership would also take place so that we wouldn't necessarily not move forward in some way, given that we don't have clarity on that approach. Is that accurate? Oh. That is okay. correct. So we would start collecting 60 days after the adoption of the, of the resolution and we'll be working on that written agreement and hopefully um, identifying if the facility plan is agreed to, identifying the responsibilities around that and getting that going. Also, okay. Um, I guess my only sort of additional comment would be that I think there's aspects that the county, that the partnership with the county could offer the city in regards to how the um, applications are reviewed, how the evaluation has been conducted in terms of people from the field. So um, moving forward, I, I um, am hopeful that there's some sort of uh, way to sort of leverage people's time and expertise in terms of um, the system, but um, definitely make it, make it work for the city of Santa Cruz. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I just want to just clarify, or just, um, I guess, very short, quick comment. Um, so my understanding is we do have a waiver, uh, a waiver ability for affordable housing. Um, and is that, at, is that at a given affordability level or is it at 100% affordable units in any in, in a given uh, development proposal? I just a little more clarification on who's eligible for that. So if you're talking about the funds that are provided from Bonnie, that would be a little bit different. But if you, in regards to a definition of affordable projects that are being exempted, there's one in childcare and I'm gonna bring that up really quickly. I'll share my screen. <laughs> In 
so this is the definition here, item D, 100% of the units excluding the manager units. Okay. And so potentially, if we were to exempt categorically public safety, we would use the same type of definition here. Um, okay. Yeah, I remember that language now that, I, that now that you've pulled it back up. Okay, great. That was, one of, that was my main question. Uh, any other questions from council members at this time? Seeing any? Okay, I will go ahead and take this out to the public. And this is for items number 33 through 36, development charges and fees. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment on, on items 33 through 36, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. If you are interested in commenting now on the development charges and fees, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. Right now, I'm just seeing one member in the public and your phone number ends in 1810. So you can go ahead and speak. You'll have two minutes. Yeah, hi, this is uh, Philip. Um, I don't really have a super strong uh, feelings about this, but uh, just looking at it, it, it seems like the methodologies here, I, I don't really understand. Um, if, if you consider the uh, continuing revenue sources are different for uh, many of these six items, uh, um, I assume the city budgets and the revenue funding these departments like police and fire already take into account the cost to maintain what we have. And it seemed to me these charges that you propose are essentially three times the annual per capita cost of police and fire, although perhaps the data is not, not really available for me to say that other than the stated annual budget. I just divide the police budget, I think it's 28 million by 65,000 and that's 430 per capita, which you propose the developer having to pay every year for three three years, if I understand correctly. It seems to me after the first year, the normal you know, revenue streams would be increased by new development, for instance, higher and extra property taxes, sales taxes, and th those people would be paying just like everyone else. So maybe it's excessive, is what I'm saying, after the first year. Um, and I, uh, water is more complicated, but it's a different revenue stream, but there is a revenue stream, as you know, we charge for water. And as far as the water meters, they last for 50 years or more, and the water rates can tweak the balance between rates and costs. And new users will be buying water just like, uh, the, uh, well, uh, the, the, the buildings will be paying property taxes, et cetera, just like everybody else. And uh, I'm sure each project is different. And, um, and it's probably a small piece of uh, the cost over a long time uh, because they last so long. Anyway, that's my view, and it seems like possibly some of these fees are excessive and a money grab. Thanks, bye. Okay. Anyone else in the uh, audience today interested in commenting on item number 33 through 36? Should press star nine on your phone to raise your hand at this time. Okay, not seeing any, I will turn it back to the council at this time and I believe we will need to take a vote on each resolution individually. So I would start, um, unless there's further comment or clarification with, um, with staff, I would go ahead and just uh, start having us with uh, work directly with the uh, individuals. So the first is the um, item number 33 is the water system development charge update. And this would be resolution, approving resolution, <clears throat> adjusting the water system development charges and rescind resolution number NS-29,355. And I would look for either further comments or the motion. Council Member Watkins and Council Member Brown. Um, unless there's any further comments, I'm prepared to move the recommendation as presented. So I'm, I'll make that motion. Good. And Council Member Brown? Yeah, I'll second that. Are there any other questions or comments from Council Members on item number 33? We have a motion on the table. Okay. And just grab, <laughs> just wanna grab these. <coughs> oh, 
Okay, we have a motion on the table to approve resolution, to approve the resolution to adjust the water system development charges and rescind resolution number NS-29,355. Have a roll call vote, please. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. So we'll now move to item number 34. And I am doing that as we speak. <laughs> Make sure I've got it up. I can refer to it. And this is the item regarding the sewer connection fees. This will be adopting a resolution, a re, uh, approving the resolution for adopting the revised sewer connection fees and rescinding resolution number NS29181. And I would look for a uh, motion for this. I see Council Member Golder. You don't have to go to public comment for this one, we're doing it as a group, right? Oh, and I, I, I'll be, yeah, I'll I would now, since, yeah. Okay. I'll move the item um, 33 as written in the packet. Second that. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor by Council Member Golder, seconded by Mayor Myers. This would be to approve the resolution adopting the revised sewer connection fees and rescinding resolution number NS 29181. And can I have a roll call vote? Council Member Watkins? Aye. Helen Hurry Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, next we have uh, the child care impact fee. And the recommend, staff recommendation is to introduce for publication an ordinance amending chapter 18.48 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code related to child care impact fees to consider staff recommendation to use initial child impact fee funding to develop a child care facility plan within the city of Santa Cruz to guide child care facility development in the areas it is most needed. Three, discuss and consider staff recommendations to co-manage child care impact fee revenues with the County of Santa Cruz through a written agreement once the city's child care facility plan is complete. And four, return on April 27, 2021 to adopt a resolution setting the child care impact fee charges for residential and non-residential development. That is our staff recommendation. Um, and I see Council Member Watkins um, would you like to make a motion? Yes, I would. I would like to move the recommendation as presented and our staff report as um, read by you, Mayor. And I just wanna say um, thank you to the staff for your thoughtful process here. I'm really encouraged that this is now before us, but even more so looking at uh, facilities plans and see how we can continue to find ways that we as a city can support the critical infrastructure that childcare provides our community, our parents, our kids, and our economic engine. So um, I enthusiastically uh, move the recommendation. And I see council member Collintari Johnson. Yeah, I'll second that motion and also just wanted to comment that I'm really thrilled to see this. Um, I had the opportunity to work with the Child Care Planning Council some years ago, um, helping them with their strategic plan. So I, I understand the need and I'm really happy that we are um, moving in this direction to support the need. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Okay, we have a motion um, by council member Watkins with a second by council member um, Collintari Johnson to go with the staff recommendation, which includes introducing for publication an ordinance amending chapter 1848 of the 
State of Cruz Municipal Code related to child care impact fees to consider the staff recommendation to use uh, initial child impact fee funding to develop a child care facility plan to discuss and consider staff recommendation to co-manage the child in impact fee revenues with the County of Santa Cruz through a written agreement and then return on April 27, 2021 to adopt a resolution setting the child impact fees charges for residential and non-residential development. And could we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Meyer? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. And I too just wanna um, thank the staff and Council Member uh, Watkins. I know this is something you worked on on council, um, on your time here on council. And, um, and just also very excited about the use of the funding for a child care facility plan. I think that's really um, a great idea. I know, um, Many people have seen the, in the press that the loss of childcare has really become um, really prevalent in our community and also COVID really um, shone a light on uh, how not having childcare really affects the ability of families to, um, to maintain their, their economic stability. So um, I'm really excited about the childcare facility plan. So congrats. Uh, next up is the um, creation of item number 36, creation of a new public safety impact fee. And I'm just gonna scroll down one more time. <laughs> Let me get this right. Okay. And this item would introduce for public, is, is recommended to introduce for publication an ordinance establishing a new child, excuse me, wait a minute. Did I miss that? Oh, I'm sorry, okay. I scroll fast enough. Okay. This item is to introduce for publication an ordinance establishing a new public safety impact fee within chapter 18.49 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code and to return on April 27th, 2021 to adopt a resolution setting the public safety impact fee charges for residential and non-residential development. And is there a motion please? Council Member Brown. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I am prepared to make a motion. I just wanted to make one more comment related to the uh, affordable housing exemption. I. Um, I think that it's, it's, it would be really great if we could do that today. Um, it seems to me just in thinking about practically um, the number of projects that may be affected by this um, is relatively limited given our capacity to get affordable housing built. Um, and it's, it mean, it's a big difference for developers. It's, we have such a hard time getting affordable units produced. It seems like um, you know, adding an additional cost that we could avoid right now is a good idea. Uh, and I think doing that categorically makes sense because while there, is, there are other ways to deal with that, they all will require additional administrative time, potentially um, money coming from a different pot, a different fund to cover that cost. And so I would, um, you know, given that reality, I would move that we um, introduce for publication an ordinance establishing a new public safety impact fee within chapter 18.49 of the Santa Cruz Unicode, attachment one, and return on April 27, 2021 to adopt a resolution setting the public safety impact fee charges. Um, actually, I'm sorry, I think I need to, well, so the, so no, part two, <laughs> so as written part, but in under number, I guess it's back to number one um, with the following addition and that would be a categorical exemption for a 100% affordable housing um, projects and the, as per the language used in the childcare impact fee ordinance 
under 1848050 exemptions D. I think that language um, could transfer. Uh, and then the, uh, I guess, three would be and to direct staff to um, return with an amended, an amendment to the zoning code to add police in the requisite area, which I believe, um, Lee, remind me where you said it needed to be done in 24.16. 24.16, however, if you're categorically exempting that, um, then you don't need to go and make the change in the other section. Okay, great. So. Um, so at the, the um, direction, the recommendation as stated uh, in our packet with the uh, addition of a categorical exemption for 100% uh, affordable housing projects. So just to confirm, there's no number three. No number three. That Thanks. Is. So that in is yeah, number two. Uh, so the the uh, number two is is capturing that categorical exemption, right? Yeah. Thank you. I thought it was I thought it was one. It's actually in one. Yeah, because it's in it has to go in the ordinance. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh, and Council Member Cummings. I'll go ahead and second that motion. Okay. To interrupt, I apologize. Do I have to formally capture my typos, Bonnie, for those two? two places that council member Brown caught, or are we okay that we correct that by myself? No, you can, you can correct it. Okay, sorry for the interruption. Sorry, I called it out, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, we have a motion on the floor, and I see council member Boulder has her hand up. Um, comment? Question, I was just wondering if we do this, how would that impact other developments or other fee, fees and what would be, I mean, I, I'm trying to think of what, how many projects we have that are 100% affordable moving forward, like what would the potential uh, loss of revenue be that would have to be made up in other ways and what other ways can we make it up, if that makes sense, if we did this now. So that yeah. would be something that I would have to run some numbers for um, and work with, with Lee on. It's, you know, I can't control what applies or what type of projects apply and when, so it's a, a difficult analysis, but I don't know if Lee, you wanna jump in on? Sure, um, I, I think um, the answer is it depends, as is often the case. Um, you know, when we have some large um, affordable housing, 100% affordable housing projects come through, like when, uh, uh, 350 Ocean came through and um, they pulled their building permits. Um, you know, that can represent a significant percentage of the number of units of any particular year, but other years, you know, there may not be any 100% affordable housing project. So, you know, the answer is it, it, it depends on um, the specific year and whether any large projects come through. So I'm thinking specifically of like the one that we just approved that's going next door to the red the red church. Like what savings would it cost? What savings would they how much savings would they benefit from this? And would we have to make that money up somewhere else or would it just be they would they might have applied for an exemption anyways? Um, so, Sarah, maybe while I am kind of addressing the second half of that question, if you can pull up some of the uh, info in terms of what um, some of the sample projects were in terms of costs for the public safety impact fee. Um, but with respect to the second part of your question, Councilmember Golder, they could um, still apply for an exemption. Um, the difference there is if you have the, um, if you have it built in um, to the impact fee, I guess here, either way, it's coming out of the general fund. Um, you know, so, so if we're buying police cars right now, that's a general fund expense. Um, and um, we would have to backfill that somehow. Um, if they apply for the exemption, there could be an ability to backfill the general fund with affordable housing trust fund. But if you, if it's a categorical exemption, not the discretionary one out of 24.16, 
than the categorical exemption, it's coming from the general fund because our general fund buys the police cars. They, it funds the fire stations. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. And then Sarah, I don't know if that gave you enough time to look yeah. up. So in regards to what the amount you could potentially be exempting on those three uh, project examples I provided, the one that was 120 units, that public safety multifamily charge would be about $83,000 if, if that project were 100% affordable. Um, and that would just be for the residential portion. There'd be an additional $6,000 for the retail office space that would be exempted. So a total of about $88,000 there. Um, for that 100 unit project, if that was affordable, you would be looking at about $170,000 um, forgiveness amount for multifamily in the retail office space potentially there. Does that answer your question? Member Brown? Or, I'm sorry, Council Member Colder, did you have additional questions? Well, it just now that to me, we have another question. And so in exempting the project, if they have retail space that's market rate below, that would also be exempt from paying the fee? Because it's one project. The market rate, it pr actually probably wouldn't be. We would probably focus on the residential affordable section and then the market rate would remain the same. So adjusting that then, the 100 units would be 143,000 and 120 units would be an $83,000. Okay, all right, thank you for clarifying. Councilmember Brown? I had that same clarifying question about the retail, uh, but I also just wanted to say that given those examples, um, you know, it does sound like a lot of money. Um, it, that is a lot of money to an affordable housing developer. You know, I mean, that's a difference between, potentially between, uh, you know, 30% uh, uh, afford, you know, of median income to 120% of median income for several, I mean, who knows, right? There's lots of ways to calculate that. So it's pretty significant for those projects. And I think it's, you know, it's in our interest to do what we can to make those possible. Um, so, and I would just say in terms of the, the revenue on the revenue side, this is money that we're currently not collecting. So it's not money that we have to backfill per se. It's it's just money that we will we are choosing to um, not um, require for a particular subgroup of developers. So Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. I would just also comment, I know that we have a number of priorities right now within the city that we're trying, you know, as it relates to affordable housing that we're trying to get built. So for example, the Metro project and the library project, it seems like, you know, that along with the other affordable housing developments we're trying to get in, this is also a way that we can help move those projects forward and close those those gaps in terms of the funding deficit. So it seems like this would be, and as has been mentioned, the 100% affordable units are not, it's not something that's being built frequently. These are things that provide a lot of community benefit that um, you know are rarely produced. So I think that as Councilmember Brown said, it sounds like a lot, but when you think about how frequently we have 100% affordable housing built in the city, um, it, it really isn't that frequent that we would see these kinds of savings. I'll call on myself. Um, I'm wondering if the maker of the motion would um, potentially consider sort of a adding to that categorical exemption, sort of a five-year review of revenues um, that basically were were lost. I, I'm supportive of the concept. I just um, I am worried that we are, you know, we we. We often want to kind of avoid impact fees, and I understand that. And I and I've had conversations with affordable develop affordable housing developers, and and this is expense an extra expense. However, um, I believe in the state of California, we're going to see more and more incentives, and obviously the the tax incentive is a huge thing that often is really what makes an affordable housing project pencil. And I've even heard members of the public say, well, you know, $100,000 doesn't make a difference in, in, you know, the cost of building affordable housing. So I, I, what I'd like to just understand a little bit more is if there's an evaluative kind of, maybe it's in 10 years we do that, but I think it's, um, I, I do think this is a, 
police and fire are both a heavy burden on the general fund. And so um, I just am keeping that in mind as I'm considering my vote on the motion. I certainly understand trying to incentivize and help affordable housing um, be built um, as quickly and have been a supporter of every affordable unit proposed so far um, in any housing development so far. But I'm, I am a little bit uh, reticent to um, approve, approve the motion um, just because I don't really understand the impact. And I'm wondering if there's some kind of evaluation step where we can ascertain some of the impacts to the general fund because one of the big problems we have is just um, not being able to have resources for the general fund cost, and those are very expensive um, and continue to grow over time. So that's just my thought. I don't know if the maker of the motion would consider putting in sort of a report out on revenue, revenues for gone, uh, maybe in 10 years or five years, something like that. If you would be amenable to that, sure. How, what, at whatever time frame seems appropriate from your perspective, staff, etc. You know that. Yeah, absolutely. I think we should always be um, reviewing from time to time the impact of the decisions we make. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, that, would you be amenable sense. to a five-year review, Sandy? Just because we sure. do. Okay. And would would uh, the seconder be amenable to that? Great. Okay. So Bonnie, if you um, maybe want to put up the motion, I could, we could stick that in there. Great, that's great. Okay, excellent. Okay, uh, unless there's any other comments from our uh, questions or comments from council members, I'm not seeing any hands up. Um, Bonnie, if you wouldn't mind, maybe I'll, if you would put that white back up again, oh. and I'll read from it so we can. <laughs> my cryptic notes. <laughs> the only thing I couldn't capture was this thought of the ordinance. Sarah, is that the Bonnie, citation? I can send it the language to you right now if you want to drop it in. Uh, if, if you just have the um, yeah, the section number. Um, yeah, I just actually, I'm just going to send it to you because I already just copied it. Sorry. Let's see if I can do this. Um, I, I have it if, if, if that's easy, the section number. Go ahead. That'll uh, work. Yeah. Okay, it's 18.48.050, uh, section D. Yeah. And, and Bonnie, I just sent that. Um, <laughs> I copied and pasted it from the child care, so I, I sent that to you as well if you want it to. It should be 4 9, Bonnie. 4 9. 4 8 of child care. Got it. Okay, great. So we have a motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Cummings to introduce for publication ordinance number 2071 11, excuse me, 2021 11, establishing a new public safety impact fee within Chapter 18.49 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code with the following categorical exemption for 100% affordable housing projects as per language used in child care impact fee ordinance under 18.49.050, Section D, or D. Return on April 27th to adopt a resolution setting the public safety fee safety impact fee changes um, charges for residential and non-residential development. And there was a friendly amendment accepted to request to add to the categorical exemption a five-year review of revenues that may have been lost with report back to council. Uh, so can we get a roll call vote, please, Bonnie? Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? I still have one more question. Is it says residential and non-residential, now I'm confused. Good catch. Sarah, do you have a comment on that? Uh, which section are you are the on the screen here? It says that the public impact, the public safety impact fee charges, and it says for residential and non-residential development. And Councilmember Goldberg thought she clarified that oh. the retail would actually be charged because it was not 
there's no affordability factor in retail. Yeah, so that just has to do with the overall, there are charges on non-residential and there's charges on residential. Your affordability portion is just specific to residential people. Residential. But the fees that we're charging themselves are across the board. There's a residential section and there's a non-residential section, AKA the commercial, commercial stuff, office, retail. Um, you are not exempting that as, as this reads. When we come back with the resolution, you'll be adopting the fees for both those categories. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor Bruner, did you have a question? Yes, I'm still questioning the categorical exemption um, clause in there. It's referencing the child care impact fee language, which is 18.48.050. Section D. So, those are the type, typos that I'll correct with Bonnie that they clarified would not require a motion. It should just read public safety. So I'll catch those typos with Bonnie. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, continue with the roll call vote. Councilmember Boulder. I think that was a yes. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I don't know why you can't hear me when I click unmute. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. And that brings our public hearings to an end at this time. Council will uh, adjourn until 5.30 when we will return for item number 37 on our I'm sorry, uh, item number 36 on our agenda. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. so we will get started. Um, sorry, my mouse just died, so I have to figure out a way to make my other computer work. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to our 5.30 session of the April 13th, 2021 meeting of the City Council. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25, and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Watkins. Here. Kalantari Johnson. Here. <clears throat> Brown. Here. Cummings. Holder? Here. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Myers? Present. Thank you. We will now um, go on, move on to oral communications. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you are interested in addressing the council, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to speak. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comment so that we can accurately capture it in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required to state your name. Please remember this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications has been completed. 
So I will look to the uh, attendees today. Uh, and again, this is just for oral communications. This is not for item number 36 um, on the agenda. That will be the next item that we discuss tonight. So I see uh, David is first on oral communications. David, you should be able to unmute yourself. Press star six. David, if you unmute yourself, you should be able to speak. Bonnie, is he muted on your? He is we muted, unmute? but he, he's just not unmuting himself. We can come back to him maybe. Okay, David, we'll come back. Oh, there you are. Go ahead, David. David, we can't hear you. Um, David, we're having a hard time hearing you. We'll come back to you. Uh, let's move on to caller ending in 4844. Please press star six to unmute yourself and then um, you will be able to speak. So I understand I have uh, group time today. You Is that accurate, Mayor? You requested group time for, I believe, the next agenda item, Mr. Norris. I actually requested, for, requested it for both this item and the one following. Well, both the request came in late. I've given you time for the following item, but I'd like to keep your comment to two minutes for oral communication. I'll see what I can do here. Um, I'm going to be reading, this has to do not with the TOLO law, but with what's going on in Chico, California, where there is a restraining order that has been set up against uh, city abusive practices toward homeless people, which is eerily familiar to me and sounds a bit like Santa Cruz. And I think it's also something that's a cautionary action for the city council, which I sort of may have passingly referenced earlier to you. This is what the restraining order says. It's a temporary restraining order which shows that the plaintiffs have carried their burden, and these are individuals in a camp called the Comanche Creek Greenway in Chico, California. They're in a camp and similar to the San Lorenzo campground. The preliminary injunction enjoins the city of Chico and the Chico Police Department and everybody involved in that from enforcing or threatening to enforce 72-hour illegal encampment notifications, you know, such as your city is set up in San Lorenzo Park, issuing or enforcing any other 72-hour illegal encampment notifications to unhoused persons on public property in Chico, California generally. Okay, that's very significant. Enforcing or threatening to enforce the Chico Municipal Code sections listed, and this has to do with the anti-homeless ordinances of which Santa Cruz has plenty, involving things like sitting down, resting downtown, and so forth. Enforcing or threatening to enforce the panhandling code, the state panhandling code, and then also destroying the property of unhoused people, even if it's valued at less than $100, as has been a cons consistent concern of a lot of us here in Santa Cruz, concerned with how police and parks and rec rangers are treating homeless people. This is something that is currently in force in Chico, which is a far more conservative area than Santa Cruz, and yet we are pursuing uh, actions that in a way, in way seem just as abusive. So I would encourage you to consider that in your deliberations and consider the community to resist that if you don't. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, um, we'll try David again. Please press star six and we should be able to hear you. David, we still can't hear you. We need you to unmute yourself. Okay, David, we can't seem to connect with you. Um, I'm gonna move on to Wendy King. Are you here for oral communications? This is for items not on the agenda, not item 36. Go ahead, Wendy. Please. Hello, can you hear me? 
Okay. So, I'm, my name is Wendy King. Um, television or um, uh, listening device that you may have on. Okay, Wendy, we can't hear you now, so if you mute your television or streaming device and then listen through your phone, that's what you need to do. Hi, can you hear me now? Uh, we're still getting an echo. Okay, uh, I'm gonna turn on Hi, can you hear me now? There we go, perfect. Damn, God damn it. Wendy, can you hear us? This is so complicated. <laughs> Wendy, can you hear me? Okay, Bonnie, I don't quite know what to do. <laughs> Welcome. Okay. I'm trying to let's, dial back in. So. Okay, perfect. Um, let's move on to phone number ending in 6214. This is for item number 30, uh, excuse me, oral communications, not item 36. Go ahead, please. My name's Jacqueline Davidow. I've lived in the Seabright neighborhood for about 40 years now. I'm a homeowner. I just want to say I support the mayor's proposal. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to cut you off. That's actually item number 36. That's the next item. This is oral communications. This is for items not on the agenda right now. So we'll keep you in the queue, and uh, we'll queue you back up when we start that item. Thank you. Okay. For people that have their hands up, um, if you're if you're just going to speak for item 36, you'll have to take your hand down so I can see who's really here for or, oral communications. Oral communications is right now. We have not started on item number 36, which is the uh, temporary outdoor living ordinance. So only keep your hand up if you're going to speak on that. Uh, excuse me. Only if you only if you're going to speak on oral communications. Okay, David. Let's try you again. Press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, David, we're, we're not able to get you. I'm not quite sure what's happening. Um, we'll have to move on to phone number ending in 8633. And again, this is just for oral communications, not on uh, for items on the agenda. Uh, the next item on the agenda. You're on, you're on, you're for the next agenda item? That's correct, my apologies. No worries, thank you. If you're, if you are for the next agenda item, I'd like you to take your hand down so that we can finish oral communications and then you can put your hand back up. So if you could just unraise your hand at this point it will help me see who is here for oral communications. Okay. Nobody's lowering their hand. So Bonnie, what, what should I do? <laughs> I guess just keep going and then I'll just unraise their hands once we okay. determine their so, oral um, 8633, I think said she said she was for the next item. Skirt is the next um, person listed, and are you here for oral communications? You should be able to speak. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, um, I'd like to speak about um, a, a proposal that is a, regarding homelessness, but it's not about the TOLO. Is this the appropriate time? Uh, sure. Okay. Um, good evening, council members. This is Skirt Vonnegut. I'm calling in with a proposal. Um, this proposal is to heal the relationship between the city and the homeless community. We need to stop thinking of homelessness as a nuisance or a problem and start thinking of homeless people as voters. And more importantly, we need to start thinking of them as consumers. 
To that end, I propose we start a program where a city worker comes by your camp every day, and for every day your tent area is neat and tidy, and you hand over your hazardous waste, uh, you receive 10 downtown dollars. Now what does a person do with those dollars? Maybe they go to Lulu Carpenters and pick up coffee and a bagel. Now they don't have to ask anyone for money in order to eat a decent breakfast. Or they stop into New Leaf for some toiletries. Maybe they save up their downtown dollars for a while and get themselves a new pair of shoes. See, you incentivize good behaviors that you want to see. You can kickstart the downtown economy, give people a chance to participate in society with dignity, and cooperate with the city's goals. The city would have more peaceful contact with people experiencing homelessness in order to identify mental health needs and assess for health and safety risks, and you'd likely see a reduction in crime. Run the program in San Lorenzo Park only, and that will keep folks centralized and avoid the dispersal throughout the city. This program is easy to budget by performing a point in time count and deciding on a daily dollar amount. We can call it a volunteer cleanup stipend, plus a few staff members in the field, um, and you can take this out of the public safety budget. This could also be contracted out to a reputable organization like Sanitary for the People. One more sentence, I'm calling it the Sanitary Homies Program, and it's inspired by a similar program that's going on in Sacramento. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next person um, up for, uh, sorry, my computer's starting to fall apart. Next person for public comment would be ending in 1041. This is just for oral communications. This is not for item 36, the temporary outdoor living ordinance. Um, go ahead, caller 1041 if you're not, if you're here for oral communication. Hi. Hi, this Hi was for item 36. I didn't know how to unraise the hand though from the call in. So if you could give us instructions on that, that might be helpful. Okay, thanks so much, I will, we will, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay, next caller is Jane Mio. Are you here for item 36 or for oral communications? And star nine does. I'm here for item number 36. Okay. Thank you, Jane. We're gonna have you hang on. We'll move to the next. So if you are here for item 36, I've got um, two more phone numbers. One ends in 4871, and the other ends in 1263. Of either of those folks, if you're here for item 36, just press star nine and that will, that will unraise your hand. Okay. So your hands are still up, so I will go ahead and uh, have Caller ending in 4871. This is just for oral communications, not for item 36. Go ahead. Press star six to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I am just uh, calling in to talk about a concern I have about the opening of our democracy. A friend told me that they had looked at the uh, city council agenda a couple weeks ago, and uh, staff had recommended that the public comment on uh, the development issues downtown not be allowed because that would save something like three months of time. Sorry, I'm hearing an echo and I'm not sure what to do about it. Um, so I just wanted to say that if restaurants are open for takeout, we need to have our democracy open. The city council needs to please stop truncating and ending the public involvement in our own government. It's absolutely essential in our representative democracy that we have fairness and balance in terms of participation. So I just wanted to say that because although there's another issue I'd like to speak on, and I was trying to choose which one to talk about, 
I just think that if our democracy doesn't open up, we won't be able to do things like, for example, protest the bear cat that, that many of us did not want, that former police chief, uh, I believe his name is Clark, sort of ushered into the city, and we hardly even found out about it. But we did find out about it because we were present at a city council meeting. And so what I'm asking for is for city officials to do the right thing, to do the eth ethical thing, and to, and to stop shutting down our democracy. Thank you very much. My name is Elise Casby, and I'm a democracy activist in Santa Cruz. Thank you. Okay, uh, I know one of the hands up is for um, item 36. I have phone number ending in 1263. If you are here for item 36, please unraise your hand by putting by pressing star nine. If you're here for oral communications, press star six. Looks like you're unmuted. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Wendy King, and I'm a board member for the Seniors Council of Santa Cruz and San Benito Counties, which is, runs the Area Agency on Aging for Santa Cruz and San Benito Counties, which includes Meals on Wheels, Senior Network Services, Senior Legal Services, Falls Prevention, foster grandparents and senior companion program, as well as some others, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And first, I'd like to invite everybody to the launch of the California Master Plan for Aging, which will be on May 19th, which at 10 a.m. on Zoom. And everybody's invited. I've sent the mayor a copy of the invitation. And second, I'd like to just mention that one of the programs that Senior Council runs is the Scout Program for Tax Assistance, Free Tax Assistance for Seniors and People with Disabilities. And it used to be funded by all four cities. Scout has brought in one to almost $2 million a year to right back into the pockets of seniors in our county. And this year, there are new tax credits available, but you need to have filed your taxes. And Scout, unfortunately, because of COVID, but also because it was not funded by the Santa Cruz City Council core funding program, because poverty alleviation is not a goal. So I would love to see that change. The third item I just wanted to mention is that the Live Oak Senior Center, which has been running since Ellen Baskin endowed it to be a county senior center. Go ahead and finish. It's running senior network services and is the kitchen for Meals on Wheels. And the Live Oak School System would like to take over the center. And we need to discuss how to accommodate everybody in our community. So please come to the launching of the California Master Plan for Aging. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, the last person I see um, for oral communications would be 8633. And again, this is not uh, for item 36. So go ahead and unmute yourself. And this is oral communications. Thank you. Hi, I apologize. I tried to lower my hand, but star nine evidently did not function that way. Okay, no worries. Um, it's no worries on at all. We'll okay, now we know we're done. Okay, it looks like we've reached the end of oral communications. Thank you for everybody's patience and getting through that. Um, someday I hope we will all be done with Zoom. Um, so we'll go ahead and open up um, our agenda item number 36 now which is regulations for temporary outdoor living. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Um, and if you are interested in commenting on regulations for temporary outdoor living, you will press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Um, we will have public comment um, after uh, some deliberation in the near term. Um, 
I do want to make um, it clear that for public comment, we will have just be allowing one minute tonight. So um, uh, I just want to announce that. So um, I do have some uh, folks signed up for extra time. Um, and those folks, I will read your names off after a few statements and we will get you queued up for that. You will all have three minutes each and then we'll move into public comment. Uh, tonight, this item, uh, the Temporary Outdoor Living Ordinance, as it's known, otherwise known as TOLO in our community, um, is up for discussion this evening. And I just have a couple of opening comments, um, and then I will um, open it up actually for public comment fairly quickly tonight. So before turning this to staff, um, I've actually asked them to, um, to actually not present tonight um, and to be available for questions for council um, as we move forward and as we move through public comment. Um, our staff has been working on this, um, as everyone knows, um, for several months. Um, and I just wanna recognize their work to date on a very difficult public policy matter. Um, but I also want to, more importantly tonight, recognize that the really the hundreds of voices that the council has heard from in the past month on the temporary outdoor living ordinance. And it is very clear to me that we have not gotten this right. And I believe we all see value in acknowledging that up front this afternoon, this early evening. Um, and just reflect that this is a very difficult policy to develop and that there has been a lot of confusion generated in the efforts so far. And uh, I just want to apologize to our community for that. And I really want to also thank our community for speaking out and getting involved. Um, I have been very public in my statements and meetings with literally hundreds of residents in the past few weeks that I think we need to stop this ordinance tonight and develop an ordinance that is much more clear for our community to understand and our staff to manage. Uh, these are both two things key to the success of what we're attempting to do. After talking literally with hundreds of folks, um, I believe that the need for an ordinance is not in question. Uh, in fact, conditions are extreme and acute in our community and hundreds of folks have told me as such. Um, our framework of provision of uh, identified program services with restrictions on outdoor living seems to have significant support in the community. Uh, we, I've talked with folks a lot about sort of the program service end of the temporary outdoor living ordinance and, and, and there, is, um, there is support for and understanding that we do have to provide places for people to sleep, um, places for people to store their items during the day, um, and the dignity of being able to access these sites um, in a reasonable time frame, and that those sites should be safe and provide hygiene, et cetera. Um, so since in the last few weeks, um, I continue to have continued to work with my colleagues, Council Member Watkins and Council Member Colantari Johnson on um, a new proposed approach, um, moving away from temporary living ordinance. And um, I'd like to share a little bit of that framework now and uh, have Bonnie put that up. And the reason I'm doing this is because I know many people are here tonight to really talk about the temporary outdoor living ordinance. And I wanna be clear that um, I don't believe that that is a direction this council um, is uh, looking at as a viable thing to move forward with. So I do just wanna put this up um, and its approach really, again, goes back to providing the main things that were attempted in the, in the um, temporary outdoor living ordinance. And that is the acknowledgement that we should be pri prioritizing and setting up these um, adequate shelter and safe sleeping locations programs on city owned properties, not adjacent to residential areas or schools, um, and that that 150 safe sleeping spots could be um, part of a variety of infrastructure that already exists in the city, including uh, River Street Shelter, 1220 River Street, and other city facilities and parking lots. Secondly, would be to look at restrictions on daytime encampments with implementation of the daytime storage program. And then third would be enforcement, um, finally, after uh, establishing the safe sleeping programs that are operational that we would move towards 
um, additional um, restrictions uh, citywide. Uh, I want to just have that available. Um, I wanna recognize that I can't make a motion tonight um, to necessarily define this direction and, and get it open for um, council deliberation. Um, but I do wanna just, just be very transparent with my um, colleagues that uh, a temporary out, outdoor living ordinance I don't believe is viable any longer. And uh, I just wanna be really respectful of people's time um, in terms of engaging with us on public comment. Um, and finally, I'll just close that um, we, your, your comments and your involvement and your discussion about this issue that is affecting Santa Cruz, but really it, cities around the country um, was very helpful and meaningful for me, at least over the last few weeks to really talk with folks um, and I do believe that the one thing I heard is that, um, and it was consistent across all neighborhoods and business areas that I discussed um, this with, is that um, there is agreement, I believe, at the community level that we have to do something, that um, the conditions as everyone see, now sees is just not um, what our community's values are and people do wanna see relief for the folks that are living that way but also are very clear on um, the values that you know, they need to have in their own spaces, in their own neighborhoods, near their schools, in terms of um, how we live together more um, you know, proactively together across all public areas um, and within our, within our private properties and neighborhoods and, and businesses. So um, what I've asked um, our staff to do is not present tonight because I do wanna actually just get into public comment um, and uh, I just wanted to open up with that to be clear on where things are heading. And uh, so I'm gonna go right into public comment and then we will have deliberation uh, with council following that. So um, let me just get myself queued up here since my computer is acting very strange tonight. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and open this up for public comments. We're gonna start with um, the extra time request this evening. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have seven folks. I will be giving them each three minutes and they will be going in this order. So those folks who have asked for extra time, please be ready to unmute yourself um, as, as soon as the person in front of you has um, gone. Uh, so first off will be Tom Brown from Seabright Strong, then Brad Angel from Grant Park Neighbors, Sonia McMor Moran, McMoran from Midtown Businesses, Donna Rose Gardner from um, the B40 Soquel Businesses, Serge Cagno from Stepping Up Santa Cruz, Joy Schendenlecker from Sanitation for the People, and Robert Norse from Huff. Um, and again, um, we will go into public comment and then um, we will deliberate following that. So I will uh, be looking Mayor, for- Mayor, we're yes. gonna have a hard time with that because not everybody has, some people just called in, so there's no way for me to know who's who. Okay. So there are a couple people I see, they rename themselves and I can see who they are. Yeah, I see Tom Brown. Okay, so I will just call up the name and I don't know how to get people to r not raise their hands. It doesn't seem to be working, Bonnie, so I'm not quite sure how to facilitate that. Well, I, I mean, I can lower all the hands right now if you want, but they're gonna get raised again, so. I, okay, let's go with Tom Brown. First, Tom, I see you by name, so go ahead, please. Great, thank you, Mayor. Um, let me start by thanking you for all of your time and uh, energy on this uh, and uh, willingness to listen to the community. Uh, I also wanna thank you for your clear vision and understanding of the problems with the original ordinance, uh, which were significant, and your support of the city's neighborhoods. Um, I urge the rest of the council to uh, uh, follow and support the proposal that you just outlined. I think it would be a good answer, uh, one that would be uh, protective of our neighborhoods and consistent with Martin v. Boise. I think the original ordinance uh, was 
poorly conceived. Uh, it was lacking in enforcement. Uh, it endangered neighborhoods. It would have negatively impacted our local businesses. Uh, in short, it wouldn't have fixed anything and it would have redirected our homelessness problem into our neighborhoods. Uh, and I think that's been recognized and uh, we appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, I think uh, your alternative where it's uh, very narrowly tailored in terms of where camping would be permitted, uh, so long as that's coupled with uh, a ban on camping or temporary outdoor living in the rest of the city is something that uh, Seabright Strong would support uh, and that we would accept as a reasonable solution to uh, the problem. So uh, let me thank you again for uh, all the time and effort and the opportunity to speak. Uh, and again, uh, representing all of Seabright Strong. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Next up, I'll go, um, I actually, next up, I will go with Brad Angel. Um, uh, okay. Uh, Bonnie, do you see a name up for Brad at all? I, I don't. Okay. I see Serge, if you want to do. Yeah, okay. Serge, why don't you go ahead, please? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Serge. Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Serge Cagno. Um, I have do some consulting for the homeless and help set up the vet hall shelters. Um, at this time, um, having an ordinance um, when River Street Shelter, uh, 32 beds, is going to be closing soon, when the two vet halls are also going to be closing within the next few months, when the second group of the Association of Faith Community is gonna be closing. We're gonna have a lot more people on the streets. Uh, 150 sleep sites is absolutely not enough. Um, and as I think everybody understands, trying to enforce this and force people into certain areas that they're not gonna understand and not gonna to wanna to do, there's gonna be a lot of pushback. It's just not gonna be effective. Uh, our city has great uh, uh, emphasis and support for marginalized and minority populations. We got Black Lives Matter printed across the street. We have large support for LGBTQIA groups. We have a parade for MLK Day. But Martin Luther King also said a lot of things about uh, helping the poor and helping the homeless. So uh, at this time, I think that the ordinance should not just be changed for allowing for that sleeping, the sleeping and the storage, but a lot more sleeping sites that are actually um, accessible and um, will keep people from having confrontations with law enforcement. Um, I thank you for trying to help this problem, um, but a lot of people that are in this problem are not. Um, doing it because they're criminals. A lot of people are just misfortunate and poor. Um, and I think that the, a more compassionate way will actually have a better effect for our city. So I thank everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, Bonnie, do you suggest I just go down the line or I'm not, I'm not really, I'm not kind of at a loss at how do I, how do we do yeah, this? I think you should just go down the line and I'll just adjust the time with whoever is in front of us. Okay, I see uh, Kathleen Smith is next. And if you're not one of these names, Brad Angel, Sonia Mer McMoran, Donna Gardner, Joyce Schumacher, or Robert Norris. Go ahead, Kathleen. Hi, am I unmuted? Yes. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, I live at 129 Mountain View Ave, and um, there's been just continuing problems in our neighborhood, as I know is the true is true throughout the the city, um, including assaults, um, human feces in the alleys, and a feeling of, of lack of safety being able to ambulate around the city. And um, I support the concept of um, of what you have proposed, Mayor. Um, the only exception that I would have is that there's no deadline on number three regarding enforcement. So without a date, um, you know, this could just continue on and on. And 
And um, I do support um, what you have proposed with that exception. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'm gonna go down. I see Sonia McMoran's on now. So Sonia, you are one of the folks who has that three minute time frame. Please go ahead and unmute and you can speak. Thank you. Press star, uh, press star nine, Sonia, and you'll be unmuted. There you go. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. sorry, thank you. Uh, my name is Sonia McMorin, and I own the retail shop Homework in Midtown, and I'm here representing the many businesses located in Midtown Santa Cruz. I think it comes as no surprise that no one wants where they live or do business to be demarcated as a camping zone, but many of us have been living with this reality for years. We already regularly move folks off sidewalks and clean up after the aftermath of overnight visitors, and I can tell you we need more support from our city and county. I have yet to find in this ordinance a distribution of resources to help sanitize and maintain the areas greenlit for overnight camping. I know that's changed uh, with some of the amendments that have happened to this ordinance. Uh, Midtown currently has no public restrooms and a single public garbage can. Our shop fronts, parking lots, and landscaping have become the only option for someone to relieve themselves of all manners of waste. If we are expected to allow people to camp overnight in our neighborhoods, the burden shouldn't be put on residences and businesses to clean up, maintain, and enforce these areas. This is the responsibility of our government. Homelessness, while magnified within our city limits, is at its core a county problem. The county needs to put into action real solutions to this humanitarian crisis. Asking people to move out every morning is not sustainable or realistic. We need affordable housing and shelters built, and we need them now. I really thank you for your time, and I thank you for listening to all of us throughout the past couple of weeks and making changes to this ordinance. Thank you. Next up, I have phone number ending in 5836. Hello, can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you state your name? Yeah, uh, my name is Jeff Watson. Um, I'm a homeowner in the Seabright area. Um, thank you for um, allowing me to have an opportunity to voice my opposition to the outdoor camping ordinance for Seabright. Um, I know that uh, homelessness is a, a big and difficult problem for Santa Cruz, but as a homeowner, um, it worries me um, having camping in uh, the area around uh, Seabright and going to the uh, go through to walk to the beach. Um, a lot of children play in that area, and there's the the gym that the young adults uh, climb at. And um, my wife and I frequent the Seabreeze Cafe and Ingford Pizza, and we just don't think that it would serve the greater community. Um, thank you so much for taking time to listen. Thank you. And uh, I've been corrected, I'm so sorry. Um, my agenda is telling, saying it's item 36, but I believe it's item 30, no it is, it's actually item 37. My, my script has it listed as 30, 36, so excuse me for everybody tonight. Okay, next up I have, um, let's see, we just did 5836. Uh, next up is 6231. You can um, unmute yourself by pressing star nine. Six, two, three, one. It's star six to unmute. Oh, I'm sorry, star six. Well, that's right. Star six to unmute yourself, please. Thank you. You're ready. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Rita Watson. Um, uh, I, uh, we are not hearing you now, though. I can hear her. Can anyone hear me? Okay, I, I can hear. Yeah, okay, go ahead, keep going, sorry. All right. 
I'm a homeowner here in Seabright also, and um, the homeless element, you're, you had originally thought about inviting into our neighborhood creates a significant hazard and unhealthy environment um, for our children and families. Um, wherever there's one or two tents, the population grows and it really the temporary outdoor living becomes a step towards permanent encampment until it needs to be bulldozed away, just like with the Ross camp. Um, it, it's a tough situation, the homelessness, and I do believe that um, we pay high taxes here and the, the city and the county need to pull it together and do something um, more permanent for the homeless and not push it into the neighborhood. Um, and I also, I doubt that council members would uh, want this in your neighborhood. Thank you. I appreciate your listening. Thank you very much. Okay, I do see that Joy Schendenlecker is online. And Joy, would you please go ahead and unmute and we'll have you go next. You do have three minutes. Unmute. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Hi. Um, I'm Joy Schendeldecker, and I'm speaking on behalf of Sanitation for the People. I'll also mention, because others have, that I'm a homeowner, and I live on the west side. Thank you, Mayor, Council members and staff, and thank you as well, Mayor Myers, for your apology. I appreciate that you led with that acknowledgement. Sanitation for the People continues to deepen our relationships with people living outside at Highway 1 and 9, and it has been overwhelmingly positive. I cannot stress this enough. It's all about relationships. People living outside are our neighbors. They are part of our community. Finding ways to live better together is a two-way street. As Serge said, we need more than 150 spaces for people to stay way more than 150 spaces. The need for transitional and self-managed camps with sanitation, waste management, storage services, uh, health services and other services and safety built in is more obvious than ever. One of the things that we hear over and over again from people living outside is that stability is one of the most important things for them to have a safe community to access services and to even think about working towards their next steps. So I think, to make it fair, that every district needs to host camps and safe parking. Districts could propose sites themselves um, after discussion amongst themselves or have them chosen for them. I also appreciate that we're scrapping TOLO and I think we need to start with building positives not imposing negatives, with true community-based collaboration, including with people who are experiencing homelessness themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, I have Jacqueline. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can hear you. Can hear you. Can hear you. Jack, yeah, Jacqueline, you'll have to, um, if you are streaming through a device or have your TV on, you're going to have to mute those. That's what that echoes from. Okay. I'm speaking through my iPad. Is that okay? Can you hear me now? You're doing great. Yep. Go ahead, please. Okay. First of all, I just want to say that I support the mayor's proposal. I, I live in the Seabright neighborhood. I'm a homeowner. I've been here for about 40 years in this neighborhood. I understand that there are different types of people who are homeless. Some are poor, some are down on their luck, and some would be grateful for any help. There are other people who are leaving hypodermic needles, human feces, who are robbing, and those are the people that have the neighbors up in arms. We want to feel safe in our homes. So that's all I have to say, and I support the mayor's proposal. Thank you. Next up, I have Kathy. Please press star six. 
You have one minute. Hi. Uh, so my name is Kathy Miller, and I'm the office manager. Wait. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yep. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Kathy Miller, and I'm the office manager at MJA Vineyards. Uh, with comments limited to one minute, I wanted to implore the city council to vote no on TOLO as currently formulated for the west side of Santa Cruz. For Ingle Street, Swiss Street, and Fair Avenue businesses, we have been hit hard by the last year of COVID restrictions. This new ordinance, as it currently stands, will further hurt the businesses that pay taxes to Santa Cruz, hurt the businesses that bring in tourism to Santa Cruz, and hurt businesses that just want to keep their employees safe and their patrons safe. I've personally had my own property stolen, dealt with vandalism and mutilation of the property of the company I work for, and I've had uncomfortable encounters with people who need substance abuse and mental health support who, after calling the overburdened police force here, still do not receive help. MJ Vineyards wants the solution for Santa Cruz to Martin versus Boise, but we do not want it to hurt the West Side residents and businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is phone number ending in 1041. Hi, my name is Carrie Peterson, and I am pleased to have heard from the mayor tonight on the proposal to scrap TOLO. That is a, such a relief. Um, and the only reason why I stayed on the call at this point is to just express and echo the concerns um, of neighborhoods who would have been impacted by this substantially, especially ours, which is in the Seabright area that's uh, mixed zoning. It's part commercial, part residential, and it would have allowed um, campers and 10 campers on our street that's primarily all residential. And so that would have been an impact. And I also want to echo the um, commercial businesses that are trying to reopen after such a huge impact with COVID. I think that it's important that we recognize that um, we need our economy to get started again. Um, and we need to keep our, our community safe. Um, and so I'm appreciative of hearing the mayor's plan and just want to um, echo the concerns of my neighbors. Thanks. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, phone number ending in 5736. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Daniela Reggie. I am a new homeowner and live in Seabright. Um, I'm really happy that uh, Mayor Meyer has a new proposal and I await the future declarations and I hope that means that this uh, current TOLO will be repealed. Um, as a public servant, I understand the challenges that are being faced, um, but I'm worried about the city's path forward, in particular if the city elects to file uh, a notice of categorical exclusion. Any action on this topic is going to have significant impacts on the environment and it requires public notice and comment before a vote. It's also a matter of respect, transparency, professionalism, and public duty. Um, the original TOLO had focused a lot on sleeping space, but the Martin decision focuses on indoor shelter. So a city can't manage time, place, and manner if it doesn't have adequate housing, because to do so continues to criminalize status. So the Martin holding is unambiguous, and it's not new. New York City's done this since 1979. So I just, I just hope the city is thoughtful and transparent in its new approach. Thank you. Uh, I have a phone number ending in 4931. Please go ahead, press star six to unmute. Hey, can you hear me? We can. Awesome. Uh, registered nurse, lower ocean neighbor here calling. Just to remind you all that um, camping bans, which these new recommendations still seem to be, defy recommendations from Department of Justice, HUD, American Medical Association and the American Public Health Association. All of these entities unequivocally condemn policies like TOLO and these new recommendations that criminalize homelessness. We have substantial research that I've emailed to all of you um, that shows how criminalizing homelessness is expensive and at best ineffective, uh, but more often actively harms people who are in housed as well as worsening public health by spreading people around town with no resources. Um, you 
must reject this ordinance and all the criminalizing aspects of the new recommendation. Um, I implore you to use actual critical thinking, creativity, and research evidence to create productive and not punitive solutions that have proven over and over again to be expensive and to not work. Thank you. We're on to item, or excuse me, phone number 7450, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Okay, great. My name is Jeff Traugott. Um, I happen to live in the Seabright area, also behind the grocery outlet, and then also um, the distinction of working on Mission Street, uh, we, we call it Mission Street Extension, but between Swift and Western or Natural Bridges. And we've been kind of dealing with the problem of people camping for a long time, so I really do appreciate the new idea, and I hope um, something uh, everybody takes that in consideration and makes some changes because uh, the original, as I call it, blue zone camping idea just wasn't working for us. Um, I think it's, uh, uh, we all want to help, and I've been helping a lot on the front lines of people who have been living on Mission Street Extension for the entire 30 years I've been doing business here, and there's just a lot of different kinds of people, so I just uh, want you to take that in consideration. Some people um, really want to try to get off the streets, and some people don't. So thanks so much. I really appreciate all you guys do. Thank you very much. Next up is phone number 2397. My name is Corey Houston. I live in Midtown and have been a homeowner here for 30 years, and I grew up in Santa Cruz County, so I've been in this area for 59 years total. And thank you for coming up with a, a proactive um, proposals to deal with a really, really challenging and complicated problem. And I am just calling in to give my support to the mayor's proposal that she put forth today. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up is 8633. Go ahead and press star six and we'll be able to hear you. Hi. Uh, I am a homeowner who is who has an understanding of addiction and mental illness. Uh, these homeless are not campers. Campers respect their setting, their environment. The majority of this population behave criminally and destructively and are not reaching to change their addictive lifestyles. You are the stewards of 14 square miles of a rare and majestic slice of California. We do not have the luxury to allow nor encourage growth of this population. We must limit all programs that attract addicts and criminals. Existing not-for-profits must be held accountable. There must be investigations into their finances and program management. Any breach of agreement should result in loss of license. Your law-abiding citizens and businesses are done. Limit all programs that attract addicts and criminals. The sacred setting demands restoration and protection. If you limit the program, the populations will decrease. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Heather. Go ahead, Heather, press star six to unmute yourself. Heather, we can't hear you. Uh, please press star six to unmute yourself. Heather, we'll come back to you where we can't hear you, so we'll move on to phone number ending in 1461. There you go, we're ready. Yeah, I want to thank you very, very much, Donna, for listening to us and uh, coming up with a new, uh, yeah, total, so to speak. 
Um, I think one of the important parts is that good solutions can come out of co-working with the community. And you have shown that, and I want to thank you. And I'm a Lower Seabright East Side resident. And um, one of the things that happened was that nobody even came to look at our area to see what space was available and uh, the, the kind of setting. So more transparency, more co-working would be just absolutely lovely because it does bring high caliber solutions. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, next up is uh, Kyle Kelly, please. Hey, thank you. I think I think I see where things are going. So I just want to point out. I think we hopefully all of Santa Cruz is at a point that they realize that we can't keep clearing encampments every year on the same thing and not creating enough adequate housing, not just shelter. I mean, beyond that, giving giving people permanent options. Um, I just I want everyone to reflect on everything they've been up in arms on over the past however many decades, and they could look to see what else we can do to provide enough services, shelter, and permanent housing for people. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, I have phone number ending in 3983, please. Press star six to be unmuted. Can you, can you hear me? We can, go ahead, please. Okay, I'm John Allison, I'm a resident of Seabright. Um, I've lived here for about nine years. I pay, uh, you know, I live in modest housing and I, I pay almost $16,000 in taxes, city taxes a year. Um, I am happy to hear that the mayor is reconsidering and the whole council is reconsidering this. When you look at the city plat and look at how many acres of accessible area that, that there are that are owned by the city to work with to find adequate housing for these challenged folks, there's over 350 acres to work with. So I appreciate uh, the city and the council reconsidering this. And also relative to resources and funds, look at better ways to use some of this unused property. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, Sabina Holber, please. I mean, sorry, I accidentally lowered her hand. Let me find her again. Okay. There she is. Hey there, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, my name is Sabina. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz. Uh, I was raised here. I'm raising my kids here. Um, this is where we're going to live. And so I just want to have it be said, it's Tolo really felt like a mean-spirited ordinance. I'm happy to hear that you agree it's untenable. I know that you've been getting an earful from your constituents on all sides of the political spectrum here, and this should be a huge wake-up call to how wrong-headed Tolo was. I ask that any new framework you, you have prioritize humanizing our houseless community with compassion instead of prioritizing the police budget. I beg of you to allocate more money for services such as shelters, trash pickup, needle exchanges, and transitional encampments instead of to SDPD. I also want to point out that some of the more disgusting things I've heard from the council in recent history is that we need to protect children from seeing our houseless community members. This is a QAnon type save the children argument, and it's really disheartening to hear certain members of the council peddling sort these sorts of statements. I'm not sure if there's any evidence to back up these fears, but I beg of you to legislate not out of fear, but with compassion. Next up is phone number ending in 8186. Am I on you? Uh, can you hear me now? We can hear you, yes, please go ahead. My name is Joan Quilter. I don't own a home in Seabright. I've been here 20 years as a resident in uh, the Sutherland's Park Apartments. It's a senior apartment building, and I'm, I, I can safely say I'm speaking on behalf of many of our residents who are seniors, and I know we're at ground zero across the street from San Lorenzo Park, and I know there's a federal injunction that hasn't been lifted, may never be lifted, so that 
drug addicts can stay in the park. So things have gotten to a point where if you walk through the park, you can see them shooting up all the time. And they are criminal elements in there, plus uh, mentally ill. I think before we even get to affordable housing for all these people, we'll need a mental hospital, and I'm serious about that, a mental hospital. And, and for all the homeowners in the Seabright area, do not send your children to San Lorenzo Park to play. Thank you. Thank you. We have number ending in eight, excuse me, four eight four four. So, members of the community, it appears that um, we now have Mayor Myers sort of leading the charge for the NIMBYs of Santa Cruz, but I mean, this really isn't anything new. And this TOLA ordinance has always been a blind, and what's really going on, it continues to go on with the police department using other ordinances to circumvent basic civil rights for homeless people, which has been Santa Cruz's, unfortunately, signature for decades. And I speak as one who's lived here and around here for decades. Uh, a number of good proposals have come up, such as the districts themselves propose uh, areas, and each district should be proposing. That was Joy's proposal, a camping area or a sleeping zone. But the real issue for those of us who uh, don't want to see the homeless swept away, which is really what this NIMBY uprising is about, all despite of all the nice talk about, oh, well, we don't, oh, just not in our neighborhood, you know, that's the standard line that you hear everywhere. Uh, what you really need is some protection for homeless people now and immediate resources to, to what they have, which is not affordable housing, which is not even decent shelter, but it is tents that they themselves provide or they get help from private individuals with those tents. That's what they have. That's where they're at. That's where they have to be and their needs have to be addressed. And that's where the problems have to be looked at. Uh, bogus statistics and inflammatory crap about children being in danger and because some people are nervous in their houses and have their ocean views and their property values challenged, they should sacrifice human life and welfare of poorer people outside is to me really a kind of a, a really fundamental obscenity we have here. So it's resistance, what I'm saying to those listening who care about this, like we saw in San Lorenzo Park, like we saw in the Riverside, which stopped the removal of RVs, like we've seen in Chico and Sausalito, that's what stops this kind of stuff. Not the good wishes and the, and the sweet talk of Mayor Myers and her very, very bigoted NIMBY council with a, with a tiny minority on the council that uh, does dissent, but not terribly strongly or well. Um, proposed is a barbed wire fence area at 1220 River Street and a gravel lot for 60 people and a bunch on 150 sites. There are hundreds and hundreds of people outside now that need to be at least acknowledged, and that's the, the way to do that is to pay attention to them as human beings who have the need to take a crap, the need to have a, a drinking fountain or water somewhere nearby, a trash disposal. If you don't do this, and then you scream at they're crazy and you, they're evil and they're dirty and they're filthy, you are creating these problems. And this is what Santa Cruz has been doing for a very, very long time long time. So don't be fooled by the fact that the TOLA ordinance is being suddenly unilaterally withdrawn by Mayor Myers. You know, if she'd listened to, to Drew Glover a year, two years ago, we wouldn't be in this situation. There would be transitional campgrounds. Think about that. Next up, I have phone number ending in 2480. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, quickly, thank you very much for the revised proposal. My name is Carol Walker, and I'd like to speak to item number two in this new proposal, just that you consider um, that the placement of any daytime storage facility also not be placed in residential neighborhoods. That's all, thanks so much. Thank you. Next up, I have Lou Albert.
go ahead and press star six and you should be able to speak. Lou Albert's up next. If you press star six, you should be able to speak. Hi, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Go ahead, please. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, I uh, appreciate the difficulties of this challenge. I live in the lower Seabright uh, area. I have a home there. And I am concerned about the way the TOLA ordinance was originally drawn up. It, uh, we have a great community. Uh, many of those businesses have just invested a substantial amount of money to make it uh, quite a nice area. I think that that would be obviously diminished. But more importantly, I'm concerned about safety. Um, not too long ago, we had someone who decided to camp out underneath our upper deck to our house. And he was, uh, I believe, mentally ill and um, a drug, uh, he was hooked on drugs. And uh, he decided to start a campfire. And if we hadn't caught him in time, he would have burned down the house with us in it. So these uh, decisions have real consequences. So I uh, hope that you uh, find a managed solution to the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is John Artupovich. Hello, can you, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes, please go ahead. Hi there, um, I'm John Artukovich. I'm the general manager of a small business on the west side of Santa Cruz. So if the proposed ordinance were to pass for the west side for TOA, um, this would directly threaten uh, not only the safety, but the livelihoods of myself, our staff, and our neighbors. As written, it would allow many people with severe mental uh, issues, with uh, violence, with mental health, with substance abuse, to camp freely without recourse, during our business hours of operations. Our staff, our neighbors all across the west side and our patrons would not feel safe here as untold numbers of people would potentially be allowed to pitch tents across our street while during business hours. We would implore you to reconsider any decision to allow any kind of permanent overnight camping solution on the west side of Santa Cruz. We're not opposed to creating a, a nighttime camping area on city property but the west side is not the place for this. We would just urge the council respectfully to choose a location with a less catastrophic impact on the community. Thank you. Next up is Abby. Susie O'Hara did a wonderful presentation years ago after she traveled to several houseless encampments in Oregon and Washington. One of the key components for a successful managed type camp was getting buy-in from the neighborhoods. Even Andy Mills knows how to get buy-in from neighbors for the safe parking program he has at the police parking lot. So let's see if I get this right. First, you push this ordinance through, even though your own city council member Cummings said to hold off and wait for pu more public input, yet you ignored it. Hundreds of letters were written saying they agreed with all the wording of the ordinance. Were you hoping that they wouldn't read the actual wording? Then you meet with people after you pass the ordinance. Any idiot would have seen the writing on the wall that NIMBYs would rebel once they read the actual wording. You failed. You should step down. You wasted our tax dollars. Perhaps you can look at implementing your well thought out five year plan that staff developed about six years ago. Look at Susie O'Hara's approach. Um, by the way, there are people who are houseless who do have night jobs. What are they gonna do? Not sleep during the day or the night? Please do not criminalize our houseless population. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 6830. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we are. 
Yes, we do. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm a Seabright resident of, of, of 25 years. My husband's family has lived here since the 1850s, um, and we're, we've been homeowners for about the last 15 years in, in the Seabright area. Um, quite honestly, I've come around to some of the TOLO goals. Um, as a Seabright resident, I'm 100% against residential and commercial camping. And at the same time, I understand um, that any new plan needs to address the key needs of the drug culture in Santa Cruz, and I mean the meth and the heroin, and recriminalizing that um, while also managing to help folks at the same time. Um, and secondly, to make it more uncomfortable to come here to camp and live like they are in Pogonip and other areas. So I think that this makes Santa Cruz a destination at an alarmingly, increasingly increasing rates and focusing on the drugs and the mass encampments, which I appreciate that TOLO is trying to do, um, needs to happen so that we can move forward. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 7917. Hi, can you hear me? Hello, hi. Yeah, um, I'm a homeowner and I live on the west side and I just uh, wanted to say I'm, I'm glad that city council is tackling this homeless problem. Uh, that's not an easy solution. Um, I wanted to point out that there is a group called Footbridge Services that they've been providing showers, laundry, digital charging stations, clothing, storage for personal belongings for um, people in need and it gives unhoused people the dignity of services that they lack. And I just wanted to point out that Footbridge Services currently receives no public funding that I know of, and they rely on volunteers and donations. But I think this model could be done as a public-private partnership, and it would be worth replicating in other neighborhoods as part of the overall solution. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, I have Wyatt Hull. My name is Wyatt and I live in Seabright and I'm a lifelong resident of Santa Cruz County. I'd like to thank the mayor for meeting with our neighborhood. I, along with my partner Savannah, support the mayor's plan amendments to the ordinance and would strongly encourage the city council as well as members of the community to lobby the county and state for both the financial and legal resources to create safe and sustainable solutions to this problem as Santa Cruz is bearing an unequal burden per capita in contrast to other cities and counties in California. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is phone number nine, sorry, 0241. Hi, my name is Carrie Dunlay. I also live in the Seabright area. Um, I'm just going to echo one of the points that somebody made earlier, or maybe a couple people made earlier that encouraging, you know, having programs that encourage this uh, kind of behavior in our city doesn't help. I know it's a very difficult uh, task that lies in front of you, and I do feel for these people, a lot of them, not a lot of them, but there are people who park around our park at Seabright and stay the night there quite often that are um, in bad situations, and I feel for them and they've been very respectful. Um, but anyway, back to my original point is, we don't wanna encourage people to, to be living, you know, doing drugs and supplementing their habits so they wanna to come to Santa Cruz. We wanna help them rise up. And thank the last you. words I said was rise up instead of bring them down. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have next is phone number ending in 9532. Hi, my name is, is Soren Whiting and I'm a student at UC Santa Cruz uh, advocating against the implementation of a TOLA ordinance. Uh, this just really just lacks compassion and it's really, it's, it's a, it's following a trend that we've always seen the city trying to do of criminalizing the homeless population and those in uh, horrible economic situations. And it's so obvious and it's cruel. And you should really, you should really rethink about what you're doing here because a lot of people's lives, uh, my friends' lives, 
are, are, are really going to be impacted by this. And I just, I hope you really, really think about the, the lack of compassion that comes with even proposing something like this. So I thank you for your time, and I really hope that you actually uh, think about taking some compassion actions in the future, because this is, this is just awful. Thank you. Next up, I have uh, Jane. You've already spoken. I've got Elliot. Jane did not speak. She she started to an oral communication. Okay, go ahead, Jane. I actually already did speak. Uh, yeah, I thought it was you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She. Um, her I have to be said. fair. I have to be fair. <laughs> I know your voice, Jane. Um, Elliot, please. You're next. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so I am speaking to you to vehemently oppose this ordinance. Criminalizing camping and closing down shelters leaves unsheltered people in Santa Cruz with only one place to go without fear of citation or arrest, the city-managed camp. An ICE, an ICE child concentration camp opening in neighboring Monterey County is a stark reminder that using camps to remove undesirables from view is not hypothetical in the United States, not even in the liberal Monterey Bay. While a managed camp is nowhere near the cruelty of an ICE camp, it is still a means of removing a population from view. Gentrification and anti-homeless ordinances are directly tied to each other, and Tolo coincides with the wave of luxury apartment complexes being built. Gentrification further raising rent will be devastating to the people of Santa Cruz. The conflict here is not housed versus homeless, it's those to whom housing is a lucrative commodity against everybody else. A 2020 California Housing Partnership study states that Santa Cruz rent is $40 an hour to afford the average month rent. Most Americans can consider make jobs. So, um, m m Santa Cruz residents currently owe five million in utilities, a fact that is unambiguously tied to the economic havoc wrought by the pandemic and not to mental illness. These figures tangibly show economic causes of homelessness that is ex exist irrespective of mental health status. Homeless okay. people are not the enemy. Thank you, sir. Okay, next up is uh, Anna Paula. Anna Paula, please. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very curious to know how an idea like that comes about. I mean, how fast did you come up with this? But it would have been so nice to have um, have a chance to talk before this ordinance just simply passes, you know? And But anyways, it's, it's too late for that. I want to know now, how can we do and move towards action? You know, like this is a beautiful conversation we're having right now. How do we create a space, a group where mindful, compassionate, creative minds get together to create, to co-create with the city? Because we have people from different, like people that really hate the whole idea and some people that love the idea. How do we come up with solutions and then figure out, is there a space where we can sit together and just start brainstorming? Because we have a bunch of creative people here and a lot of people that actually want to put money into, you know, it's a tiny house. How do we prevent people that, you know, just lost their job to get into homelessness, all those things. And then of course the entail, which is people showing themselves the drugs, which they don't want to do. But, where do we go from now? Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have phone number ending in 6392. Hi. Uh, this is Samantha Zenek. I've lived in Santa Cruz this round for 12 years, and I was at some meeting the other day on the west side with um, the mayor. I want to appreciate the mayor for understanding that this version, this ordinance, is not going to work the way that it was written, or even with the amendments. Um, I do want to go back to something I said before and haven't heard anyone talk about. I think that, um, as we all know, this is not just Santa Cruz's issue and that the governor should be encouraged, pressure should be put on him to declare a state of emergency in regards to our houseless population in the state of California and that federal funds should be directed towards California. Um, that this just shouldn't be just us alone trying to sort this out. So I just want to put that out there and that maybe folks can start to direct their energy um, in, in that way as well. And then I also want to say that in terms of what's been happening, 
I would encourage uh, consideration of a pilot program. I think alternative, one of the alternatives, maybe alternative number one, mentioned that in the ordinance, um, but it would be good to kind of test things out. And then also a long-term uh, view and solution. And um, I second just what folks had said before about properties, government properties, um, and that obviously 150 spots will not be enough space and that people need to have sanitation, water, and trash and everything, you know, that make okay. it as dignified as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is phone number ending in 8141. I just want to let you know that I am a home, homeowner in this community and so are my parents and I actually will be I'm a manager of a business that's going to be involved right next door to where the homeless are allowed to live and that's going to not only ruin our business I have been attacked by homeless they have broken my cars and I feel that there is no advocate for people that work so many hours between my family and I we work about $200 a week, and we're talking to retired people and to non-retired people, and we barely can afford to live here. Why do we have to worry about our safety in our own hometown and community? Can't we do something that puts them in an area, or also can't people recognize when they can't afford to move in? Like, I know so many people that live in other states now because they wanted to have multiple children, which is great, but they recognize what they can afford. And yes, it's very expensive to live with an ocean view. And I feel that the homeless so far, there are many that are down and out, but the ones that are violent aren't being addressed. And I feel that the ones that are down and out should get some type of rights, but the ones that are breaking in our cars, stealing our things, attacking us, making it where we're scared to walk home at night is a problem, and we're not talking about that. Instead, we're just talking about their safety, not ours. Not our safety, just theirs. Thank you. Next is Stacy Falls. Hi there, I just wanted to briefly say that I am opposed to any law or ordinance that criminalizes the basic human need of sleeping. We all wanna live in nice places, but high property values is not a basic human need. Sleeping is. Thank you. Next up is 6074. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hello. We can hear you. Hello, my name my name is Grace Castile and I strongly oppose the TOLO. Instead, I hope for policy that treats the unhoused communities in Santa Cruz as human beings and valuable members of the community instead of criminalizing poverty and other issues that need to be addressed. Thank you very much. Next up is Daphna. I think Daphna lowered her hand. Okay. 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 Um, I see. Let's see. Jane is gone. I think we're down to one one uh, one person now. Yes. Nine zero nine one, please. Can you hear me? Hi. I, my name's. Okay, my name's Melissa. I've lived in Santa Cruz for over 30 years, and I also recommend a pilot program because from what I've seen over the years, when we have made efforts to provide housing or shelter regions for campers, they've been mostly rejected because people don't want to live in those types of regulated shelters. They prefer to be on their own because there are rules that must be followed. And I do not think that living in a neighborhood as a camping solution is smart. I don't think that there's any screening of sex offenders who typically would need to be regulated by cities if they're going to be living in neighborhoods like that. So unless there's controls in place to ensure that the neighbors are safe and that there is regular authority checking through that and screening people, I think it's a really, really weak 
excuse for housing people. And this is a very expensive area. Everybody knows that. Not everyone can afford to live here. That's a fact. Everyone in the country knows that. It's all over the place. So that's not like something that's news to anybody. That's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, uh, Daphna, you're up next. Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi there. Yes, my name is Daphna and um, I think it's inappropriate to allow any camping um, anywhere someone would like in the city, whether it be our beaches, our streets, our sidewalks, our front lawn. As a previous caller had mentioned, um, it's completely inappropriate that we encourage or allow programs um, within our city that attract people who are not willing to be good citizens, who are not willing to live by our laws. Um, if I went out to the beach right now and started a fire, um, the state um, ranger would be right on me to, to not allow me to do it. But I often see um, other people out there who are having fires. Um, indeed, there are exceptions um, to those um, who lost their homes. And yes, we should help those. Um, and that's why I support the mayor in that TOLO is not the right thing, but we need to have a program where we can um, I'm going to really help those who are in need. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I just want to announce for folks who are, we the last phone number tonight will be 4871. We've filled all of our slots. Uh, so next up will be Sandy. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my name is um, Sandy Lawton and I have lived in the Seabright area off and on for over 50 years. I've owned my house since I was 21 and I'm 74 now. So um, I'm very attached to this area. I came back here 12 years ago to retire. And it really makes me crazy that I now don't feel safe in my own neighborhood. And this would make it even more so. Um, to walk up to any of the local little restaurants, to get a cup of coffee in the morning, all those things that I moved back here to be able to do in this neighborhood. Um, if the TOLO is allowed to be enacted in the Seabright area, will make those things even more unsafe. And also I've worked with people with disabilities all my life and I think there are some ADA problems with blocking sidewalks and public right-of-ways with tents. Um, and that's all I have to say. I hope we can stop this. And I agree it'd be wonderful if we could find a way to convene with good ideas and find solutions. Thank you very much. Okay, the last caller tonight ends in uh, phone number 4871. I've got one, two, three, four, five more callers, and each of you will have one minute. 8494 is the next number, please. Caller ending in 8494. If you could press star six, you'll be unmuted. Hi, my name is Natasha Elliott. I'm a Seabright resident. I'm a homeowner, and I have a family here. Um, I was appalled by the TOLO ordinance, the proposal. I felt like there was a complete lack of community involvement. Um, I do want to say that I think I support the mayor's new proposal. However, I hope that it does not include the parking area with the Galt Street Library, which would be directly in front of me. Um, and I just wanted to say that the businesses that have been able to reopen now they're barely making it. And to put something like a TOLO in neighborhoods where people are relying, not only business and homeowners are relying on places to go 
out of a terrible time for all of us, uh, this ordinance just, it was appalling. That's it. Thank you very much. Next up is caller ending in 7573. Go ahead, press star six to unmute yourself, please. If you press star six, you should be able to unmute yourself. Seven, five, seven, three. Go ahead, press star six to unmute yourself. Please. Hello? Yeah, hi. We can hear you. Hi. If you can turn your television down, you, we, we won't have that echo. Sure. Can you turn the television up? So, Donna Myers, our mayor of, mayor of Santa Cruz, thank you so much for coming to our meeting uh, the other day. We appreciate the fact that you are listening to us and you're hearing us. And I just want to say I really approve the new ordinance so that we can all be on the same page. We're not against homeless, we're against the homeless criminal. That's the problem that we have. But I want to say thank you again for coming out to Seabright and talking with all of us. We so appreciate it. That's it. Thank you. Next up, up high, I have Heather. Hello, my name is Heather Hutchison. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go okay. ahead. Okay, okay. Um, I'm not, I'm happy you're scrapping Tolo. I am also, uh, calling to say that I think it might be a nice idea to consider parking garages for a temporary camping where you could install porta potties with, kit, uh, not kitchens, with uh, sinks and garbage cans. They do need some place to go to the bathroom. This would be detrimental if we create any kind of camping that doesn't provide them a way to take care of themselves and have some dignity. Thank you for all you're doing. I know it's an impossible problem, and I appreciate all you're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have uh, DSA Santa Cruz. Uh, hi, my name is Lisa, uh, and I'm speaking uh, just on behalf of myself right now. Um, a common talking point that we hear is how people come to Santa Cruz because of our quote unquote amazing services. Uh, so first, as much as Andy Mills wants to deny the studies done by multiple groups, including by his own officers, 70% of our houseless community uh, lived here before losing their homes. People are not coming here because of some magical extra services. Those services don't exist. That's the entire reason there are so many people that are homeless here. We are lacking in affordable housing, we're lacking in safe camping spaces, we're lacking in shelter space, and are now losing one of the few that we actually have. We're lacking in drug rehabilitation and mental health care. Those are the reasons that there's hundreds of people who are without homes here. It's because of years of constant neglect by the city. If you wanna solve the homeless crisis, solve it with real solutions actually provide services and build some low-income housing rather than this onslaught of luxury apartments that are getting waved through one after another. And just again, because for some reason it seems hard to get through, solve this with affordable housing and with providing services. Thank you. Next up is our last caller of the night, um, 4871 is the end of your phone number. Hello, thank you. This is Elise Casby. Um, I just, first of all, want to take just a quick second or two to say thank you, um, Mayor Myers, for scrapping the Tolo. I hope you're completely scrapping it. Um, the second thing I want to say, this is to the homeowners and the property owners in Santa Cruz. Please don't treat this issue as um, something that you can brush away with not doing research or understanding. Our city has actually been spending hundreds of millions of dollars on police force, uh, forces, on fire, on fences, on security forces, on rickety, mickety, mickety mouse um, shelters. This 
citizens grand jury was posted. They did their investigation in 2015. We need more emergency shelters. We need social services. These are our people. This isn't. A, this is a tendency by the elites and their recall elected people, such as Renee Golder and others like Martine Watkins, to dismiss the homeless and scapegoat them. Stop doing that. We need real solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for all the folks who um, called in this evening and for your comments. Council definitely appreciates hearing from the public. I am gonna go ahead and turn this back over to the council for deliberation and I see um, council member Colin Tari Johnson has raised your hand and then uh, council member Watkins followed by council member Cummings. And Bonnie, maybe you could just put that uh, language I showed you, or you showed earlier up, just so we have just that there, in case people want it or have it ready, um, if anybody wants to uh, work towards that. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Um, uh, I would like to move forward with this motion and this outline that um, you put forward, um, and I and I do have some comments to make. Um, uh, and, I, and I, yeah, so I would like to move forward with this motion. Um, there's a, an addition that I'll add at the end. I sent, sent it to you, Bonnie, slightly changed just a moment ago. But I just wanna make some comments um, that I really appreciate. Um, I appreciate what we've heard tonight and through the last several weeks. Um, I've, I've talked to many of you um, on the phone um, via Zoom and listen to your voicemails and um, read your emails. And I really wanna thank those of you who have um, offered solutions and ideas. Um, I've listened, I've taken them seriously. I've worked with my colleagues to really integrate these ideas and thoughts in, into the way that we move forward. Um, I can't speak for all my colleagues, but what I can say is that each of us really does care deeply about this issue. Um, and we care deeply about uh, the well-being of everyone in our community. I know that some folks in the community may disagree and have um, different perspectives, but I really, I really can see that each of us on the council and the staff working on this do care. Um, my approach has been to look at this crisis as an opportunity to make some breakthrough and craft some solutions. We've heard from both sides that that includes moving forward with sheltering and programming first. I've heard that loud and clear. Um, and so I think that this approach um, moves that forward, that we want to create safe, dignified, humane sleeping conditions. That is a priority for me and I believe for um, this council for what I've heard and seen. Uh, we wanna create opportunities to access services and, and have individuals move into a continuum of care. We can't do it alone. The city doesn't have the scope, capacity, expertise to do that. Um, we wanna move away and prevent entrenched encampments. We've heard tonight about the impact that it has um, on, those on our housed community members as well as our unhoused community members. Um, these, these are not made up, they're real negative impacts. Um, so I think we can, I think most of us can agree to this, right? We, we want a safe, dignified, humane sleeping conditions, um, create opportunities to access services and prevent the in negative impacts of entrenched encampments. So I think, I think that is something that we can, as a community, agree to. Now there's diverging perspectives on how we get there, and that's what we're trying to do here. That's the public process. Um, you know, we, we put something forward, we massaged it and, and, and shaped it based on what we heard. Um, we, keep, we kept coming back and now here we are. So um, I hear members of the community, this wasn't a perfect process, but we're not not doing anything. We're doing something. Um, and I think that, that says a lot. Um, and so the other thing I wanna say is that we, I, I also heard that, that 150 sites is not enough. We have to start somewhere and we have to start with what's feasible. Um, the safe sleeping sites that are proposed are a start. Um, and, and I just wanna make clear, it's not being proposed that they're in any neighborhood. 
Um, it's not, it would be on city-owned facilities and lots. Um, transitional encampments aren't off the table. We are, as we speak, working with nonprofits and faith-based communities to uh, put forth a, a, a permitting process. So that's still there. Um, we're also continuing to work with the county who has committed to transitional shelter as well. So, so there's, there's a lot of options. There are a lot of things happening. We have to take it one step at a time. But the most important thing is that we have to move. I just heard from a staff member um, today, Susie O'Hara, actually, her name was brought up several times. She was on um, the U.S. Interagency on Homelessness West Coast City call. Um, and the call was specifically on encampment management. And what she relayed is that cities across the state have acknowledged that encampments are creating conditions that are increasingly um, risk, uh, bring risk and vulnerability, vulnerability, excuse me, um, and inhumane conditions, again, to those who are housed and unhoused. Um, and she shared that federal agencies were on the call and that this is starting to get acknowledged. So I think, I think that's some hope there that, that, um, that the federal agencies are listening and hopefully with all of you community members, um, doing your part to lobby, we will get some resources and capacity to help us because we can't do it alone. Um, so I guess I, um, I, what I, the other things I wanna say is that I really appreciate this community engagement process. Um, this, is, this is what it takes to co-create. I love that word, somebody used the word co-create. Uh, we need community members to engage and dialogue with us in a respectful and meaningful way as we continue to co-create and craft this. What I ask of community members is that, that you are patient with us, you are patient with the city, um, that you are ready to compromise, um, and most importantly, that we treat each other with compassion and respect, and I heard a lot of that tonight. So I think with that, I'll pause and um, invite my other, my colleagues to um, provide further comment. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Next. Oh, and I, excuse me, uh, and I will just add, Bonnie, there is, um, there's an addition to um, this motion. Um, let me see if I can read it to you. Um, is that on item three that we add at the end that, um, that the enforcement condition is based, is based on availability of shelter um, in these authorized locations. And I can email that to you if you, hadn't, if you didn't get it. I did. I don't get it. Can you say that again? Sorry, enforcement? With enforcement conditioned on availability of shelter in these authorized locations. I think the underlying language already covers it. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, oh, is that all? That, oh, oh, that's I already think. in there. I was reading it yes, backwards. Thank you. Yes. That's in there. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. But just to, just to reiterate, move forward with sheltering and programming. Um, and ensure that we have spaces for folks to go to um, before any kind of enforcement. So I'll just, I'll pause there, thank you. Thank you, council member. Next up I have council member Watkins and then council member Cummings and then council, uh, excuse me, vice mayor Bruner. Thank you, mayor. And uh, thank you, council member Calentari Johnson. I think my comments really are um, similar to yours. I want to thank also our staff and our city attorneys and Mayor Myers and my colleagues um, for all the work and effort that's gone into to seeking solutions here and a special thanks to the community for, um, for, for being present in this conversation. Uh, certainly what's become clear is that we're all in this together and, um, and we have to stay engaged. And as uh, my colleague mentioned, as a city, we can continue to do what we can, but we are limited in our uh, scope and options, and we truly do need state and federal, federal intervention, and we are not alone. And so I am encouraged to hear that other cities are starting to come together and this is getting attention to get the, the resources that we need to truly find uh, long-standing solutions. I do believe that we can aspire to lift each other up, and I think that by doing so, we can begin to see ourselves and each other in the solution. So I hope that our community stays engaged and sees uh, their role in wanting to move forward in some way to, to create a solution, to co-create a solution. 
Um, I'm hopeful that the approach that we're moving in, uh, which is to not proceed with the TOLO, and as mentioned, to leave with programming, um, but also to have tools to prevent the potential for large entrenched encampments. Because with this proposal, we're aiming to create more uh, dignified sleeping options, uh, prevent entrenched encampments, and really aspiring to create policies that humane and effective for the entire community. Um, so I, I want to also just share that um, I think that above all, we have to continue to balance process and action and continue to try something. I recognize all the perspectives and concerns, and I do feel that we have a shared goal to seek solutions. Um, this is a complex issue. People are complicated, and the issues surrounding homelessness and the various populations of homelessness is equally as complicated. Um, and sometimes I think we can fall into a all or nothing or assign blame or point fingers um, and kind of take identity positions because sometimes it's harder to really recognize how complex this really is and to really want to continue solutions. Um, so I am inspired and committed to strive towards solutions, uh, to track and evaluate what we are proposing in terms of programs and policies and determine where to go in the future. And if what we do works, admit that and repeat it if possible. If it doesn't and it fails, we tried, so we'll change it and we'll try something else. And I want to acknowledge the mayor for acknowledging that this was one of those uh, experiences where the TOLO was something that wasn't going to work. And we acknowledge that and want to move forward in a different direction. So with that, I will second um, the motion on the floor and uh, you know, thank, thank you all. Thank you, council member. Next up is council member Cummings. Mayor, before you um, move on, who was the maker of that? The maker of the motion was uh, Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. Okay, thank you. Council Member Cummings? Thank you, Mayor. And um, I guess I'd like to start by thanking the uh, Mayor for um, the outreach she's done with the community and the decision to not move forward with the TOLO. Um, I'm hopeful because we've heard from a lot of residents that this wasn't gonna work. And um, I'm glad to see that uh, we're gonna try, hopefully, something new. And um, you know, regardless of what we do moving forward, we really need to ensure that we have a community process and we have transparency. Homelessness is something that everyone in our community cares about. And given the Martin versus Boise laws, it's going to take a community effort to implement something that's gonna be effective and compatible with our community. We have had successful outcomes when we have conducted outreach with communities first. This has been evident with the city's safe sleeping programs that we have, um, one of which is located across from the Warriors Stadium, another one that's located in the police station parking lot, and other safe sleeping programs that we've had for people living in their vehicles throughout the city. We've also seen success with programs at 1220 River Street. We've seen successful programs at the Armory the VFW downtown, and many hotels that are currently being used uh, for COVID-19 for homelessness. And to give the community an example, um, last year, or it might have been, yes, last year when we were uh, pro proposing to put um, an encampment up at the Armory, we actually met with the community in Prospect Heights, and we were able to work with that community through a process of how people would get to and from the Armory, uh, concerns around camping, concerns around the number of people that would be there. And it was a really good process. And many of the people who were at that meeting asked, um, you know, why would why do we have to shut down 1220 to open the armory? Why couldn't we have both? And at that point in time, the reason why we had to close down 1220 River Street is because we had maintenance that uh, needed to be conducted for the water department. But it's a good example of how we were able to meet with the community, we were able to hear their ideas, address their concerns, and move forward. And so I'm really hopeful and that we can have a process that will do the same. Um, I'd recommend that as part of um, whatever is considered, that we focus not only on providing shelter, um, but we also focus on deterring bad behaviors. Um, that is one of the things that I feel, and I think many of the people in our community feel is the issue. It's not the condition of being homeless. It's some of the behaviors such as defecation, open drug use, 
obsessed bike shop shops. The thing, these are some of the things people have concerns with. And as the police chief mentioned in our agenda report, and as he's mentioned on in other occasions, if we can focus on those behaviors and deter those behaviors, we may be able to actually change the behavior, some of the behaviors that we see associated with homelessness in our community. And that should be one of our priorities as well, rather than focusing on the condition of being homeless. Um, it's clear that uh, the previous ordinance was, was confusing, and I think we really need to be clear about what our intentions are. And so, you know, the question for me and what I'm hearing from the community is, are we ultimately trying to ban daytime camping or ban daytime sleeping to prevent the entrenchment of encampments? Or are we trying to ban camping outright because each will have a different approach? If we're asking people to take down their tents during the daytime, but they can sleep at night, um, that I can see having a, a, uh, an impact on trying to keep these entrench these camps from entrenching. But if we are you know moving towards banning camping, I'm just concerned that that's going to put us in a situation where we're going to be in violation of Martin versus Boise. Um, and so I guess to close, um, I have some amendments that I'd like to make and suggest to this, but I really want to emphasize that regardless of what is done, that we are focusing, like number one, on um, going to the community and engaging them in the process. And if we come up with sites and ideas, or you know, if it's staff, if it's a subcommittee, if you come up with ideas, go to those communities first have a conversation with those communities before that comes to council so that people can feel like they're part of the process. And as we've heard tonight, many people are interested and in wanting to be engaged in this. And so again, uh, I'm just gonna encourage that before something comes back to the council, that there is sufficient community engagement and community involvement to ensure that the community is on board. Thank you, council member. Uh, next up is Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I wrote down some thoughts I wanted to share. Uh, I've also as well over the last two weeks uh, have spoken with many, many people and uh, waded through all the hundreds of emails as well, um, responding and having dialogue with many community members. And um, one thing that uh, I think is really important and that we can continue to work on going forward is uh, improving the community uh, and public uh, information and messaging. It's clear that that has um, led to a lot of the understandings and perceptions um, from the intentions of the ordinance. And um, I'm really sorry that it's created such anxiety and stress and um, uh, just huge concern, um, valid concerns from uh, all people in our community and, um, you know, speaking with my neighbors and speaking with business owners and speaking with families, um, meeting people I've never met before who left voicemails and calling them back and people sharing their stories of living in Santa Cruz and, um, you know, understanding that, um, the information that is shared with the public, we have to continue to create a system of the community process and information because um, so many people I spoke to understood that we would be setting up camps, that safe sleeping sites were um, meant camps in these blue lined areas and um, not understanding the the that the piece in the whole and the whole uh, has a lot more components to it and um, so you know as 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 a new council member going through this process uh, it's clear to me that we can strive to continue to work on 
uh, communicating that information in as many ways as possible and um, engaging in that community process um, so that uh, there's understanding in, in what the goals, intentions, and needs are. And, um, you know, understanding too, I think it's really important um, uh, to understand that this is the first time I'm seeing this proposal here by the mayor. Uh, we are all colleagues, but because of the Brown Act, we cannot work as a team to communicate uh, in certain ways that maybe in a business or other board setting, for example, would. And um, so, you know, we're working through a certain process as well in our communications. And um, having these deliberations right now is really, uh, it's really good to hear from the community, hear um, uh, that, you know, this seeing this proposal aligns with kind of the simplification that um, I ended up working on with Council Member Boulder in simplifying what the needs are uh, for our community based on community input. And that's how it should be going forward each time, right? So um, I also want to really stress that I spoke of the, um, this is a piece in the, in the bigger picture and um, uh, that, you know, right now we have so many uh, wonderful, um, things happening simultaneously um, to address all of the various symptoms and needs and causes of uh, those experiencing homelessness. And um, that includes temporary shelters, transitional shelters, permanent supportive housing, uh, mental health and substance use treatment programs with um, efforts from County Health and Human Services Department. Um, I made notes of, you know, some of that to include supportive services and um, uh, rapid rehousing and outreach and uh, coordinated entry uh, systems. Uh, uh, and also, uh, uh, Housing Matters just uh, released their new three-year plan and other amazing nonprofits and organizations like uh, Encompass Community Services and the Downtown Streets team that really works to create dignity and services and support through, through work and stipends, um, little things, all of these nonprofits and county and city, we're all striving to work together to address the larger issue. Um, and I have uh, uh, hope that we can get to a point of all of this information because it's come at me even in pieces, bits and pieces in various forms from various sources about all what is being done. Um, and even uh, this list of funding sources, um, there's various funding sources to address various needs with various limitations. And, um, you know, and that includes the federal continuum of care, housing support programs, permanent housing allocation funds, um, veterans affairs supportive housing, housing choice vouchers, um, community development block grant funds. It's just a list, of, it just goes on. And so it's really hard to, to digest it all. And I hope the community, um, that we can find ways to have this information digestible and understandable for everybody to understand everything that's being worked on and um, that we have the long-term work that is is 
being worked on, and then we have the short term. And um, as as our one of our last meetings, Mayor Myers um, and I had with the county, um, you know, there's a term called front door services, and um, that's kind of the immediate needs, and um, we need to address those as well. So um, Mayor Myers and city staff and myself, we have been in a few meetings with legislative asks. There was a caller earlier that brought up the federal and state assistance, and that certainly is um, uh, being worked on as well. And, um, you know, I'm not sure the, uh, how many people have reached out to our uh, state and federal legislators and, and um, you know, that certainly is a piece of it. This is uh, still in progress. Nothing has been finalized. Um, you know, we're trying, we're assessing, we're evaluating. Um, this has been since February. We've, you know, gone through this uh, presentation of this ordinance that grew very layered and complicated to understand with so many amendments. So bringing it back to simplify some of the elements um, uh, I think is very important to focus on um, the behaviors and um, that that are very detrimental to our environment and to our neighborhoods. And um, uh, I I just hope that we keep moving forward to set you know really good policy solutions within our um, uh, uh, legal boundaries. Um, and that will have the greatest the greatest uh, uh, benefit for our community. Um, so, thank you, Mayor Myers, uh, for um, bringing this version. And I know you worked on it um, uh, with Council Member Talentari Johnson and Watkins um, to simplify our, um, the amendment. I believe that. Um, we worked on is kind of rolled into this, so um, it's nice to see a more simplified version. I do think it's really important now that this is presented that community has a chance to digest and understand going forward. Um, and uh, thank you to all of our amazing community members that you know, really took the time to talk and, and reach out and listen, and I hope we can continue more dialogue. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Next up, I have Council Member Brown, and then Council Member Golder, and then Council Member Kalantar Johnson. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I have been uh, trying to gather my thoughts uh, to comment in a way that is kind and understanding. Um, and it's been hard, I have to say. It's just been very hard. Uh, I am, I'm trying really hard not to do a whole bunch of told you so, um, and I'm not gonna talk about that in, in great detail here, um, but I just feel like um, we we can do better. I mean, we absolutely have to do better. Um, the the uh, the term, I believe, um, I think Shabra or uh, Council Member Calendary Johnson and um, uh, uh, another Council Member, one of you said um, co-creation, and I, I I agree with that. We absolutely whatever we do, it has to be with a really really strong community engagement piece. And uh, the term that was I heard was actually co-work. And that is what is required to co-create. And, um, and I think we need to be very deliberate about that and we need to be explicit in our direction moving forward, our direction tonight to staff and our direction uh, as we move forward in, you know, in trying to implement some of these, these, um, you know, alternative proposals, uh, I, um, I'm, 
I'm glad, I'm really glad that whatever we've been through here um, and, you know, the kind of the frustration and the, the siege mentality that I've, I've found people getting into because they're just, they don't understand, they don't know what's happening, they don't know what we're doing, and it doesn't make sense. Um, you know, I, I think that if we, if we actually get people involved before we um, make some of these decisions about, um, you know, for example, uh, storage program, right? We heard from one person, please don't put it in our neighborhoods. Well, you know, nobody knows if that's gonna happen or not. We are not being clear enough. Um, and, and I know that that's not what we're here to do tonight. Um, but I do believe that it has to be done. And so I would, I would really hope uh, to see something in this uh, direction we give tonight that includes uh, coming back with a really robust community um, engagement process. And I, when I say that, I mean like the kind of meetings, and I'll go to them, I'll go talk with neighbors, I'll go, I mean, I would happily do that um, as, as a way to really try to work through the issues. And we have heard from so many people saying they wanna do that. We have heard from so many people saying they, are, they just feel like their voices aren't being heard. And in order to do that, um, effectively, it, I believe it must happen up front before we stand anything up um, and before we implement any new, uh, you know, restrictions. We have to do this. I'm, and I, I just, I mean, I know I'm, I'm like, I'm imploring my colleagues to pre, please take this seriously. We are all saying that that's what we want, but I want, I, you know, I don't see it happen. And, and I'm sorry that that, you know, my, my, my trust and my faith that that's going to happen has really been um, compromised over the years um, as a member of this council and previously um, for 25 years <laughs> I have been talking about uh, with many others this is not my idea um, trying to develop some uh, safe sleeping alternatives managed encampments all of these things and I am if nothing else glad that the um, that this um, kind of curtailed process has convinced um, this council, uh, majority of council members, uh, to have the political will to really work on the alternatives, places where, for people to go, ways that we can manage the, the challenges we face in collaboration with our community members, our neighbors, business owners, housed and unhoused people alike. So, uh, you know, I just, I, I really, really want to, um, see if we can in this process, in this, what, what we have before us, find a way to build that in. Um, to me, it is not enough to say, well, it's kind of happening, you know, or it is happening, but it's like, it's, it's pretty nebulous how it's happening, where it's happening, how people can get information, how people can be involved. Um, so really a clear planning process. I think we could really use some help with that. We don't seem to have um, been able to figure this out. And, um, you know, I think a, a larger planning process is warranted at this time. Um, it would help us get our, um, you know, our, 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 our wrap our brains around, um, you know, how to make this work. Um, um, Susie O'Hara was. It was mentioned that she went and she looked at transitional encampments. She she was learning about what communities have done to make this work. I think we could draw from others' experience. I think um, that we um, we really need to. Um, Get a handle on what it what the costs might be. We you know we hear we see in the uh, in the staff reports um, you know massive cost for doing this this kind of work. It's part of the reason that we have not been able to move forward. Um, however, we know that we can get it done with. And I've said this, you know, I feel like a broken record. I'm sorry, but I just have to say it again. We can get that done if we work, if we draw on the the creativity and the, the commitment that people have, if we bring that to our, um, you know, if we take it seriously, if we just, if we take that seriously, um, that we are going to be so much better off. Um, 
I'm really, t I, I think I'll leave it there for now. Um, but I, but I, I do, um, I do think that we need to talk about, you know, funding models. We need to, we need help there and not just with the funding, but you know, how to finance these things. Um, and, and so I, you know, I, I just, and there's so many other things. I mean, I could throw in all kinds of ideas about things we could do that have been, you know, I've been talking with people in the community about, um, and we're not going to do that here tonight, but I think we need to make space for it. Um, so I'm going to leave it there for now. Um, I, I really hope that we can, you know, we can be serious about the community part and the planning part. And so we don't end up having meetings going out into the community just doing damage control. Um, it's, it, it takes a lot of time that we don't have. Um, so I'll, again, leave it there. Thank you for, um, for listening. And you know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not be more um, positive. I, I, want, I want to end it and say that I am very positive about the possibilities moving forward. Uh, we just have to be really deliberate and we have to, um, you know, we need to make ourselves accountable. And I, I think we haven't done that. Okay. Uh, next up, I believe, is Council Member Golder. Thank you. Thanks to everybody for all of your comments that you've made um, this evening. And I really want to thank the community for all of the phone calls and the correspondence. And I do know that every single member of this council cares deeply about this issue. And we all might not see eye to eye on what the perfect solution is, but we really do want to make positive change in the community. And I personally want to apologize if there was any um, miscommunication from us or you felt unheard or you felt, you know, we were doing things um, that weren't, I guess, you know, transparent. And I do think that what I've learned through this process is what other council members have said is that we really need to work on our communication and making sure the community has accurate information and is able to give uh, feedback in a meaningful way and that's timely and so that they, that they can feel heard. Um, Vice Mayor Bruner and I have been working on simplifying, um, I think, makers were having trouble figuring out what the exact rules were. Of course, the public was having trouble understanding, and we just felt like then um, that was the logical next step was to take a step back and simplify. So uh, again, uh, we had something, but I, you know, I'm glad this is here. We can work from this, and I appreciate um, everybody's work from the staff to the um, Mayor Meyer going out into the community on our behalf and um, everybody that took the time to write an email or send a letter in the mail or a phone call to us. Even if, I know for me, if I didn't have time to respond and I know probably the other members didn't have time to respond to everybody, but we really did look and we read, but we all have second or third other jobs, so we're very busy. But um, we, we do know you care and we hear you. I just want to say that. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Contar Johnson. Yes, thank you. Um, I just I just wanted to say a couple of words. Uh, you know, we all acknowledge that community engagement is key while we continue to move forward with something, um, with policy and crafting solutions. Um, but with all due respect, we have done years of community engagement uh, through the CATCH, through the Homeless Ad Hoc Committee before that. Um, and it hasn't produced much action, at least towards programming. And, and what I see, what I started my statement with is that I see this as an opportunity to move forward with programming um, and to actually help and support people who are unhoused in our community. Uh, this is part of the process. I know I'm new to this, um, but this I see as part of the process is we try something, we put it out, we hear from the community, we pivot, we shift, and, and it's messy. Um, but hopefully in the end, we are co-working and we are co-creating. Um, you know, moving forward with policy on an issue that's polarizing is challenging, as we can all see. Um, and so we could get, we could really get stuck in the process. And for, for everyone's sake, uh, I hope that that's not going to be the case with this council that, that so far I'm really, really enjoying working
working with and co-creating with. Um, having said all that, I, I, I've heard what Councilmember Cummings has brought up and, and Councilmember Brown and Vice Mayor Brunner and some of the community members tonight. Um, and I would like to make a suggestion and ask um, to shift the motion that is put before us and add to item number one that staff engage the community as they prioritize setting up adequate shelter. Um, again, again, I don't wanna get stuck in process. I wanna balance um, a, a meaningful, authentic, transparent community engagement process while moving ahead um, because people are suffering. So we can't, we can't be talking about this a year from now. Um, so yes to community engagement. Um, so this would, this would be added to um, maybe just before item one, I don't know how we want to craft the language, but um, that staff engage the community as they prioritize setting up adequate shelter. Um, so I'll just, I, um, I appreciate the comments from you, Council Member Brown and Cummings and Vice Mayor Brenner. Um, I agree that community engagement is important. I just really want to caution us as a council to um, be in action together. And if um, the seconder of the motion is okay with that too. Tony, did you have a comment? I would like to ask for some clarification. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Just to back up a little bit, I just I want to remind the council that um, the second reading was a, uh, of of Chapter 636 was approved by the council on March 9th, and so I'm I want to make sure that I'm interpreting this direction correctly, um, and I and I take it that I mean it's pretty clear that the council is not interested in implementing the ordinance that was adopted on March 9th, so um, so I take this direction as a motion. A to administratively suspend enforcement of the of the TOLO pending um, further revisions, and and the question is, um, and I don't think this language needs to be changed. The question is that is encompassed within this motion direction to return to the council with an ordinance that's consistent with what is set forth in this motion. Yes, that was a little bit of maybe too much legal language for me, but ultimately we want to rescind the current TOLO. Um, so how, whatever the process is for that, to halt implementation, to suspend implementation, um, and to essentially start anew with, with this hybrid of alternative one and two that was in the staff report. And that's what this motion um, hopefully reflects. So to return to the council with a, a new ordinance that is consistent with the direction you're giving here. Yes. Okay. And is there, um, does the council, would the council like to see this with, you know, on a specific timeline? Um, yes. <laughs> and, and the reason why I ask is that I think, you know, there's, ideally we, we would keep this process moving, but I think the 27th is a little tight just because the drafting has to be done. We have to prepare a new report. Um, and I think staff would probably like to think through this direction so that they can provide some uh, feedback on the timing of that as well. Yes, and, and I would say, um, and maybe Lee can um, share his thoughts, but I would say that the item one, um, uh, we don't need to wait on item one, is the engagement of with the community and moving forward and prioritizing setting up adequate shelter. I think that can be immediate. Um, and I know that's actually, that work has already begun. So um, Lee, if, if you wanna comment in terms of timeline. Sure, thank you, Councilmember Calentari Johnson. And yes, we have already begun work. Um, part of the direction and one of the first steps um, that we've been working on is um, the development of an RFQ, a request for qualifications or a request for proposals for, um, for operators, nonprofits, or others who um, can um, provide um, some of the, as Councilmember Brown was saying, you know, hopefully creative solutions to um, uh, operate these facilities in a, a cost-effective manner. And um, so we are already off and, and working on that. Um, that process does take some time, even you know, once we release it, um, it takes time for um, you know, the uh, 
the um, responses to come back in for those to be scored and evaluated, for contracts to be entered into and so forth. And so um, there is um, a lot of work just in, in that component, but um, certainly we can continue to move forward with um, identifying locations and coordinating with the community to get feedback on those locations. Um, so you know, there's, there's an overlap of a variety of different processes um, that we can do so that uh, we can move this along as quickly as possible. And it would likely be staged in terms of, um, you know, not all 150 um, safe sleeping spaces open all at once. It's, you know, let's focus on uh, uh, one or two locations and see how many we can get in there, see, learn from the successes and failures associated with those, and um, then uh, modify those operations as well as subsequent uh, operations at different locations as we move forward. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna cue myself in here because I believe we're starting to come back around again. Um, Council Member Contari Johnson, was that the end of your questions and comments? That was, thank you. So I might just follow up on this um, tr uh, kind of a, a little bit of this uh, conversation we're having right now. Um, either Mr. Condotti or um, we maybe with regards to getting a new ordinance back um, in front of the council, um, Tony, you mentioned that maybe two weeks would be too soon. Um, is, is May 11th doable to get a first reading of a new, new ordinance together? I believe it is, yes. Okay, great. So Bonnie, maybe, uh, if the maker of the motion uh, would be amenable, we'll put May 11th as the date, target date for that. Okay, great. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, and I guess, I guess I, just a couple of comments. Um, you know, uh, what I what I see this ordinance doing is um, basically we're we're doubling the number the, the places for people to be. Um, we are coming at this from programmatic action, not more process. Um, and. Um, you know, I remember a few years ago, this was prior to when I was on council, there was an attempt to try to work with the community to do some um, siting for various facilities. And um, that just never happened because um, there wasn't a context for the community to really understand. And so that sort of just fizzled out because we literally couldn't get agreement to put anything anywhere. Um, this is very clearly focused on a few existing places that have been used in this way before. And it obviously is very focused on accommodating people in city, at, in city facilities and city parking lots. Um, and what really the comments that came from the community on were a lot of frankly misinformation that was put out on social media a lot of um, information, uh, a lot of confusion around the infamous blue zone map. Um, and, uh, you know, with that came the need to go out and talk to the community, which um, many of us did in phone calls, in emails, in private meetings, in public meetings, in parking lots, wherever it was we needed to go. Um, but I think having, going back to process, going back to um, you know, it, if we've been trying to solve this for 25 years, we're n something's wrong. <laughs> um, you know, we we need to move. We need to move now. Um, there are absolutely inhumane conditions that people are currently finding themselves in, um, and if it, we can put them in a place that they can come and get a a, a place to sleep at night. That is a huge step forward. It's a huge step forward. Um, and if we can stop having um, encampments that blow up and turn into real problems for our community, that's also really important and, and a step forward. Uh, so, you know, I understand and certainly have participated in a lot of community engagement over the last two weeks. Um, and I will do it again and I will keep doing it as long as we need to do it. But I'm not willing to just stop 
and start process again. Process has failed us. Um, I find it a little ironic that, you know, with the Ross camp, which was um, not a planned activity at all, um, there was a lot of support to do that, even though we had business owners and people coming and begging us to shut down that camp. Um, we had county supervisors who had agreed on operating procedures to actually begin to shut the camp down that were not, that were not honored in votes. Um, no one asked, um, the, no one asked the uh, people about setting up the Roth camp. There was no community process around that. There was no community process around the 400 people that moved into the lower part of Poganip um, and carved the hillside apart. Um, so, you know, to say that we need to do more process, um, we need to do something right now. We need to do something right now. And the most important thing that comes out of this ordinance is that we will be making contact with people. We will be able to actually ask them their names. We'll be signing them into these sites. We'll be learning about what they need. We're gonna be putting to get them together with services. These people will actually be touched by various conversations throughout their um, ability to try to you know, move into some of these sites that we wanna set up. And to, to Susie O'Hara's credit, those are the kinds of environments she was setting up, she was establishing and those were successful. They did get people moved into the continuum of care. So this is not a mystery of what we need to do. Um, you know, we know how to do both managed encampments. We know how to do transitional encampments. We do know how to do this. Um, we need to just start moving. Uh, and so I, I appreciate the um, emphasis on community outreach um, and uh, I think that can be done by a phone call. It can be done by going to a neighborhood and connecting with the people who are organized and having a conversation. I've done a lot of that in the last two weeks and it's been extremely productive. And I've met, frankly, some really wonderful people who wanna get engaged in solving this problem. So um, those are my thoughts around process and sort of engagement. Um, so let's put it in the context of the urgency and the cuteness of what we see in our community right now and let's start moving on helping people. So um, I'll turn it over to Council Member Cummings, then Council Member Brown, and then I've got Vice Mayor Bruner and then Council Member Watkins. Thank you, Mayor. I have a few um, follow-up or uh, just follow-up comments to a number of things that, that have been said. <clears throat> and the one thing I want to point out is that I think that some of what I've heard from my colleagues is that we haven't been doing anything. And the fact is we've been doing a lot and we have been successful. Before I got on the council, I think it was that year that 1220 River Street was set up. There was heavy amounts of security. Um, People were concerned, but it was something that we tried out as a pilot and it worked. And over time, we've been able to cut costs on that by reducing the amount of security that's there. And I believe we could probably do further reductions in security at some of these um, um, shelters that we have. And, it did, and that was so successful to the point where when the Ross camp was closed, the uh, tannery residents had actually asked us to put that camp back in its place. And they commended the city on how successful it was. So we can't say that we haven't been doing anything. And yes, 1220 was expensive, but we've been able to reduce those costs over time. The reason why the Ross camp wasn't closed so, so quickly, I'd like to remind the community, is because during one of the meetings when we were about to vote on it, the, the city attorney had made us aware of some, consider, of some concerns around Martin versus Boise and opening ourselves up to litigation. And I think over the past two years, some of the things that I've heard from my colleagues is we need to try to avoid being in lawsuits. And I understand we need to move swiftly, but we've just did that. Well, first of all, there was an attempt to move swiftly over Christmas and it put us in a lawsuit and we're still in that lawsuit where we cannot move people from the San Lorenzo Park. From San Lorenzo Park. And by moving swiftly with what we've just done, I don't know how many letters we've received from different attorneys, from property owners who have said, if you move forward, we will be moving forward with litigation. So we, I understand the need to move and to try to get things done, but we have to accomplish them with 
in, in conjunction with community outreach. And when this first came to the council, that was all I was really advocating for. So if we're gonna say that people can sleep overnight in our open spaces, have we talked to the people who live around there? We're not if, we're, if we're gonna say, we're not I, have the floor, I have the floor, I have the floor right now. Um, okay, so, go ahead, please. Um, so when we're saying that we're gonna, you know, um, not have people sleep in the downtown or not have people sleep in certain areas, the rest of the community can say, well, where do they go? Are they coming to my neighborhood? And we didn't, and no outreach was done. And that's all I was advocating for because what I expressed in that first meeting was that if we don't go to the community, we're gonna end up in the same situation we were in when Drew had made his proposals of putting RV encampments and other types of encampments all over the city. In 2019, that was the biggest thing that we heard was that the community said, you didn't come to us and talk to us about it. And here we are again. And so regardless of what we do, and I, I'm totally fine with a lot of the things that are proposed here. It's something that many of us have wanted to see, many people in the community have wanted to see. And I'm not saying that we need to go back to square one of what we need to do to address homelessness. I'm just saying that if we are going to go move forward with any of these things that, there's, that the community is engaged with, so another example, Laurel Street Shelter at the Salvation Army. That existed and that function with the community because we went to the community, we spoke with the community, and we asked them what did they need in order for this to function, and it did. So all I'm gonna say is that, you know, to say that we haven't done anything, to say we're not making strides, we are, and we need to acknowledge that. Um, I'm actually gonna stop my comments there, but I do have edits that I'd like to make or friendly amendments to make to this. Um, I was going to mention that we should suspend or delete chapter 6.36 regulations for temporary outdoor living, but it sounds like that's already been incorporated into the motion. I would like to make a couple edits or potential friendly amendments to number one. And so the language would read, prioritizing and setting up adequate shelter slash safe sleeping locations slash programs on city owned properties including but not limited to the creation of 150 safe sleeping spots, in addition to shelter and or safe sleeping at the River Street Shelter, 1220 River Street, and other city facilities slash city parking lots as necessary to be determined by staff in conjunction with community outreach when appropriate. So that would uh, remove, so let's could see. You, could you show us that language? It's very hard for for Bonnie to actually track that and for us to, it, it's just difficult. Do you have that? It looks like Bonnie, you're reading it. Can you send it to us? I can send it, I can send it to Bonnie. Thank so you, that'd it. be great. Or if you can just say it slower, I don't know. Yeah. So uh, the prioritizing and setting up adequate uh, shelter slash safe sleeping size location city on properties, including but not limited to 150 safe sleeping spots, so that same sentence. I would delete, and the reason I'm gonna explain myself before I make this deletion, I'm gonna, I would like to recommend deleting not adjacent to residential areas or schools that include, or not adjacent to residential areas or schools. And the reason why I'm saying that is because the 1220 River is adjacent to the tannery. And when we had Laurel Street Shelter, that not only was adjacent, that not only was on a neighborhood block, but it was also across from Santa Cruz High, so or the, the fields of Santa Cruz High. So that's an example of something that did, that functioned well next to a school within a community in both circumstances. And so, and this again is the ad, is advocating for that community outreach that we can address the community needs. Um, so then um, this, that, <clears throat> So delete, that includes the creation of 150 safe sleeping spots. So moving on. In addition to, so delete involving the River Street Shelter, and, and no, 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 not that whole thing, involving the, and then just put in addition to the River Street Shelter. River Street Shelter, 1220 River, and 
other city facilities parking lots as necessary to be determined by staff in conjunction with community outreach when appropriate. The next one would be. Um, Sorry, uh, Mayor. Or Council Member coming would say in conjunction with. Community outreach when appropriate. And then I would delete, um, I would say, from except in the next bullet point to these, I'd just delete that. So in the first bullet from, yeah, from there to where it says these in the next uh, line, yep, and continue through, yeah, so delete that and these where it says these, the word. Yep, and so then it would read, safe sleeping spaces will be, will be for sleeping only, inviting individuals to come in the evening to sign in and leave in the morning. And so, because if we have an emotion that uh, 1220 River can only be used as a managed encampment or overnight sleeping, you know, there's a potential for storage or other sorts. So rather than putting restrictions on 1220, we focus on the fact that safe sleeping will be for sleeping only. Um, and then below number two, so um, I would add, uh, so three would become four, but I would add a line under number two saying, um, directing that we use the temporary outdoor living ordinance and the standard operating procedures for removing encampments as, encampments as templates. So use temporary outdoor living ordinance and standard operating procedures for removing encampments as as templates for reference. Um, and then at number four, establish a subcommittee to work with staff so are you saying instead of this? At the, be at the beginning of four, because it's going to build on what's already there, uh, establish a subcommittee to work with staff to come up with and bring forward an ordinance in conjunction with community input that would allow for, and, and then we have enforcement. So it's, it's, it's already, it's building on it now for enforcement of nighttime prohibitions on camping I'll just read the rest of it too because it might be easier uh, enforcement of nighttime provision on camping when on camping when adequate safe sleeping programs are operational. To address Martin versus Boise. After which the city would prohibit camping 
in all other city areas? Other than city permitted indoor shelters, safe sleeping locations, and managed encampments. And you could put period and then just delete um, from there to the end of the rest of the paragraph. Do you mean delete all of this? Yep. Yeah, because it's, it's pretty much redundant. Um, and then I don't know, I personally, I don't, I mean, maybe we can discuss the timeline, but I personally feel like um, that might be a short timeline. So it might, you know, if we return to council, yeah, by May 11th, and maybe if we can build in some flexibility um, on or after May 11th, I, I think it might be worth us having some consideration of an extended date or if people, if staff needs more time that we provide them with the mechanism for um, being able to extend it if necessary. So those are my friendly amendments. I don't know, I'm sure there's probably some changes or I don't know if they're gonna be all be accepted, but I think it's worth us discussing uh, some of those provisions. I think what I'd like to do, I see that uh, Council Member Brown is next. Um, we've, we have not taken a break um, since we convened, um, and, and this is a lot to sort of, I think maybe giving um, the motion maker a little bit of time to sort through this. Um, I'm sure all of us need to stretch our legs and maybe attend to a couple of things. So I think I'd like to just take a, a 15 minute break and we'll come back to this. Um, uh, because this is a, a lot to take in right now. So um, why don't we go ahead and take a 15 minute break. We'll come back at 8.30 and uh, we can pick this up. And thank you. Mayor, can, can we see the original language for the, for the motion versus the edited version at some point? Or maybe Bonnie, that, that could be something to reference. We are back up and running, and I will. Um, so we have a number of um, a number of friendly amendments, uh, and I'm going to actually ask the motion maker to sort of sort through whether or not the motion maker and the seconder um, to let me know where you where you want to start with those, if you're ready. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Myers and um, Bonnie, if you would you mind putting up the um, a version that shows the original compared to the amendment? Do you have that? I do. Okay, great. Um, so, Councilmember Cummings, um, thank you. I, I appreciate. Um, you um, adding some of these pieces, uh, as I was looking through them over the break, um, really a lot of these amendments are tangential to what's already suggested. And I was really trying to keep it really clean and clear um, in terms of motion language. Um, so I guess I'll, um, I mean, there's a couple pieces that I think that, that you suggested could we could add, but I'd really like to keep the motion language as um, originally presented. Um, so I can go through bit by bit, but um, the piece around um, including, but but not limited to, oops, uh, I think the bias was to say but, but not limited to 150 safe sleeping spots. Um, I see what you're doing there. You're just saying it, it um, doesn't have to be a, um, a, a maximum of 150, or excuse me, not a minimum of 150. So I'm, I'm okay with that piece of it, um, with that friendly amendment. Um, the, um, I'm not comfortable with the striking out of the adjacent to residential areas or schools. Um, the community engagement is already there at the start, so I, I don't see why we need to, to shift it. So it starts out by saying direct staff to engage with communities, so that's redundant. Um, and, and then, let's see, um, 
I'm not sure how the second piece has changed except for uh, except for 1220 River Street, which may be used as a managing camp and overnight site. So that's the same as what I had, what we had originally proposed in the motion. Um, you know, can the I, other can piece. I, can I stop you for one second? Because that language is not correct in the second bullet, sorry. So from what I, from the additions that, I, the edits that I made, that's not correct. That is exactly what was there initially, and I changed that. So, but I do know that. Oh, oh go ahead. But I know there's discussion around putting up the original versus the edit. So I just wanted to point out that that's, I could read the language that I changed there, but I um, just wanted to point out that that's not the correct edit. Okay, maybe maybe if you can send the correct to Bonnie, we could go through the, the rest. Um, okay, and, and so the rest of it, I, I, you know, honestly, I feel like it gets, um, it gets really um, complicated. Um, like the subcommittee, I, I see that we, we already have a couple of opportunities. We, we already have structures for subcommittee. We have the two by two. We have the, um, what is it called? The county response, the county city response team. So that can be used as a space for the subcommittee. Um, you know, we would, we would of course use what we have already, um, the existing POLO and SOPs as a starting point. So I'm not sure that that needs to be in there. Um, so, so I think that the pieces that I'm okay with is the up to 150 sites. And um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's really the one piece that, that um, might've been overlooked. But everything else I think is either there or I'm not comfortable with. Um, the other change I wanted to make to this, actually to this motion is at the very top, the four number one, to explicitly state that we would resend the council adopted TOLO. So I think that hasn't been explicitly stated. So resend the, the council adopted TOLO and then and then the second part is direct staff to return on May 11th with a recommended implementation plan and a new ordinance that captures the intent of the following plan. And I can send that to you, um, Bonnie. And then it would have all of the rest of it. So again, Council Member Cummings, I think that up to 150 sites is, is a, um, a good addition, an important addition, but the rest of it, I think, is already in the intent of the motion. And, and, I, and I'd like to keep it clean and clear. And I can uh, maybe go to that. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sending over the language because there's there's a number of places where I don't think um, it was either it was overlooked or when going back to try to make the changes between the two, there might have been some errors. But um, I will hearing. send that. I'll send that over. Okay. Um, but from what I heard, from what I've heard, I'm I'm comfortable with adding the up to 150 safe sleeping, just the up to language, um, but not comfortable with the other amendments. Bonnie, I think you should probably be working from the original motion then if that's um, if that's not accepted as a friendly amendment. Because this is... Um, yeah, I think you go back. Yeah, thank you, Tony. I think there's only one change that's been accept accepted by the motion maker from what I'm hearing. And then I have a question about the part about rescinding the council adopted TOLO. Um, and, the, and it, it stems from the fact that the way an ordinance can be rescinded or repealed by the council is the exact same way as the way by which you adopt it, which is by ordinance. And so um, I think what I would recommend is that you direct staff to suspend enforcement of the TOLO and bring back an amendment to the ordinance consistent with the council's direction this evening. So, so uh, you know, from, from the discussions that we had, the intent is to really start anew. Yeah. So not a mentolo, but start with a whole new ordinance. So whatever needs to happen to make that happen. Uh, that, well, I think um, uh, suspend enforcement and direct uh, staff to return with uh, a new ordinance that's consistent with the council's direction.
Okay. Um, Mayor, as the seconder of the motion, I'm just happy to weigh in here a little bit, if that's appropriate. Please do, yes. I'm just trying to write down what Tony said as well. Um, no, I appreciate the I appreciate the input and additions, and I also follow the um, the logic that Councilmember Kalantari Johnson really pointed out, in that uh, some of the additions are redundant, and uh, and, and 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 the intention is to keep a lot of uh, the direction simplified for ease of implementation and clarity. Um, and just sort of, you know, particularly around the community outreach language, I think that that is already stated at the very beginning. Um, the, you know, certainly, of course, use uh, for staff to use whatever language could be uh, useful in terms of uh, the additional three. And then also existing um, committees that are working within the larger context around um, solutions to houselessness in our community in terms of the two by two and other efforts. So I think, um, yes, I think the intention I think is really actually really there and um, the additional language is almost a little bit more confusing or um, cumbersome to the extent that we wanna just continue to move forward with solutions. And I also just wanna reiterate the importance of having the additional language at the very beginning to resend or to suspend and then return with a new ordinance, whatever that might look like to make that happen. So I follow as the seconder, the, the motion makers uh, approach. I just maybe um, council member Kalantari Johnson, do you want uh, Mr. Kondati to uh, confirm that, that language there at the top that uh, Bonnie just typed in? Tony, is this the right language? We lost Tony. Oh. Sorry, I think that um, that can be added uh, to the original motion. Right. And then also adding the, the words including but not limited to 100 safe sleeping spots to the original motion would be consistent with, um, would be consistent with what has been accepted uh, of Council Member Cummings' proposed friendly amendments. Bonnie, do you want, do you need a minute to put all that back together into the original motion? I do, just give me one second. Okay. And I have a few more, I have council members in the queue, so I just wanted to, if the maker of the motion, do you need more dialogue on these, on where you're at? Council Member called her, John? No, no, I don't, thank you. Okay. Okay, I have Council Member Brown, Vice Mayor Bruner, Council Member Watkins, and then Council Member Cummings. Go ahead, Council Member Brown. I'm here. Um, so I, I wanna respond to a few things that have been said, and then I have two questions and a uh, request for uh, some clarify or more specific language in part one around community engagement. Um, so with all due respect, <laughs> we have indeed done a lot of community engagement and it has been productive. And what has happened is the city council, multiple city councils over time have ignored those recommendations. We have, we do know a lot of the things that, you know, I mean, a lot of work has been done and we could draw on that and we're not. And so that, I, I really believe that that is the fundamental problem that we're having is we, we do certain kinds of community engagement and then we ignore it. And so, and then we kind of find ourselves here. So I'm not, ta and, and I wanna say, when I talk about community engagement, I'm not, and, and needing to do that before we do these other things, I'm not talking about suspending all of our efforts. I am thrilled that we are finally talking about safe sleeping zones and yeah, city, city um, involvement in that in a, in a way that is gonna be meaningful. We have never talked about it. Well, anyway, I'm gonna leave it there. So 
I'm talking about when I talk about community engagement. I'm talking about uh, you know, and it's it's a term or you know phrase that we use. It's you know, it's kind of vague. It's kind of nebulous. It means different things to different people. Um, I am not talking about. Um, just a vague notion of community engagement. I am talking about um, specifically saying we are going to have meetings with community members, neighborhood groups, uh, service providers, uh, mutual aid providers, those, all of the folks who are already doing this work and thinking about this and getting very, very concrete about having those meetings co creating, co-working to co-create. So none of that requires that we halt moving forward. What it requires we do is get in, get engaged, get reach out to people to the community um, in in and we know how to do that um, in meaningful ways. So I'm 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 gonna ask that um, we consider, and I would ask the makers of the motion to consider um, a friendly amendment, or I can make it as, a, you know, a formal motion, that in um, number, let's see, um, now I have to, it's moved, sorry. Um, so, so, okay, now I can't, where is, community, I don't even see it in here anymore. Direct staff to suspend enforcement, prioritize setting up adequate shelter. Um, Bonnie, I think you didn't put the most up to date with the engagement, community engagement piece. Sorry to jump right in. No, oh, please. Um, so this right here is the original motion with just the part that you accepted. I'll just, um, if I may, uh, Bonnie, at one point, Councilmember Talentari Johnson added having heard the, com the commitment to community engagement. Uh, the very, if you go up to the point number one, direct staff to engage with community to prioritize, so that language was added by Councilmember Talentari Johnson to the original right. motion. No, just uh, sorry, not the red one, the 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 direct black text. Um, after number one, direct staff to engage with community to prioritize that sentence right there was added. Yeah, thank you. So, thank you. Um, so my request is uh, that where it says direct staff to engage with community, um, I would add, or I would ask that we add, um, including meetings to get input from people who work with the houseless directly, including service providers and mutual aid groups. And I would also add um, neighborhood groups that may be affected um, by, or interested in, affected by um, siting, potential locations. Those are the pieces that, uh, you know, I think would really help us move forward in a productive way. Um, so I, I would ask that we include those and be explicit about it. Um, asking staff to engage is is not really very clear for, I think, for staff either. So um, it, it would be nice to get at least a little bit clear about that. So I, I would hope that that would be accepted um, I'm wondering now, so, so now my question, uh, was there a reason that um, managed encampments was left out of the uh, language here where we, where you talk about um, safe sleeping spots? Is there, are, I know, I realize those are different things and I'm just wondering, are we um, making a decision to not move forward with exploring and can't, encampments, managed encampments, are we just talking about safe sleeping zones? Or Should I respond with that? Yeah, please go ahead. Council Member Brown, um, the bullet point under item two mm -hmm. gives the option of a managed encampment as well. So, um, which 
which may be so, except for 1220 River Street, which may be used as managed encampment or overnight site. So I, I understood. However, what I see there is that we are referencing specifically 1220 River and only 1220 River. And then, and then there's also, um, I, uh, let's see, under um, what's now item four, um, towards the end there, that okay, thank you. Yeah. Permitted, yeah. So that's yeah, also thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I missed it. I'm so sorry. No, that's um, okay. It's, there's a lot here. <laughs> yeah, and then so the other uh, related to the SOP, since um, Councilmember Cummings ra brought that up and, and uh, requested some language about that, you know, we have a standard operating procedure. Um, I, I'm I'm just wondering if how it's being used. I mean, I don't really even understand how it's being used. Uh, my my understanding at the time was that the intention was to use that as a way to try to address um, entrenched encampment. And that hasn't, we haven't been able to do that, but I'm just wondering, uh, should we be looking at the standard operating procedure and including that in the conversation? It, it seems like um, it may need revision um, and or uh, further consideration of how it is to be utilized. Um, I'm just, Again, maybe not, but I'm I'm not clear about it. So um, maybe I'm missing something. Um, and I see Tony there. I was just going to offer that um, th there is in the current ordinance language that incorporates standard operating procedures. And I, based on the council, you know, the direction the council is leaning right now, I would not envision that we would modify that significantly in the ordinance that we bring back to you. Um, in May. Okay. So it, it will be clear, that will be clear though, where it fits, how it is to be utilized. Okay. Um, and that, yeah, I think that's, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, but, and thank you for, um, for considering getting a little more specific about what community engagement means or, or, or what would be a productive. <laughs> So just to clarify, was this accepted? Yes. Uh, yes, I I, yep, yes, I can accept that friendly amendment. Thank you. I can, I can as a seconder as well, but I also want to just highlight that um, when we start to really get at identifying different populations, there's just, uh, there's so many, right? We have youth, our seniors, our monolingual Spanish speaking population. So I just, you know, I, I, I hope that when we think of community engagement, we think of it through a lens of equity and trying to get the, the right voices of all of our community. Can I just respond quickly to that? Um, absolutely, I completely agree, Council Member Watkins. I, um, and you know, you know I, I would hope that that is the commitment that we're making. Uh, the reason that I called these out specifically is because these are the groups who are either consistently working in this arena or the group's you know, neighbors who have responded to um, this attempt at um, an ordinance uh, very, very, um, you know, um, vociferously. So I guess I, I just think that that needs to be called out as we think about, you know, when we start thinking about siting, right? And I know every, you folks have already have been, and you've been talking about this, uh, you know, that we actually talk to the neighbors, there will be neighbors. There's no way there's not going to be neighbors in, around some of these locations. And so we need to be upfront about that before they just get an announcement that, you know, beginning or they just see it, you know, and they pop up. So I, I do believe that those are conversations that are, are critically important. And of course, um, you know, engaging with, uh, with, you know, different groups across marginalized communities, um, you know, and, you know, all of that I think is very important. Here in this particular case, this to me is what's critical. So I don't know if that, um, I, I just wanted to say that because, yeah, I mean, we could add, um, but these are, the, these are the folks who we're hearing from right now, and they may fit into a lot of those other categories too. I, I don't. I don't disagree. I just would say that with the health and all policies lens, as we're looking at equity and our, our approach to policy making, I think it is 
implied that we're looking for inclusive engagement of those also who aren't necessarily inclined to reach out to the community. And by default, our unmanaged encampments are in neighborhoods. And so, you know, those that are surrounding the San Lorenzo Park are impacted by that as well. Um, so I guess I just, I understand the intention, I don't disagree. I just wanna recognize and acknowledge that, that the community is also more complex than, um, than the specified uh, populations. And that I hope that our staff would look at community engagement through that lens. Yes, thank you. Okay. We have two amendments um, that have been accepted, friendly amendments from Council Member Brown and Council Member Cummings. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, I gotta get my list up here. I believe next is Vice Mayor Bruner and then Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Golder. And then Council Member Watkins again. Um, okay. My hand's been up since before the break and a lot has changed uh, since then. So uh, let's see, I'm trying to keep my notes um, organized here. Um, and I think I want to start coming back to this um, message of, uh, you know, really making clear what's happening right now for um, ourselves and for the community to understand um, what the process is tonight. We're, um, there's a motion, there's amendments, and, you know, really um, addressing what that means um, for next steps and a timeline. I know that there are questions that um, will be coming up. When does this start? You know, all of that, I hope we can leave tonight with a brief um, explanation um, or estimate even from staff or attorney uh, regarding what all this process means in terms of um, next steps. Um, so it's clear for everybody what our what our process, what happens on May 11th, what happens between now and then, and what work does start now versus later. Um, so uh, I would like to ask that that some clarification of that is done before we leave tonight, and also um, emphasizing that. Uh, the understanding that this is not to solve homelessness and that crisis of, um, you know, all of the, the there are just so many different needs um, and components that it really requires a larger scale um, to deal with that larger issue. And that's not what this is, so I hope that's also, um, that understanding is clear before leaving tonight, what this intention is. Um, um, that, you know, I love the word co-creating as well, you know, the larger scale uh, solutions that are needed because there's a diverse array of solutions needed for each individual case of someone unhoused from families to treatment programs to, you know, anything that gets them on pathways to housing and good health requires different solutions. And um, so the work with our nonprofits and faith communities, um, county and state and federal um, is the work to address the larger issue. Um, and also, um, uh, you know, since this is the first time that we're seeing this, I'm seeing this tonight and that it's being created tonight, um, I think it's really important to, um, I think it would be valuable for everybody, including our constituents, to take it and bring it back for first reading, if that's what it's called. Um, 
just to be able to digest all these components and have public input on this and um, to really understand what's being said here um, with all these changes back and forth, that kind of brings me back to the confusing beginning of the temporary outdoor living ordinance. Um, it's important that assumptions are not made. Um, I think that leads, we've seen clearly um, assumptions um, don't lead to productive outcomes. And um, I really want to make sure that our community and that all of, all of us and all of staff are all really clear. Um, and I think it's important to define, uh, this came up in a lot of my conversations with constituents to define what safe sleeping sites mean. Um, that definition um, means something um, very specific that includes, um, um, and maybe it's implied or not implied or not assumed, but do we need to spell it out? And I might recommend, um, a friendly amendment to include with the safe sleeping sites that that includes access to restroom, hand washing stations, and water, um, as opposed to just here's a spot to set up. There has to be those elements um, in conjunction with those spots. Um, Is that a friendly amendment or? Yes, sorry. <laughs> so, yes. And where, where would that go and is that accepted? And I think that's implicit in the notion of safe sleeping spots. Uh, I'm not sure it needs to be spelled out in this direction, um, particularly when the staff will be returning to the council. Okay. Uh, with um, uh, information about the rollout of or the implementation plan as referenced in item one. I think the council can deal with that specific level of specificity at that time. So when it comes back? Right, the direction would be to return to the council with the recommended implementation plan. And so the implementation plan would have that level of detail. And how would we convey that information for the public to understand, our constituents to understand because um, that has been lost in translation already to date. Um, I mean, if, if the council prefers to have that expressly stated here, then that's, that is per perfectly appropriate for the council to make that decision. Thank you. The maker so of and the maker of the motion. Um, uh, Vice Mayor Berner, can you restate how you want that? Um, I, I, um, it, it, I think that is, part of the programming, but you're, you're correct that I had the same experience that a lot of um, community members understood safe sleeping as something completely different than, than how we understand it, but to yes. be explicit in however form it comes. So I'm not sure how, um, how under, you want that to look. Yeah, potentially under number two. Sorry, Bonnie. <laughs> um, there's language there uh, regarding safe sleeping spots and sites, um, comma, which would include, at, you know, safe sleeping spots would include access to restrooms, water, trash, and hygiene. Uh, water, hand washing, trash, restrooms. Something like that. And add uh, trash to that, Bonnie. Sorry, what did you say, Tony? Water and hand washing, trash, and restrooms. Thank you. Trash for some is that accepted? Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and again, I think this is part of the programming. So it's, it's um, really, we, we just, we need to have clarity on what the programming looks like. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's, that's, accept, that's accepted. Does the seconder of the motion have to? 
No, I accept it as well. I think as uh, Council Member Tari Johnson brought up, I think my my understanding that's part of the programming um, mm -hmm. of that kind of program that was implied in, 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 in my understanding, but uh, for explicit understanding beyond, you know, that us knowing that for the community to be aware of it, I think that, that makes a lot of sense in time with that. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, as this is a new, I, a new piece of literature coming forward, um, for everyone to digest. I think um, that's an important distinction that would be appreciated to understand. Um, and my last, uh, um, I just think it's important to understand uh, what the city can control and manage. And then again, this goes back to the larger picture, right? And, um, and drawing on the work from the 20, the 2017 homeless, Homelessness Coordinating Committee recommendations. Um, the, you know, I think maybe Sandy, that's where, what you were referencing at some point when you talked about all the community engagement and, um, I, it's not anything to include. Uh, I don't think it would be included in this context, but I just thought it was important to not lose that piece of valuable work that uh, has been done. And um, there are recommendations in there. Some have been um, reached and, and so, um, Separately, maybe it would be good to bring um, an update since, you know, we are a new council um, of where that stands and where that's at, um, the, the recommendations from the 2017 Homelessness Coordinating Committee. And, and, and it's good for the, the public to see that too, our constituents. That's it, thank you. Thanks, Vice Mayor. Um, just on your last comment, is that is, is that a request of staff at some point to come back and, and provide an update on that? That's not uh, any- It's kind not of part of this. I think it's just, you know, it's part of the whole picture that it's just good to see in conjunction um, where that's at because a lot, you know, rather than duplicating efforts, right, um, and just understanding history and historical context, it plays into our path forward. Thank you. Okay, I have Councilmember Cummings, um, Councilmember Golder, Councilmember Watkins, Councilmember Brown, and then City Manager Ber Martin Bernal. Um, and it is, I'm just wondering if we can get to maybe getting closer to concluding tonight. I think we're starting to sort of um, kind of lose focus. And I think we just need to, you know, it, it, and at some point I'd like to, you know, move towards uh, a vote on the motion. Uh, Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to see if um, kind of under, in the spirit of, the statement that you just made about trying to move forward. Um, I'd like to just see if maybe um, some of this could be separated into separate motions and maybe we could we can start moving forward because I am comfortable with moving forward with some of this and I'm not comfortable with moving forward with other parts of this. Um, so what I'd like to ask is that is whether after the first sentence where the direction is to direct staff to suspend enforcement of council adopted temporary outdoor living ordinance, if that can be separated from the rest of the motion. And then I'd just like to make a few comments on um, on the rest of the motion. Uh, I will look to the maker of the motion uh, to see if that would be acceptable. I'd like to keep this as one motion and keep it, keep it direct and simple. Okay. That's fine. Then I'm just, I'm gonna make a few final comments um, and uh, just point out a few um, changes that might, so I'll start with a few uh, cleanup items, I think. Uh, so number two, 
the way it would read is direct staff to engage with the community to prioritize, prioritize including meetings to get input from people. That dramatically um, should be changed. So maybe direct staff to engage with the community to prioritize, delete including, but to prioritize meetings to get input. That would read a little bit more smoothly. Yeah, grammar stuff we will fix okay. for sure. So, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I, was, I was just trying to check. Um, then I'll make a few other comments. One, um, the way that this is currently written, especially with regards to number four, so maybe this is something that council members want, might want to take into consideration, uh, but if the nighttime enforcement on prohibition is to be conditioned on availability of alternative shelter options um, and is deferred until item number one, which should be two, uh, is completed, my one concern is that um, we're still not out of the pandemic and the CDC guidelines haven't changed, so you may, there may need to be an inclusion of the enforcement of anything um, to be conditioned upon either what we had in the last one, whether we're in yellow tier or um, when the CDC has changed its guidelines because we could find ourselves in another lawsuit for being in violation of that, which is why we're in our current lawsuit. Um, additionally, the enforcement of the nighttime prohibition um, since there currently isn't an ordinance, language may need to be included so that the enforcement would be conditioned upon the passage of a new outdoor living or whatever we want to call it kind of ordinance. Uh, but since there's nothing in place, even if we were to, to get these sites established, unless there's an ordinance, then there's nothing to enforce. Um, I would also encourage, if this comes back, that we remove the word temporary for the, from the outdoor living ordinance. I think for many members of the public, it was confusing. Many people thought that this was a temporary ordinance, and my understanding is that it's not a temporary ordinance, that it's an outdoor living ordinance. Um, so unless there's a sunset date that comes back with that ordinance um, to ensure that it's temporary, then that would also need to be changed. And then um, I just want to explain too, for especially for some of the new council members and members of the community who may be just joining us um, first time, the establishment of subcommittees oftentimes occurs for specific items. So for example, yes, we have a homeless two by two committee that's with the city and the county. However, for example, the TOLO never came there and we never discussed the details of this with that group. And oftentimes what can occur with the subcommittee is that if the subcommittee is put in charge, for example, of drafting an ordinance, the subcommittee can go and do that outreach and engagement and work with the community to get feedback. They can incorporate that feedback and then when they can, when it comes to council, they have an opportunity to say, we've met with, for example, 10 groups throughout the community, we've met with homeless providers, we've met with all these people, we've provided, we've compiled the input from those meetings into this ordinance and this is what's before you today. And that way it helps to build community confidence and community support rather than it coming back every single time and we're making all sorts of changes. Um, so it's a way to have community engagement to also provide transparency and support and then to be able to bring it forward after you've been able to take into account some of the concerns coming from the community. So I recognize that there are a lot of groups that we have that do community, that, that are you know working on homelessness, but the purposes of recommending a subcommittee is because this is now, uh, it's either the third or fourth meeting we've had, which has gone on very long. Um, and you know because of the way that the community responded to when it first came to us, one of the reasons why I recommended the subcommittee is so that we could not be back in that same position bringing it forward again. So I just want to make some clear, I just want to clarify that's why I asked for the uh, subcommittee to be established. And I do want to point out that should the council move forward with the um, May 6th uh, date to bring back an ordinance, uh, or I'm sorry, it's May 11th. If it was to come back on May 11th, that means that on May 6th, uh, the agenda would need to be made public, which means that the agenda report would be, we need to go to the clerk on the 29th, yeah. uh, which then leaves about maybe close to two weeks for that public engagement to occur. And so I just wanna, you know, given that the ordinance, um, we, we wanna have meaningful community engagement. That means that that community engagement, we, we have a very short timeline for that engagement and that input to be incorporated into an ordinance. So. I just want to point all that out, and so I am 
um, supportive of suspending the temporary outdoor living ordinance, but I have some concerns that I tried addressing, and so I won't be supporting the motion that's before us this evening. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. And I just might clarify for the community that um, what will be coming back on May 11th will be a, a new ordinance, um, and it would be available for the first reading. Um, my understanding is the work um, under number two is ongoing and would actually be done over many months. Um, number two is not meant to be done before the ordinance um, is prepared and submitted to council on May 11th, but maybe uh, city manager Bernal could comment on that. Uh, yes, actually, that's, that's what I was gonna, gonna note that the uh, with respect to uh, the questions around in implementation. Yes, the council sets a policy direction um, and uh, then this will come back to you in, in the form of a legislative action um, in, in May. Uh, and, but then some of these other pieces uh, we're continuing to work on uh, and, and those will take, you know, there are different implementation schedules and we will have to develop uh, plans with respect to the different components as well as outreach uh, and communications uh, as, as it moves forward. And we'll also have updates to the city council. So all that is work that will, will come uh, uh, in the coming months uh, and there'll be more, more details as, as they're sorted out. So the important thing is for the council to give us you know, uh, clear policy direction so that we can bring back the, uh, uh, the legislative uh, action that you need to take and then uh, the, so that we can then develop the implementation plans. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and uh, call on uh, Council Member Golder. I appreciate everybody's comments, but I do agree that it's, it's getting late. And um, I think with the direction here is that moving forward with a new ordinance is gonna be time for further review. And I just think um, I'm happy with it, how it is. And I'm wondering if I can call the question. So, Council Member Golder, you're calling the question, which basically just want to make sure everybody understands that would um, stop all further um, discussion on the item, and we would move to a vote. Uh, Tony, can but I saw other. I mean, I don't want to stifle everyone's final thoughts either. And I see two people still have their hands up, so I don't want to be. It's a motion uh, to call the question. So if it gets a second, then that stops all the vote. Oh, my comments are, qu are quick. <laughs> if we wanted to... Okay. I think let the other two talk. Let the other two I, talk. And then I, 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 don't I, I stand counsel. corrected. If the motion is adopted, then it is. Um, then that, that stops all debate. So um, the making of the motion doesn't stop debate. Okay. So it looks like um, Council Member Watkins has a very brief comment, and Council Member Brown, it looked like you had a brief comment or one more. Uh, and okay, and then I think um, we will try to wrap this up. Um, we have, I think, several months to go on getting this ordinance done. So this is not our, this is just getting us started on a new ordinance. Um, and that direction, um, I think, is very well provided. Um, Mark, uh, Council Member Watkins and then Council Member Brown. Uh, no, thank, thank you, Mayor, and I'll keep my comments quick. I, I, I just want to sort of, building on what you said, I think what we're doing is looking at a continuous improvement approach, right? And for the community, I really want to highlight sort of the key takeaways that we're not moving forward with the existing ordinance. We're moving forward with programming. We're going to prioritize engaging with the community and keep trying solutions and also ultimately try to prevent unmanaged and transmission encampments. I also think that like so many like polarizing issues that we see at the federal level, whether it be like immigration or gun safety or healthcare, I do believe we all really seek solutions. And it's really tempting to go backward, to assign blame. And I do believe that we need to learn from the past, but we have to continue a pathway forward. And I hope that moving forward, knowing that this is something that we're gonna continually try to refine and modify and improve, that we can, re we can resist that instinct 
um, and try to just move forward with solutions. And it's not sort of one sector or one component of the council, it's really our entire council, our entire community, frankly, it, it needs to be our entire state um, that has the will to move forward with solutions um, because it, 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 we can't afford to really politicize um, this issue or any other big issue uh, that ultimately really needs real commitment. So I'm committed and hopeful that we can continue to move forward and I'm, I'm ready to vote on the item. So I'll, I'll leave my comments there knowing that we're ready, we're all ready to vote on the item at this point. Okay, Council Member Brown. I, I, um, I have a request that we uh, include, as I request, previously requested, and I don't see it here, uh, mutual aid groups after service providers in number two. So service providers, mutual aid groups, and neighborhood groups. Thank you. Um, so uh, just a couple of things. Uh, so, um, Vice Mayor Bruner, you mentioned the 2017 report. I actually, when I met, said that that was one of them, but we, I was actually uh, participating in a task force in 2000 um, as a representative of the Community Action Board. Though that went and sat on the shelf, and then we came back around. So there, and then the catch as well. So there are three now um, really, really deliberative efforts that produce documents with recommendations, and a whole, people put in a whole lot of work. So um, I and and there is uh, are those previous ones are, are really reflected in the catch work. Um, but I, I agree that um, it would be nice to make sure that all of that is captured as we move forward as well. Um, and I will add that um, well, I'm very heartened to be moving forward in this way, um, given that the, um, the motion includes some things that I'm not comfortable with at this time. I will be voting no, but I absolutely support items one and two and um, possibly the others um, once other, some stuff more is clarified. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Um, I just wanna make uh, for the motion maker, I, I was just rereading it and I think there's a correction that needs to be done, Bonnie, down in number four. Uh, it refers to, uh, in uh, section four, um, uh, it says until item one is accomplished, that should be a two. Great, and then I just want to clarify um, mutual, uh, mutual aid. Are you referring to like a group like the Red Cross, Sandy, or Salvation Army, or what exactly? Maybe just for the public, just so people understand which what a mutual aid group. Just that's just one a question I had for you. Sure. So I am referring to um, groups that are self-organized. Uh, that engage with uh, the, um, the affected communities that they're working in, um, in ways that are, you know, I mean, I guess I would just say it's, it's much more grassroots, it's much more, um, you know, bottom up, and not top down. I understand there's places for that as well, but I, I just think um, we, you know, ignoring them and ignoring those efforts. I mean, they're happening, right? So, and you can find, I mean, I could give you, so an example is sanitation for the people. That's just one example. There are others. I'm happy to um, provide a list if that would be helpful, but um, I don't, I'm not going to take time to look those up right now. No, I, um, I just was, I was just curious. And I, I you know, it was really just a question. Um, are the, is the maker of the motion, I just want to make sure that was clear. I didn't quite understand. I didn't know what those were. I thought it was like Red Cross, so I just didn't know. I, ha I have a question or a, a suggestion for a possible uh, modification to the language of item two. Uh, it just occurred to me that the word prioritize um, with the where that um, new language is inserted, it completely changes the meaning of the paragraph. And so, <laughs> What I would suggest you consider is to uh, have the language read, direct staff to engage with community to get input. So delete to prioritize meetings and then reinsert to prioritize uh, after the words affected 
um, to pro uh, after the, the red line language locations in uh, to prioritize setting up adequate shelf shelter safe sleeping locations because I think the intent was like to prioritize a, when we clean it up it won't be red it won't be it won't have these brackets it'll it'll look different so yes we will my, my point is simply that the that the intent of the original language was to prioritize setting up adequate shelter safe sleeping safe sleeping locations it wasn't to prioritize getting input although i recognize that's an important part of it but the priority or the emphasis on the original motion was to prioritize setting up uh, shelter locations right right okay so can you can you repeat then tony what you just said uh, engage with community to prioritize or engage with community to and then delete prioritize get input from people so the, the language of council member brown's friendly amendment mm -hmm. And then after the word potential locations, okay. at the bottom of that insertion. So to engage with community to so delete to delete delete meetings to get. Okay. Or actually just delete meetings and input to community community to get to input, get in, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then after the word locations, add Right here? Yeah, to prioritize setting up adequate shelter. I think that was the intent of the amendment. Uh, I guess I would just look to the maker of the motion to confirm that. Okay, but to Yeah, let me just read it one more time and I think that's fine. I'm finishing my video. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we have done a lot of wordsmithing and I think um, we should move on to getting the vote done this evening. We've been doing this now for four hours and it sounds like um, maybe we're ready to go. Uh, and I had one question if possible. Uh-huh. Uh, the one question I did have, I know in the, in this, it says that, um, where it says that the sleeping sites um, cannot, not adjacent to residential areas or schools. And then um, that includes the 150 safe sleeping sites involving the River Street Shelter, 1220 River Street and other. I'm just curious, and this is for the city attorney, um, is there a conflict in that? Because if we're saying that the sleep, safe sleeping sites can't be adjacent to neighborhoods or residential areas, but 1220 River is adjacent to the tannery. I just want to make sure that confirm that that's not contradictory, or is it? No, sorry. The the I, the 1220 River side is actually quite a ways away from the tannery. It's not adjacent. It does not sit adjacent to it. It's actually up by the pump station. And, and I, I I checked. I I did check, and that I checked with staff, and it seems that that is not contradictory and I, I think what this process is intended to to do is to set up a, to establish a community dialogue whereby the specific sites will be will be um, discussed with the community and these are general parameters not um, not specific detailed requirements although I will add that out of all the community outreach that was conducted, that is a very clear concern, and you heard it this, tonight, that that is 
that is a, uh, a measuring stick we need to keep track of. Um, Mayor, if I if I could, I think an and also would address Councilmember Cummings' issue. So, uh, 150 safe sleeping spots, um, and also involving the River Street Shelter, 1220 River Street. There, there is um, some residential to the north of 1220 River. So, I think just adding um, and also involving makes that clear. I mean, the River Street Shelter has, um, you know, family housing there as well. I think just doing an end also would um, address that if that helps. I guess my question is that, are we trying to accept it? Yeah, does the maker of the motion Yeah, that's, that's fine. And we, we are really getting into wordsmithing, which yeah. I've heard Bonnie a couple times now say she will, yeah. Um, I don't know how we get to a vote at this point. Yeah, I think I think we're ready. Um, let's go ahead and, and take a vote on this. Um, so we have a motion by Council Member Collintar Johnson um, Moved by Councilmember Collintar Johnson, seconded by Councilmember Watkins to direct staff to suspend enforcement of council adopted temporary outdoor living ordinance and direct staff to return to council with the recommended implementation plan, including the below and a new ordinance on May 11th. Um, and the items below incur, in, in, include directing staff to engage with the community to get input from people who work with the houseless directly, including service providers, mutual aid groups, and neighborhood groups who may be affected by potential locations to prioritize setting up adequate shelter, safe sleeping locations for city owned property, including but not limited to 150 safe sleeping spots, not adjacent to residential areas or schools that includes creation this will be cleaned up of 150 safe sleeping spots and also involving the River Street Shelter, 1220 River Street and other city facilities slash city parking lots as necessary to be determined by staff. And uh, there was an, uh, uh, an a acceptance um, for an amendment that uh, provides further definitions of what a safe sleeping spot would include and that would include water, hand washing, trash and restrooms. Um, Number three, restrictions on daytime encampments with implementations of the daytime property storage program. And then four, enforcement of nighttime prohibition to be conditioned on availability of alternative shelter options and to be deferred until item two is accomplished and safe sleeping programs are operational, after which the city would prohibit camping in all other city areas other than city permitted indoor shelters, safe sleeping locations and manage encampments to be run by nonprofit faith-based community and county partners. Um, could I have a roll call vote, please? Yeah, I just want to make sure the motion includes this, right? This part? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Number, okay, okay, I just wanted to make sure. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Council Member Watkins? Thank you, Bonnie. Yes, I. Mm -hmm. Kalantar Johnson? Uh, oh. I. Um, Brown? Uh, no, uh, but I want to register yes on items one and two. Okay. Cummings? Um, no, and similarly, I'd like to register a yes, a yes on items one and two. Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. Mayor Myers? Aye. Okay. That motion passes. Let me grab my, my brain is starting to fade here with, um, Five in favor and two opposed. Okay. Um, 
Well, I just want to thank the public for hanging in there with us this evening. Um, this concludes our meeting tonight, and um, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.